A muffled squeak accompanied the reddish light flashing through the helmet's goggle eyes. Then the body beneath him went limp. Korn winced. He who carries a blaster set on kill dies by a blaster set on kill. He tossed the blaster pistol to the floor beside the carbine, then slid off the dead man's abdomen. He unbuckled the dead trooper's ammo belt. Tugging it free of the body, he noticed, in addition to the erg clips for the blasters, a number of pouches, half of which were bulging. Opening one of them, he saw compact silver cylinders, and a new shiver ran through him. Explosive charges. Some must already have been set. A noise in the doorway made Corrin spin. A stormtrooper stood there, staring down at him. Corrin's right hand groped for the blaster pistol, but he knew he'd never make it in time. Then he noticed the stormtrooper's hands were empty and, more importantly, the man's feet were two inches off the ground. Ural cast the body aside and it crumpled to the floor. The Gand took a look at the stormtrooper on the ground, then nodded once. Ural apologizes for having left you undefended. Ural was out walking when the presence of these interlopers became apparent. How many? The Gand shook his head. Two less. Ural saw four others at various points on the perimeter. And our sentries? Gone. Not good. Stormtroopers travel in squads of nine. Let's figure two dozen with the crew of whatever brought them here. Corrin refastened the ammo belt and slung it across his body. Reholstering the blaster pistol, he noticed that Ural had similarly appropriated his trooper's weapons. Is your boy dead? The Gan nodded and rolled his trooper onto his stomach. The trooper's helmet had a blood-smeared hole in the back of it. The hole itself looked odd, and Corrin knew that was because of its shape, not just the jagged outline from where the armor crumpled. Kind of a diamond shape. He looked up. Did you hurt your hand? Ural folded his three fingers into a fist with the wound's peculiar shape. Ural is not impaired. Well, I am, by the night and the fog. You'll be in the lead. We have to assume the others are rigging the flight center to blow. No alarm? Corrin hesitated. By rights, raising an alarm would be the smart thing to do, but there were no troops to fight against the stormtroopers. Waking everyone up would be inviting them to get slaughtered as they ran about unarmed. The pilots would head toward their ships, and the stormtroopers in the flight center would cut them down in seconds. Have to go silent on this one. We want to approach the flight center from the blind side. The Gant nodded and led Korn out into the misty darkness. Clutching the blaster carbine to his chest, a legion of conflicting thoughts and emotions flooded through him. With each step, a new plan presented itself to him. There had to be better ways to handle the situation than slipping blindly through the night to go hunting stormtroopers. They had every advantage over him. Not only would their armor protect them, but the helmet enhanced their vision, and the built-in comm link meant they could coordinate any efforts to hunt him down and kill him. Thoughts shifted, and ambition sparked dreams of glory. He saw himself as a hero of the Alliance for foiling the stormtrooper raid, yet that dream died quickly. As Biggs Darklighter and Jack Porkins had shown, most heroes of the Alliance were made heroes posthumously, and posthumous was the most likely outcome of the expedition. This did not suit Corrin, but the sense of menace radiating out through the night made it hard to deny. At the same time, the knowledge that he was surely dead provided him with a sense of freedom. His goal shifted from staying alive to making sure his friends would stay alive. He wasn't fighting for himself. He was fighting for them. He was the shield that would prevent the Empire's evil from touching them. In this idea, 
He found a haven from the sense of doom grinding in on him. Ural stopped him with a hand pressed gently to his chest. The Gand held up one finger, then pointed straight ahead. He made a fist with his right hand, then signaled with his left in a looping motion. Corin nodded and sighted the carbine along the line where Ural had pointed. The Gand slipped to the left and immediately disappeared in the fog. The Corellian waited, willing himself to be able to see through the fog to his target. He knew the chances of hitting anything were minimal, and he expected to aim at the source of any blaster fire he saw. Even so, he allowed himself to believe he could feel the soldier in a hard carapace standing twenty or so meters in front of him. A wet crunch drifted to him through the fog. Corrin moved forward, carefully pushing his way through the leafy plants and curtains of tendril moss at the fringe of the compound. About where he had expected his target to be, he found the Gand crouched over a prostrate stormtrooper. The helmet looked decidedly flattened on top, and now rode low enough to hide the man's throat. Ural unfastened the last of the catches on the breast and stomach armor, then pulled it from the dead man's body and handed it to Corin. You shall have exoskeleton, too. The human pilot smiled. He removed his gun belt and slipped the armor on. It was much too big for him, but he tightened the flank straps as much as he could and got a vaguely reasonable fit. Adding the trooper's ammo belt to his own helped hold the armor in place, though the weight of two blasters, one on each hip, made him feel slow. Ural hefted the other carbine in his free hand, then headed off into the night. Corin followed, and quickly enough, they came to the side of the flight center that faced away from the central compound. They made good use of the hole the Kaha tree had made in the wall to slip back into the building. Light shone in beneath the edge of the door into the hallway, and Corin took this as a good sign. He pointed to it. If the troopers were in this wing, they'd have killed the light because leaving it on means they'll be silhouetted when they enter a darkened room. Gavin and Sheil are in the next room. Let's get to them. The Gand nodded and opened the door a crack. He peered out, then waved Corin forward. Corin shut the door behind him and followed Ural through the next door down the hallway. The Gand crossed to where the Shistavanan lay while Corin approached Gavin's bed. Shifting the carbine to his right hand, he crouched down and laid his left hand over Gavin's mouth. He felt the boy start. Gavin, be quiet. It's me, Corin. Be still. Sheil awoke with a low growl, but after taking a couple of healthy sniffs of the air, he stopped making any noise. He sat up, then slipped from the bed and crouched along with Corin and the Gand at Gavin's bedside. Troopers. Blood. Corin nodded. We have Stormies here in the base. They're rigging it to explode. They're in the hangar now, I think. We have three down, and we're guessing there were two dozen total. Ural handed the Shistavanan wolfman a carbine. You know how to use this? Shields' whispered laugh sounded like a growl. Death marks don't come with the rain. Corin stripped off one of his gun belts and showed it to Gavin. You can fire a blaster? The youth nodded, his face pale in the light from beneath the door. Don't know if I'll hit anything, though. Point and shoot. And shoot and shoot. Corin looked over at the two aliens. Since you both can navigate in the dark, and since your coloration makes you hard to spot, I think you should head out and around to the hangar. He passed Sheil two of the spare clips from his belt. We'll work our way in through the center here and try to attract their attention. If you get a clue to where their ship is, the hall light went out. Uh-oh. Gavin shucked the pistol from its holster and the power selection lever clicked. Leave it on kill, kid. Corin pointed to the window. Go, you two. 
flank them. Wordlessly, Corin turned and scuttled over to the door. Reaching up, he turned at the knob and opened it a crack. He couldn't see anything in the dark, but he did hear the squeak of hinges farther along the hallway. He touched the medallion he wore once for luck, then pulled open the door, stepped into the hallway, and fired a burst. Two bolts caught one stormtrooper in the chest and tossed him backward into another trooper. The dead man's finger jerked his carbine's trigger, sending a line of bolts down the hallway. Corin dove to the right, slamming his shoulder into the wall, avoiding them. Red light flashed back out of the doorway near the head of the hall, reminding Corin of the flare in the eye plate of the first trooper he had killed. In an instant, the Corellian knew the room contained a third stormtrooper, and that at least one of the squadron's pilots lay dead in bed. Corin's second burst knocked down the stormtrooper emerging from beneath the imp corpse. Corin thought he went down hard enough to be dead, but the little votive fires lit in the floors and walls by the stray blaster bolts didn't supply enough light for him to be certain. Then the trooper in the room at the head of the hallway emerged and, as if the trooper's mirror image, Gavin came through the doorway of his room. Gavin, no! The farm boy triggered one shot while the trooper filled the hallway with a steady stream of fire. Corin hit his trigger and scythed the muzzle back and forth across the hallway. He heard Gavin grunt and fall behind him. His own shots cut the legs out from under the stormtrooper. The last bolt blasted through the square eye plate and bubbled the armor at the back of the man's head. The doors all along the hallway swung open. Nearest to him, Corin saw the Twi'lek. Gavin's down. Help him. Stormtroopers are here in the base. Nawara then stared at him. How did they find... I don't know. The place is rigged to blow. Get everyone clear. Corin sprinted down the hallway, leaping over the trio of dead stormtroopers. He stripped the power pack from the carbine and slapped a new one into it. As he neared the hangar, he heard plenty of blaster fire. The semi-transparent plastic strips hung over the doorway showed a lot of shots heading out to converge on two points in the darkness, which told Korn that Sheil and Ural had attracted plenty of attention with their flanking maneuver, shooting coming from either side of the door, too. Korn fished one of the explosive cylinders from a belt pouch and set the timer for five seconds. He punched his thumb down on the arming button. Glancing up, he located what he saw as the largest concentration of shots heading out at his comrades. Six. Looks good to me. Corrin stepped through the plastic curtain and let the arming button come up, starting the timer. He slid the explosive cylinder across the smooth ferrocrete surface toward the knot of commandos. Three, two, one. The explosion scattered the soldiers, casting two up and over the generator cart they'd been using as cover. Before they hit the ground, Corin turned and thrust his blaster carbine at the stormtrooper hunkered down to the left of the door. The burst of laser fire burned through the torso armor, blasting the man out from behind a breastwork of crates. Spinning, Corin sprayed scarlet blaster darts over the stormtrooper on the other side of the doorway. The shots hit him in the chest and legs, somersaulting him back through the plastic sheet and out of the hangar. Continuing his spin, Corrin snapped shots off at various muzzle flashes, backing and turning, picking up speed and allowing himself to drift almost at random. He knew he should be terribly frightened, but since he had decided he was as good as dead before, Fear could find no purchase on his soul. He viewed his situation with an emotional detachment that surprised him. It allowed him to see his entry into the hangar, much as he had seen diving into the cloud of ties at Hansara. I can shoot at anyone. They have to take care. Corin's gun came up and the muzzle tracked strobing laser fire over the silhouette of a stormtrooper up on the hangar's catwalk. The trooper straightened up and twitched, 
and slowly began a backward spin toward the floor that Corin found incredibly graceful. His landing, which was all broken and herky-jerky, ruined the beauty of his fall and brought Corin back to the hideous reality in which he was enmeshed. A laser bolt caught him in the right breast and pitched him into the shadows. He landed hard against a wall of wooden crates, and stars exploded before his eyes when his head hit something solid. He heard wood and glass break and a gurgle of a vessel emptying. He hoped it wasn't his body emptying of blood, but the shooting pains in his chest and the fire radiating out from the wound all but guaranteed he was the source of the sound, a sickly, sweet scent mixed with the stink of burned flesh, and Corrin knew he was dying. That smells like Corellian whiskey. His mind flashed back to the endless rounds of drinks at his father's wake. Each one punctuated a toast or a testament to his father by members of Corsac, from the director on down to Gil and Ayala to the rookies his father had taken under his wing. At that time, Corin had thought having such a wake would be the grandest send-off possible. And now I hallucinate the smell of it. A jolt of pain left him a moment of lucidity in its wake, and Corin clung to it. His vision cleared, and he saw laser bolts burning in all directions through the darkness. He tried to lift his own carbine, but he couldn't feel its weight in his hand. He decided to draw the blaster pistol, which was when he discovered his right arm wasn't working so well. That realization came a second or two before the laser fire silhouetted a stormtrooper seeking cover nearby. Corin willed his body to sink into the ferrocrete, but nothing happened. The stormtrooper swept something aside with a foot, and Corin heard the clatter of the carbine against an unseen crate. He tried to lever himself up with his left arm, but the pain in the right side of his chest stopped him. He found himself short of breath. My lung collapsed. The stormtrooper lowered his carbine, giving Corn a good view of the muzzle. It's over for you, rebel scum. You too, little stormy. Corn raised his left hand but kept his thumb pressed on the end of the explosive cylinder he'd eased from the pouch on his belt. I die and it blows. The stormtrooper hesitated for a second, then shook his head. Nice try. You're holding the wrong end. Blaster wine filled the crate-lined cul-de-sac, and Corin flinched involuntarily. He thought flinching was a bad way to die. Then he realized that the dead are seldom that vain. Above him, the stormtrooper's body wavered, then buckled at the knees and crashed down beside him. The hole in the back of his armor sparked and smoked. Wedge came running up and dropped to one knee beside Corin. How are you doing, Mr. Horn? Parts of me don't hurt that much. Wedge smiled. Hang tight. The Stormies are withdrawing. Medic! Bombs. I know. We're finding and disarming them. Corn smiled and tried to take a deep breath. Gavin? Bad, like you. We're already getting set to evacuate. I'm as good as dead. He winced. I'm so far gone. I smell Corellian whiskey. You do smell Corellian whiskey, Corin. You're lying in a puddle of it. Wedge frowned. The crate that broke your fall is full of Wyron's reserve. What? How? Wedge shook his head as MD droids toddled over. I don't know. Consider solving that mystery your assignment while you recover from your wounds. 19. Wedge and Tilly's watched as Gavin Darklighter and Corin Horn floated all but lifeless in Bacta tanks. Seeing them there brought back memories of the time he had spent in such a tank. It hadn't been aboard the Reprieve, but on Home One, Admiral Akbar's flagship at Endor. He'd been barely conscious during his time in the tank, 
which he saw as a blessing. Being awake and thinking while being able to do nothing would have driven him insane. Your pilots have improved, Commander Antilles? Wedge turned and blinked his eyes in surprise. Admiral Akbar, What are you doing here, sir? The Mon Calamari clasped his hands at the small of his back. I read your report and found it disturbingly clinical. I decided I wanted more information. Wedge nodded. There wasn't much time to prepare the report. And you have never really liked data padding. No. Wedge rubbed a hand over his face and discovered a fair amount of stubble on his chin and jaw. How long has it been since I slept? You could have requested a supplemental report or asked me to report to you aboard Home One and saved yourself the trip. I thought of that, but I knew another report from you would be light and bites and that you would refuse to leave your people, so I chose to save myself the annoyance. Akbar stared through the viewport at the two men in the tank. Besides, the tone of the Provisional Council meetings is beginning to wear on me. The fate of Rogue Squadron is important enough that I was able to slip away without being accused of running. The Corellian looked over at his commander. Are things that acrimonious? I probably exaggerate. Politicians tend to view soldiers like their pet Cyborian battle dogs. And soldiers don't like to be considered pets. Akbar's barbels twitched slightly. Since we are the ones who get bitten and bleed and die, we tend to resist plans that are politically expedient but militarily suicidal. He tapped his hand against the viewport. Is the picture of what happened there any more clear? Not yet. The basics are the same. Three pilots seriously wounded, one dead, and all six sentries dead. A number of others have cuts and scrapes. It should have been much worse, but it looks as if the stormtroopers wanted to plant the explosives, withdraw, then arm and detonate them by remote. Had they just put them on timers, we would have lost equipment and people before we found them all. A full platoon was operating on Talisi. We got all of them and captured the Delta DX-9 transport they came in on. Hardly worth the cost, but a good thing nonetheless. Wedge nodded. The ones we captured, two stormtroopers and all five of the transport's crew, refused to talk. I have them in detention, isolated from each other. I've had an MDO and MD-1 droid engaged in post-mortems of the troopers we killed. With luck, something will give us an idea where they came from. And Talisi was evacuated? Yes, sir. We expect Imperials to come looking for whatever got their people, so we set up some booby traps and other surprises for whoever follows us in there. Wedge sighed heavily. I have a list of what we left behind in case we ever have cause to go back. The Mon Calamari nodded slowly. What is the mood of your unit? Wedge turned and pressed his back against the cool transpara steel. He just wanted to close his eyes and go to sleep, and he feared he'd do just that if he did close his eyes. We're all stunned and exhausted. Losing Lu Jane came as a shock. She wasn't the best pilot in the unit, and not one to take chances, so none of us had her pegged as someone who would die first. Corin or Broar or Sheel were easy to picture going out in a blaze of glory, and Corin almost did. Lu Jane was a fighter, so having her die in her sleep was, well, it just made it worse. She was murdered, not killed in combat, and I guess I thought we were somehow immune to that sort of ignominious death. He shook his head. That makes no sense, of course. Akbar patted him on the shoulder. It does make sense. We know war is barbaric, but we try not to be barbaric in waging war. We hold ourselves to a high standard that demands we only attack legitimate military targets, not civilians, not medical frigates. We would like to see this honor we demand of ourselves reflected in the actions of our enemies. But if they were as honorable as we are, we'd not be fighting this war. And in that, Commander Antilles, 
you have the core of the whole problem. The Mon Calamari paced away from the viewport. When will your people be out of the tanks? Wedge glanced down at his chronometer. Twelve hours more for Horn and Darklighter. Another twenty-four to forty-eight for Andorni Wee. I've been told it has something to do with her metabolism, but she was hurt worse than they were, too. I want to hold a memorial for Lu Jane fairly soon. He rubbed his eyes. Gavin will be crushed. She's been helping him sharpen his astro-navigation skills. It seems, then, nothing can be done until at least twelve hours from now. Wedge shook his head. Nope. We just have to wait. No. You just have to sleep. The Corellian turned and looked at Akbar. I can rest later. But you will rest now. Consider that an order, Commander, or I will order a 2-1-B droid to sedate you. Akbar's chin came up as he spoke, and Wedge knew he'd carry out his threat. In fourteen hours, I want to see you and your XO on home one. General Salm will have arrived by then. If I'd known I could look forward to a dressing down by him, I'd have let the stormtroopers shoot me. Yes, he can have that effect, can't he? Akbar's mouth hung open in a silent laugh at his joke. The purpose of this meeting is not a reprimand, however. No? No. Akbar's voice became calmer, yet more intense. Someone in the Empire struck at one of my forward bases. If we don't strike back, and strike back hard, they might feel emboldened to continue such activity. I don't want this to happen. General Salm's bomber wing should be sufficient for exacting retribution. If you want Rogue Squadron to fly cover for such a mission, you have us. That was the reaction I expected from you, Commander. Now, go get some sleep. Yes, sir. Wedge saluted. Sleep it is, and dreams of retribution will be very pleasant indeed. Corin wasn't certain what was worse. The sour taste of Bacta in the back of his throat, or feeling like he was still bobbing up and down in the tank. To him, Bacta tasted like lum that had gone flat, gotten stale, and been stored in some sort of plastic barrel that lent it an oiliness that slicked his tongue. Because the blaster bolt had punctured his right lung and collapsed it, a little bacta had been circulated through the lung, bringing the fluid's cloying bouquet to his nose every time he exhaled. Other than that, he felt pretty good. He still had a reddish spot on his chest where he had been shot. The mark on him was about half the size of the mark on Gavin. Corn realized that armor had saved his life by absorbing some of the power of the bolt. How Gavin survived taking a shot to the naked abdomen, he hadn't a clue. Gavin rolled onto his side on the next bed over. Never done that before. Blunder into a firefight or spend time in a back to tank? Neither. The youth frowned. I didn't think I was blundering. You weren't. Corin shook his head and swung his feet around so he could sit up. I should have realized you didn't know to wait until I signaled the hall was clear. I didn't think, which is why you went down. It was my fault you got shot. Gavin covered the reddish area on his stomach with his right hand. It hurt a lot. Then I guess I fainted. You're lucky that's all you did. That shot should have killed you. I know I shot back at the stormtrooper. Did I get him? I don't know, Gavin. Unless you have a holo of a light fight, trying to reconstruct it after the fact is all but impossible. Corn slid from the table and found his legs supported him with only a few minor tremors. He and his buddies died, and that's all that counts. Were any of us killed? Corin remembered the impression of death he'd had in the corridor, but he shook his head. I don't know, Gavin. The med center hatch opened and Wedge Antilles stepped through it. His smile broadened at first, then shrank slightly. He paused and returned the hasty salutes Gavin and Corin managed. 
Good to see both of you, Hale and Hardy. Hardy, perhaps, sir, but Hale will need some work. Corin worked his right arm up and around in a circle. A night's rest ought to make it all right. And you, Gavin, how do you feel? Fine, sir. I can fly right now if you need me. That's not necessary right away. Wedge's expression darkened. We've abandoned Talisee and evacuated it cleanly. We got the stormtroopers and captured their transport ship. Forensic analysis of the bodies has given us a good indication of where they came from. I'm meeting with Admiral Akbar and General Salm to consider a counterstrike against their base. I'm in. Me too. Gavin hopped off the bed. His knees buckled, but he caught the edge of the bed and remained upright. I want to go and repay them. Wedge nodded, and Corin knew he was getting to the worst part of the report. In the raid, we gave better than we got. But we had casualties. Six of our sentries died. You two and Andorni were severely wounded. Wedge glanced down at the deck, then over at Gavin. Lou Jane Forge was killed. Gavin leaned heavily on the bed. Lou Jane is dead? Corin sat abruptly on the floor. He'd felt her die. He knew she had died, yet he couldn't believe it any more than Gavin could. She'd always been the member of the squadron who was concerned with the welfare of the others. Not just their physical welfare, but how they felt. She formed the heart of our unit, bringing us together. There's no way she should have been the first of us to die. He stared down at his empty hands. She never even collected on that favor I owed her for fixing my X-wing. And now she's gone. Gavin shook his head. She can't be dead. She's been tutoring me in astro-navigation. She... The youth balled his fists and hammered them against the edge of the table. Dead! Wedge sighed. It's never easy to lose a friend, Gavin. Gavin raised a fist as if he wanted to smash it down again, but let it slowly drift back to his side. This is the first time anyone I've known has died. Corin raised an eyebrow. Really? He's only a kid, Corin. I know, sir, but his cousin... Gavin shook his head. I've met people before who later died. I remember Mr. Owen and Aunt Beru. That's what I called them on the couple of times Biggs let me tag along when he visited Luke at the Lars farm. When they died, my father took the farm over. Wedge frowned. I thought Luke had given it to an alien. Yes, Throg was his name. He worked it for a couple of seasons. But my uncle wanted to add that farm to his holdings. So we got the Anchorhead Municipal Council to pass an alien landowner tax, which would have broken Throg to pay. My father didn't hold with his brother's tactics, so Dad bought the farm from Throg, paying him what it was worth instead of letting Uncle Huff buy it in a tax auction. Gavin shrugged. Growing up on that farm, I could remember having seen the Larses, but I never really knew them. I was a kid, a real kid. They were nice to me, but... But you didn't know them. Corin drew his knees up to his chest. I understand. Still, your cousin Biggs? Biggs was eight years older than I was. There were times he liked having me around and times he didn't. I couldn't understand why not then. Gavin shrugged. I've grown up since then. So I kind of understand now, but still, I didn't really know him. And not seeing his, him, or Luke's aunt and uncle after, well, it's not like I know they're gone. I do, but, you know, I do know. Wedge folded his arms across his chest. I was there when Biggs died. I got hit and pulled up out of the trench on Luke's orders. Your cousin and I both knew we were really there as an added set of shields to keep Luke safe. But we didn't regret that. We knew he'd have done the same thing for us. And we also knew he had to blow the Death Star. 
Big stayed there, keeping the ties back, and died there. And even though he died, he bought Luke the time he needed to destroy the Death Star. The rebel commander's eyes nearly shut as he stared off into space. I flew with Biggs before Yavin, and he was really good. It seemed like he could read the minds of Thai pilots. He knew when to break, when to shoot, and did everything necessary to stay in their ion exhaust and blast them to bits. He was proud of his record and his skill, but not arrogant. Gavin smiled. He had that smirk, the one he'd give you when he'd done something you couldn't. Wedge chuckled. I used to hate that smirk, but I didn't have it directed at me all that often. In his first mission, we went against an Imperial convoy, right after they'd started assigning Nebulon B frigates, just like the reprieve here, to jump cover for the convoys. It launched two dozen ties at our squadron. Biggs lit and vaped five, making him an ace, but another pilot claimed his number three kill. That kill made the other pilot an ace. I think he was on his 15th mission at the time. Biggs gave the guy the smirk and let him have it. And thereafter, when Biggs got five of something, he'd give this guy the third one. He wasn't nasty about it, but he didn't let the guy forget. Gavin nodded. Biggs was like that. He'd needle you with your own little foibles until you did something about it. Or it didn't bother you anymore. It was his way of making everyone toe the line and push themselves to be the best they could. That's why he used to get after Luke about going to the academy. He didn't want to see anyone waste themselves when they could be doing more. Wedge scratched the back of his neck. If he'd survived Yavin... We'd be reporting to him now. Corin raised a finger. Did the third kill guy ever redeem himself? The curve of Wedge's smile flattened out. The guy, Karsk was his name, Amil Karsk, took the third of five scheduled patrols for Biggs. It was an easy job, nursemating a blockade runner on a courier mission. It even promised a couple of days of rest and recreation. It was a plum assignment, but Biggs let him have it and was willing to call it even. That mission and that courier took Karsk to Alderaan. He was on the ground when the Death Star appeared. Ouch. Corin reached up and hauled himself to his feet. Biggs was lucky he let the mission slide. Yeah, but luck runs out eventually. Wedge's brown eyes hardened. Ours hasn't. Not entirely yet. I'm glad you're both back with us. I'd prefer not having to add you to the list of friends I've lost to the Empire. The list is too long already. Gavin swallowed hard once, then extended his hand to Wedge. Thank you, sir. I feel like I know Biggs a bit better now. Wedge shook the youth's hand. Thanks for giving me the chance to remember the good things about Biggs. Too much of war is remembering the loss, the point at which people cease contributing to this life. Biggs, Porkins, Dak, Lou Jane, they all need to be remembered as more than just casualties. I don't do that often enough. Their commander glanced at the chronometer on the ship's bulkhead. I'm due to meet with Admiral Akbar shortly. You've got about four hours before we'll have a memorial for Lou Jane and the other people we lost on Talisee. And after that, Akbar willing and Psalm being sanguine, we'll bleed some Imperials pale of luck and let our dead rest just that much easier. 20. Mtray's uncharacteristic quiet on the flight over from the reprieve to home one had started Wedge wondering if the galaxy hadn't changed around him while he'd been sleeping. The droid hadn't wheedled, cajoled, begged, or bored him with details about the need for him to travel to Home One. He just showed up and said he had things to take care of on board the Rebel flagship. Tycho had shrugged, so Wedge agreed. The droid seemed uncharacteristically quiet, 
but that didn't seem sinister and really was quite welcome. As he piloted the Forbidden on the run over to the Mon Calamari star cruiser, he realized he'd not seen much of Mtre during the time on Talisi, and he'd heard even less from him. He'd heard even fewer complaints about the droid, and this he took as a good sign. He felt caring for pilots was tough enough without having to worry about droids, too. The smile on General Salm's face as Wedge and Tycho entered Admiral Akbar's briefing room increased the Corellian's sense of dislocation with the galaxy. Good to see you, Commander Antilles, Captain Selchu. It was very kind of you to have your M3PO droid send that gross of new flight suits to Defender Wing. We accept your apology and look forward to working with you on this mission. Wedge looked at Tycho, but his exo gave his head a nearly imperceptible shake. If it makes Psalm happy, do I really need to know what's going on? You're welcome, General. We're all on the same side, after all. Akbar's face shifted from Wedge to Psalm and back again. He blinked and clasped his hands together. Clear water, gentle waves. Good. The Mon Calamari seated himself and pushed a button on the chair's arm. Our droids have double-checked the findings of the forensic team working on the stormtroopers you brought up from Talisi. They confirm the rash on three of them as being Ratchuk roseola. DNA analysis of the virus shows a variation from the sequencing reported there two years ago, and given the spontaneous mutation rate, this would be the most recent strain. Wedge nodded. So they came from Ratchuk. Akbar pointed to the computer-generated holographic image growing up in the middle of the group. It showed a relatively small world with a scattering of jungle islands. The Ratchuk system itself is unimportant except that its central location means a great number of ships pass into and out of it as they conduct trade. The Empire located a base on Vladit to discourage piracy, and they were relatively successful in doing so. The Chorax system is within the sector controlled from Ratchuk, as is the Hensara system, so it is logical to assume that the sector commander decided Rogue Squadron needed to be eliminated. But how did they know where we were? Psalm's face darkened slightly. The presence of a spy in your midst cannot be fully discounted. Wedge glanced at Tycho but saw no reaction to the remark at all. A better man than I not to shoot back. No spy at all would leave the same evidence as a very good spy. One in so deep we couldn't find it. That is still no reason why we shouldn't look for a spy. Tycho shook his head. Security at the base was tight. We had no unauthorized messages going in or out. That you know of? No, sir. Or, Psalm smiled, that you're choosing to report. General, Captain Selchu is reporting the results of checks I performed myself. There were no leaks from Rogue Squadron. Akbar waved the discussion away with a flip of his hand. It is more than likely that the Empire planted a number of passive sensor devices in the buildings there after Vader killed off the colony. If such sensors gathered data, and then sent it out on a delayed basis or in a format we would not easily recognize, we would miss it. While we did have teams sweep the area, detecting passive devices is not easy. It also could have been blind luck. Psalm looked at Tycho. What do you mean, Captain? Tycho raked brown hair back from his forehead. Imperials tend not to be subtle. If I'd been in command and I knew where Rogue Squadron was, I would have brought in everything I had. We know Ratchuk Command has an interdictor and at least one strike cruiser that can carry three squadrons of ties. Since all of that didn't show up, I suspect they just sent out Stormtrooper platoons to recon uninhabited systems in the sector, assuming, of course, that they have spies in most of the inhabited systems. One platoon found us, and the commander decided to be ambitious and to destroy us himself. Akbar nodded. Another logical conclusion drawn from the evidence at hand. 
There has also been a fair amount of traffic by small trading ships into and out of Talisee. Yes, sir. Mtray can give you the data on them. He already did, and they all appear to be clean, Commander. But one misstatement by one crew member and your security would be compromised. Ultimately, though, the reason the Talisee base was discovered is less important than our discovery of the source of the stormtroopers. It has been two standard days since the stormtroopers died, so chances are very good that their absence has been noticed. Wedge folded his arms. Standard Imperial response would be to move in, secure the planet, and prevent us from using it again. We expect the Havoc and the Black Asp to be used to prevent Rogue Squadron from making a quick hit and run on the Talisi Expeditionary Force. They won't be defending Ratchuk. Psalm reached out and touched the holographic world. The island he selected grew up in place of the world of which it was part. As the image expanded, the computer added buildings, mountains, ion cannon batteries, and other details of military importance. Two steep mountain chains, the edges of an extinct volcano's crater, enclosed the base like parentheses. We have other information about the locations and patrol routes of the Ratchok Sector's ships. We believe Vladet should be open to a reprisal strike, and Grand Isle here is the place to hit. Wedge took a step closer to the holographic island floating in midair. Defense shields? Psalm smiled and Wedge was pleased that the predatory leer wasn't directed at him. Not if they want to fire their ion cannons. The island, as you can see, is part of an old volcano. The generators are geothermal and old and not up to the strain of raising the shield and powering the ion cannons. And if they choose to go turtle instead of trying to shoot? The bomber pilot traced a circle around what would have originally been the edge of the crater. To the south, the wall had broken down almost completely, and much of the base had been built on the flat stretch of land that linked the volcano and the bay. On the north side of the crater, the wall had begun to erode, but it was just a small divot compared to the gap to the south. The shield generator has to cover everything from the beach to the tops of the mountains. On the north side, it should be possible to blast through the mountain and open up enough of a gap to let our bombers in. Once we're under the shield, the generators go and it's over. It looks like it should work. Wedge rubbed a hand over his chin. Are we hitting and running or moving in? We want to cripple Vladit, so the Empire will have to move new forces in. Akbar hit another button on the arm of his chair, and the island vanished. The Ratchuk sector is immaterial at the moment, except as a symbol and a wound the Empire must stanch. We want this raid to go off in twelve hours. What will Rogue Squadron's operational strength be then, Commander? I'll be down two pilots. I could give Captain Selchu forges, X-Wing. No. General Psalm shook his head adamantly. Akbar opened his mouth in a smile. What General Psalm meant by this is that we will be using the Eridane as a command and control center. Captain Selchu will operate there to coordinate Rogue Squadron and Defender Wing. This is at Captain Afyan's request. Wedge frowned at General Psalm. How is it that you will trust Tycho to direct all our forces, but you won't trust him in the cockpit of an X-Wing? Isn't it obvious where he can do the most damage? Is that acceptable to you, Captain? He put enough of an edge in his voice that he felt certain Tycho knew he'd fight Psalm if Tycho wanted to fly in the raid. Yes, sir. I've not logged enough time in an X-Wing to be mission qualified anyway, Commander. So I'll be happy to do flight coordination and control. Psalm tugged at the hem of his blue coat. I'll have my own flight controller on the Aridane. You'll work with him. Of course, sir. And your man will decide whether or not to relay orders. 
Wedge nodded to himself. We'll make it work. Good. Akbar closed his eyes for a moment, and Wedge took that as a sign of appreciation for his cooperation. You are returning to the reprieve for the memorial service? Yes, sir. If you don't mind, General Salm and I will fly over with you in the Forbidden to attend ourselves. Wedge smiled, more at the Admiral's offer than Salm's clear look of surprise. We would be honored, sir. And we will honor your dead. Akbar turned to the bomber pilot. And you will want your defender wing pilots there too, yes, General? Salm hesitated, then nodded. Perhaps if we mourn together before we fly together, our units won't have so much to mourn after we hit Vladit. Curtin Lure ducked involuntarily as he felt a tremor rip through the soil. A muffled report reached his ears a second later. The comlink clipped to his lapel, hissed with static, then calmly reported, 418 and 420 are down. The intelligence agent shivered, and it wasn't the cool Talisian night that shook him. The stormtrooper making the report had reacted as if the rebels' little booby trap had killed droids, not people. Of course, stormtroopers are hardly people, are they? Brought up to be fanatically loyal to the Emperor, most of them seemed slightly distracted by his death. While this did not dull their efficiency, it did seem to make them care less about their own lives. On Talisi, care for one's continued well-being seemed to be a required skill. The rebels had rigged up a lot of explosive surprises for whoever followed them to Talisi. Just who that would be was not difficult for them to figure out. Lure straightened up. Not that it matters how many stormtroopers die. There must be a factory that stamps them out. He started to smile at his own whispered comment, but a cold dagger of fear plunged into his guts. Two stormtroopers in white armor emerged from the fog like wraiths risen from the grave. They stopped directly in front of him, but neither one bothered to crane his neck back to look up at Lure's face. Agent Lure. Curtin nodded and did his best to wear a mask reminiscent of pictures he'd seen of Tarkin. Yes. Priority message relayed from Vladit. You are ordered to return to Vladit immediately and await further orders. What does that idiot Devlia think he's playing at? Curtin had been furious when he learned Devlia had sent a single stormtrooper platoon to check Talisi. He had recommended using a probe droid and then following it with a full-scale attack. Devlia had ignored his recommendation and had sent stormtroopers because they were, in his words, a renewable resource. The same could not be said for probe droids. Nor could it be said of stormtrooper transports. Curtin stared down at the stormtrooper. Send a message back to Admiral Devlia and tell him I will return to Vladit when I am finished with my survey of this base. Sir, the message came from Imperial Center, not Admiral Devlia. He purposely, slowly raised his head and stared off above the white domes of their helmets. He knew his efforts to hide his shock and fear were useless. I suspect stormtroopers smell fear the way animals do. A ship has been sent for me? You're to take one of the shuttles, the Helicon, directly to Vladit. It is waiting for you in the landing zone. Thank you for relaying the message. His voice carried no conviction with it. Carry on. The two stormtroopers marched off through the swirling mist, leaving Curtin to be assaulted by cold air outside and cold dread inside. Iceheart must have already gotten my message about this fiasco. If she's looking to place blame for this disaster, it won't be on my head. He forced himself to smile and bolstered his efforts by visualizing 
a trembling Admiral Devlia. Tremble you shall, little man. In ignoring me, you have angered my mistress, and I suspect her anger can be decidedly lethal. The seven caskets lay atop a repulsor lift platform, each one draped with white cloth, to which had been affixed a blue emblem. For six, that emblem was the rebel crest. Blue Jane Forge's shroud bore the rogue squadron crest, with one of the dozen X-wing fighters cut away. The caskets had been laid out in the center of the starboard fighter bay aboard the reprieve, with Lou Jane's in the middle. Directly behind them stood all the members of Rogue Squadron, save one, and Dorney Hui had been allowed out of the back to tank for the duration of the ceremony, but she was still too weak to stand unaided. She lay back in a hover chair, her dark eyes half-lidded and her limbs nearly lifeless. She looked to Wedge the way he felt inside, all crushed down by the squadron's loss. Behind the pilots stood the techs and crew who had been evacuated from Talisi. Flanking them were the men and women of Psalm's Defender Wing, as well as some of the crew and medical personnel on the reprieve. The gathering reminded Wedge of the assembly held on Yavin 4 to honor Luke, Han, and Chewbacca for their destruction of the Death Star. I only wish this occasion were as happy a one as that had been. Wedge stepped out from between Admiral Akbar and General Psalm, looked down at the caskets, then back up again. Over seven years ago, many of our brethren were gathered together in the aftermath of a great battle to commemorate the heroism of our friends. None of us thought, at that time, of how desperate our situation was, or how long our battle against the Empire would continue. The future was, for us, the next minute, or hour, or day, or week. Life expectancy, especially among pilots, was measured in missions, and seldom were multiple digits involved in the calculations. At that gathering, on Yavin 4, we were able to celebrate our victory as if, with the destruction of that one terrible weapon, the first Death Star, we had brought the Empire crashing down. We knew it wasn't true. We knew we would abandon Yavin shortly thereafter. But for that time, we were able to forget how desperate and difficult our fight for freedom would be. We could forget how many more of our friends would die pursuing the common dream of freedom for all people, all species, within the galaxy. Wedge swallowed hard against the lump thickening in his throat. A dream still lives. Our fight continues. The Empire still exists, though its strength ebbs, its tenacity slackens, and its grasp on its worlds weakens. Dying though it is, it can still inflict death, and these, the bodies of our comrades, make that fact abundantly clear. I will not tell you that Lujane, or Carter, or Pyrgi, or the others would want you to keep fighting, or that your fighting will make their sacrifice worth it. That's trite and our friends deserve more than trite. They have given up what we fight to preserve. Our duty and their silent charge to us is to continue to fight until the Empire can never again strip life from those who want nothing more sinister than freedom for all. He stepped back then nodded to a technician near the launching bay's external port. At his signal, the repulsor lift platform gently rose and floated toward the vast opening. The ranks of pilots and ground crew parted 
to let the beer drift past, then closed up again as the platform entered the magnetic containment field around the external port. Once outside the ship, the platform dropped away from beneath the caskets, and they hung there, surrounded by stars and vacuum. The technician used a tractor beam to impel the caskets, one by one, on a gentle course toward the red dwarf burning at the heart of the star system. Off on a final convoy. As the white shrouds picked up the sun's red highlights, the string of seven caskets took on the appearance of laser bolts, traveling in slow motion, on a looping arc that would stab them into the distant star. Akbar rested a hand on Wedge's shoulder. It is never easy to let your people go. No, and it never should be. Wedge gave the Mon Calamari a firm nod. If it is, then we've become the enemy. And I'm not going to let that happen. 21. Corin's first glimpse of Vladit, after coming out of hyperspace, revealed a blue ball streaked with white and stippled with dark green. I think we ought to take it and keep it, Whistler. It looks a lot more pleasant than Fog World ever did. The astromech piped agreement, then brought the tactical screen up on Corin's monitor. Corin glanced at it, then keyed his calm. Three flight is negative for eyeballs. He raised his left hand and flipped a switch above his head. S foils locked in attack position. I copy, Nine. Stand by. Standing by, Control. Ahead of him, speeding in at the planet, two of Defender Wing's Y Wing squadrons flew with an escort of four X Wings each. Because his flight was two ships shy of full, he and Ural were assigned to Warden Squadron. Champion, with General Psalm flying lead, and Guardian Squadrons were to go in first and soften things up, so Warden, with its understrength defenses, could sweep through unmolested. From the briefing, Corin knew the base on Grand Isle would be no match for two squadrons of Y-Wings. In addition to two laser cannons, the Y-Wings sported twin ion cannons and two proton torpedo launchers. Each ship carried eight torpedoes, which meant either of the squadrons packed enough firepower to turn the lush, verdant landscape of Grand Isle into a black, smoking mass of liquid rock. Rogue Nine, continue to follow two flight, then orbit at Angel's 10K. As ordered, call us if you need anything. Will do. Control out. Corn thought he caught a hint of his own frustration reflected in Tycho's voice. The orders he had just given Korn were being relayed to the members of Warden Squadron by Psalm's own controller. The dual command chain was supposed to guarantee good command and control during the operation, but Korn doubted it would do anything of the sort. In Corsac, when we were working a joint operation with Imperial Intelligence, the dual control became dual control, and that didn't work well at all. The ride down through the clear atmosphere got a little bumpy, but having a little resistance to fight with the controls felt good after six hours of doing nothing during the hyperspace run. Corin leveled the X-Wing out at ten kilometers above the surface of the planet. Control, three flight on station. Can you send me tack visual from below? Here you go, Nine, from Rogue Leader, returning the favor. Corin's cheeks burned as he recalled his sensor data being used by the rest of the squadron on Folor. Relay my thanks. The visual feed from Wedge's X-Wing showed four Y-Wings swooping in at the northern face of the volcano's crater. From about a kilometer out, each of the slow craft launched a pair of proton torpedoes, then peeled off. The blue balls streaked out toward the mountainside. They exploded against it at a point where the abundant rains had already eroded and weakened the rock. 
The rippling series of explosions cast smoke, rock, and burning plants into the air. The visual feed went vector, with green grids representing the land hidden by the smoke. Where there had been a gentle curved dip in the crater's rim, there now existed a sharp jagged rift that looked as if some titanic vibro-axe had been used to chop the rock away. As Korn watched, the gap grew larger, and he suddenly realized it was because Wedge was going in. Tighten it up, Deuce. Wedge's X-Wing plunged through the smoke. Minoc, make sure Control is getting a topo scan of this trench. The smoke cleared almost instantly, showing him a bristle of shattered volcanic rock a dozen meters off each wing. Wide enough for the bombers, but not much room for error. He nudged his throttle forward, distancing himself from the Y-wings following in his ion wash, and emerged from the split rock faster than any prudent pilot would have flown. The laser shots from a quartet of Thai starfighters illuminated the air behind him as he came into the crater beneath the shield's protective dome. He immediately inverted and dove toward the base of the crater. Wind whistled from the S-foils. He rolled 180 degrees, filling his cockpit canopy with sky, and pulled back on his stick to level the X-wing out. The astromech behind him shrieked a warning. I know. I have two eyeballs on my tail. In the vacuum of space, the presence of two ties behind him would have been very serious because their superior maneuverability made them difficult to shake. In atmosphere, however, their less than aerodynamic design and the turbulence produced by their twin engines exhaust meant they had significant yaw problems. This made them no less deadly in a dogfight but it did open up a myriad of strategies for dealing with them. Deuce, help here. On my way. Broar's voice crackled through Wedge's helmet. Three, on me. I have them. Okay, time for me to gouge at least one of the eyeballs. Wedge brought the left wing up at 45 degrees, then feathered his throttle back. The lessened thrust and atmospheric drag slowed him enough that his X-wing slid 50 meters down and 20 to the right. The TIE pilot tried to follow him and remain at his back, but the hexagonal wings killed the side slip. The drag slowed the TIE considerably, and it started to dip toward the jungle, carpeting the crater floor. The pilot did the only thing he could to avoid a stall and crash. Diving his ship, he picked up speed and shot ahead of Wedge's X-Wing, but not so far in front to allow Wedge to sideslip left and come in behind. Not that I wanted to do that anyway. Wedge punched the left rudder pedal down and slewed the fighter's stern around to the right. Goosing the throttle straightened the ship out. Then Wedge's crosshairs spitted the tie and burned green. He hit the trigger and the quad lasers converged to blow bits of TIE Fighter all over the Grand Isle landscape. Vaped one. He saw a smoking TIE slam into a crater wall. You're clear, leader. Thanks, Deuce. Report three. Nawara Ven's voice seemed tinged with some disgust. Four got a pair. Island is blind to my sensors. Rogue leader to control. Champion is clear to run. Relaying that message now. Nine cents, thanks for the feed. Wedge smiled. He would have preferred to have Korn more involved in the action, but resistance was expected, and until they could bring a new pilot in for Lu Jane Forge, his flight would be vulnerable, in spite of the skills both Korn and Ural exhibited. General Salm had suggested leaving three flight to oversee Warden Squadron, Defender Wing's least experienced squadron. They'd all get mission experience, but nothing too life-threatening. Control to Rogue Leader. Champion and Guardian Squadrons beginning their runs. I can see them, Control. Through the gap lumbered the Y-Wings. Never an elegant craft, 
They appeared to have the atmospheric flight characteristics of something between a Thai starfighter and a big rock. All of the Y-wings dove to pick up speed, but they leveled out with little apparent trouble and started in on their strafing and torpedo runs. They may be slow and awkward, but Salm's pilots do know how to do their jobs. Control to rogue leader. We have trouble. Go ahead, Control. Two ships, Carrot-class cruiser and a Lancer-class frigate are in our exit vector. Eridane is beginning a withdrawal. Wedge felt his stomach begin to fold in on itself. Control confirm Lancer-class frigate. They're rare. Maybe this is a mistake. Please, let it be a mistake. Confirm Lancer-class frigate. Orders? Lancer-class frigates had been the Imperial Navy's solution to the problem of snub fighters and the threat they posed to capital ships. All of 250 meters long, the boxy ships were studded with 20 gunnery towers, each one sporting a Sanar Fleet System Quad laser array. With its speed, which was exceptional for a big ship, and those weapons, the Lancer-class ships were rankers amid a nerf herd. While the Aridane's turbo lasers could have driven it off, the Carrot-class cruiser outgunned the blockade runner, leaving the Lancer free to pounce on the fighters. The X-Wings were fast enough to elude the Lancer, but there was no way the Y-Wings could outrun it or fight it. The Lancer's guns made it the equivalent of 80 ties. Wedge glanced at his fuel monitor. He didn't have enough fuel remaining for a long fight with the Lancer and the run home. I don't have enough fuel to let the Aridane run for help. The best chance the Y-Wings had was for the X-Wings to engage the Lancer while they ran. Before he could reply to Tycho's request for orders, General Salm's voice came over the comm. Rogue leader, screen Warden and Guardian squadrons and get them out of there. Champion will buy you the time. Negative, General. Champion will die that way. Rogue may die if we hit the Lancer and you break out. I'm making this an order, Antilles. Rogue Squadron takes its orders from Admiral Akbar, General. Rogue Leader, this is Nine. Not now, Nine. Commander, I know how we can get the Lancer. Worst case, we lose one ship. What is he babbling about? Easy, General. Go ahead, Nine. Ships have to close to two and a half clicks to get a firing solution for a proton torpedo. The Y-Wing getting that close to the Lancer will be vaped. An X-Wing can get in and send targeting data to the Y-Wings, increasing the range for their solution. Same thing Captain Selchu did in the Forbidden at Chorax. The Proton Torps will home for 30 seconds, which means they can hit a target at just over 14 and a half clicks. That will keep them safe from the Lancer. Wedge frowned as he worked through Korn's plan. A weaving X-Wing might be able to get in close to the Lancer. General Salm saw the flaw in the plan at the same time Wedge did. A weaving X-Wing won't be able to get a targeting lock on the Lancer, Antilles. This is nonsense. Korn's voice came back strong. The X-Wing doesn't need to get a targeting lock. He just needs to get in close. The Y-Wings will be targeting the X-Wing's homing beacon. Time it right, put the Lancer between the missiles and the X-Wing, and you can scratch one Lancer. That just might work. Wedge pulled back on the X-Wing's stick and started up towards space and the waiting Imperial ships. I'll make the run. Negative Antilles. General. Rogue leader, this is nine, outbound. Release Warden Squadron to me. Psalm's fury sizzled over the comm. Under no circumstances. Stop now, Rogue Nine. Release the squadron to me. I'm outbound, and I'm going to play tag with that Lancer. This is treason, Nine. Psalm's voice cracked with anger. I'll have you shot. As long as it's Warden Squadron that's doing it, 
I don't mind a bit. Nine out. Antilles, do something. He's got the altitude, General. And the attitude. Release the squadron to him. Wedge let a deep breath out. Then form champion up on me, just in case his run doesn't do the trick. Corin Keat is calm. Okay, wardens. This is how we become heroes. Link your torpedoes so you'll be shooting too. You'll shoot them on my mark. Timing is critical here. Go too early and you won't hit anything. Go too late and I'm... Look, just don't go too late. Ten, I need you to match their speed and don't let them get any closer than eight and a half clicks from me. And not much farther either. My homing beacon will be on 312.43. Use that as the frequency for the target lock on the torpedoes. Got it, Nine. Control, Nine here. Be prepared to scatter the wardens with evasive maneuver plots in case the Lancer gets aggressive once the torpedoes are away. On it, Nine. Good luck. Corn's hand strayed to the medallion he wore. Thanks, Control. Nine out. Okay, Whistler. We have our work cut out for us. The pilot hit switches that pumped the full output of the fusion engine into propulsion. He ran all shield power to the forward shields. I'm going to be trying to weave in at that monster. I want you to route my stick commands through a randomizer that adds or subtracts portions of five degrees in all dimensions from my commands. Don't let the Lancer get out of a 20-degree cone of my nose. But in that cone, I want to be jumping around. Got it? The droid replied with a sharp, affirmative whistle. And at the Lancer, I want to invert and pull a tight loop, scraping right over the top of its hull and down the other side. We should be going away at 90 degrees to our current line and back toward Vladit's atmosphere. Corin sighed. If we make it that far. Whistler squawked reprovingly. Sorry to get you into this. Corin punched the console button that enabled the droid's ejection system. Maybe your next pilot won't be so stupid. The green light above the button went out. Corn hit the button again. And maybe your next ship won't have shorts. The light died again. The pilot turned and looked back at the droid. You got a death wish? Whistler brayed derisively at him. I am not looking at taking all the glory for myself. Corin swallowed past the lump in his throat. Thanks for hanging in. My father died alone. Doing that doesn't recommend itself. The droid gave him a scolding whoop. Okay, you do your part and I'll make sure we don't die. Corin looked at his scanner. Sensors put him 18 clicks out from the Lancer. Whistler, check my map. At full power, I'll do six clicks in the time it takes the missiles to catch me. That means they have to shoot when I hit the six-click mark. They have to be inside 15 clicks from the Lancer. Looks like we're all lined up and ready to go. The droid chirped triumphantly, and a countdown clock started in the upper corner of the sensor display. Nine to wardens. Forty. Four zero oh, seconds to launch. Whistler, cut in the randomizer when I hit two and a half clicks from the target. The Lancer's weaponry, because it was taken from TIE bombers, suffered the same range limitations as the fighters. Also, map how the towers are working and send that data back to control and rogue leader. If the Lancer has any weak points, any guns that aren't shooting well, they need to know. The timer counted down to ten seconds. Corin rubbed his medallion one more time, then settled his right hand on the stick and smiled. Here goes Rogue Nine, following the unit's tradition of accepting suicide missions with a smile. Wardens, on my mark. Five, four, three, two, one. Mark, launch torpedoes. The comm came alive with fire reports. Corin couldn't make sense of the babble, 
But as the clash of voices died, he did hear, Warden 3, torpedoes away. He glanced at the timer, which had started scrolling off seconds until impact. Two seconds late. Probably not a problem. Whistler, you want to kill the volume on the missile lock warning siren? I am aware they're incoming. The background noise in the cockpit died. He watched the seconds slowly count down. It seemed to take forever for him to pass from the launch point to halfway in on the Lancer. As his ship streaked in, he could see strings of green laser bolts begin to stretch out toward him. They began to curve and curl as the gunners tried to track his ship. The closing speed made all of their initial shots go long. Twelve and one quarter seconds from impact, Whistler brought the randomizing program into play, and Corin felt the stick begin to twitch. A tiny spark of fear ran through him as he imagined he had lost control of the ship. In its wake, he found a calm that felt all too familiar from the last night on Talisi. Well, I didn't die then. Maybe, just maybe... Easing the stick back and to the left, he tossed the X-Wing into the weave. Wave after seemingly solid wave of green laser energy lashed out from the Lancer, yet his snub fighter sliced through the troughs and curled around the crests, flirting with their deadly caresses. Light flashed against his shields, partially blinding him, but those glancing hits neither slowed nor deflected him. There was no missing his target. The Lancer-class frigate, Whistler identified it as the Ravager, swelled into a hard-edged, spiky rectangle with an upbent prow and a bulbous engine assembly. Green backlight from the quads splashed color over the ship's imperial white exterior. Corin nudged the X-Wing in line, more or less, with the ship's middle deck. Then the X-Wing whirled out of his control. In compliance with the instructions he had given Whistler before, the droid rolled the fighter hard to starboard. The stick bashed Corrin's right hand against the side of the cockpit, but before the pain could begin to register, the stick tore itself free of his grasp and smacked him solidly in the chest. With the stick pinning him back in his command chair, Corn could only look up and watch the Ravager's hull blur as it flashed past. The torpedoes had been within half a second of catching the X-Wing when it snapped up and around the Ravager. While fully capable of making the same maneuver the fighter had, because of their greater speed, the torpedoes needed more space in which to make it. Even as they started to correct their courses to follow Corin, they slammed into the Lancer and detonated. The first half-dozen explosions produced more energy than the shields could absorb. The shields went down, leaving the frigate open to the rest of the torpedo swarm. Blast shields buckled, and transparasteel viewports evaporated as the torpedoes detonated. Titanium hull plates went molten, flowing into globules of metal that would harden as perfect spheres in the frozen darkness of space. Decks ruptured, and the growing fireball at the center of the ship consumed atmosphere, equipment, and personnel with a rapacious appetite. All but two of the torpedoes fed into the roiling plasma storm raging in the heart of the Ravager. In bisecting the ship, the torpedoes cut all power and control links between the bridge in the prow and the engines at the stern. Automatic safeguards immediately kicked in and the engines shut down. All laser fire from the Ravager died and the stricken ship keeled over. It began to lose a tug of war with the planet below and slowly tumbled down into Ratchuk's gravity well. Corin in an X-Wing sprinting away from the Imperial frigate, could see none of the damage the torpedoes did to the Ravager. He stared down his sensor monitor and smiled as the sensors reported, line by line, the deaths of twenty-two torpedoes that were following him. Twenty-two? 
but there should have been 24. He pried the stick off his chest. Whistler, where are those last two missiles? The sensor array shifted. The torpedoes had shot under the lancer, reacquiring his beacon when he cleared the frigate's far side. Almost here? I have to break hard. The stick twitched and jerked of its own accord. Horror trickled electricity through Corin's guts. Whistler, cut it out! The stick still bucked and fought against his grip. Corin realized in one painfully crystal clear moment that in having used the indefinite pronoun it in his last command, he had made a mistake equal in magnitude to still having all shield energy in his forward arc. He started to rectify both of those errors, but the proximity indicator reported the location of Warden 3's torpedoes told him his time had run out. 22. Curtin Lure's shuttle came out of hyperspace a second before the spread of proton torpedoes hit the Ravager. Hanging nearly ten kilometers above the distant Lancer, all Curtin saw was a cone of green laser light stabbing off into space, then a brilliant light dawning at the base of the cone, illuminating the frigate in which it burned. Subsidiary blasts surrounded the ship with fire. Then it slowly started to drift away as escape pods shot in all directions away from it. What in Sith happened there? The shuttle's pilot shook his head. I don't know, but I'm reading a Corellian blockade runner out there and a number of Alliance fighters. I'm taking us into the expeditious now. The fear in the man's voice almost overwhelmed Curtin's sense of mission. While you're running, Lieutenant, get me as much calm chatter captured as you can. I want all of it. Do you have any survey probes? Launch one. Sensors are telling us all we need to know about the dead frigate, sir. Not it, you moron. Launch it at the runner and the fighters. Only because he couldn't fly the shuttle did Curtin refrain from throttling the pilot. If you had lasers for brains, you couldn't melt ice with them. Probe away. The pilot glanced back at him. Anything else? Or can I land us on the Expeditious and get us out of here? Are the fighters a serious threat to us? Probably not. They're all too far away. But I don't want to chance it. Very well. Do your docking maneuver. But keep data flow constant from that probe. As you command, my lord. Curtin ignored the mocking tones in the man's voice and sat back to think. The tiny rocket probe would provide little solid data. It was designed to be used to sink into a planet's atmosphere and provide a shuttle with wind and atmospheric data that would affect flight and landing. It also had basic communications scanning capabilities and some visual sensors that might provide him data about the blockade runner and the fighters. All of that would only confirm what he knew inside already. The fighters, or part of them at least, were from Rogue Squadron. Their need to strike back after the raid on their base was obvious, as was the Rebellion's need to punish Admiral Devlia for daring to strike at them. Curtin pressed his hands together, fingertip to fingertip. Lieutenant, is there any signal from Grand Isle? Automatic warning beacons and faint homing locators from tie wreckage. Good. Then Devlia got what he deserved. Curtin had assumed Rogue Squadron and the Rebellion would exact retribution for the raid even before he had deduced its location. This was why he had wanted a mechanical probe to be followed by a full-scale assault. Destroying Rogue Squadron would have hampered rebel operations in the Ratchok sector and clearly would have prevented the loss of the Ravager as well as Grand Isle. If it had been done my way, Admiral Devlia would be a hero instead of just dead. Curtin closed his eyes and summoned up all the information he had about troop strengths and locations in the sphere of space 
that surrounded Coruscant. Corellia and Quat both were located in the most thickly populated portion of the galaxy and were heavily defended because of their shipyards. Their sectors had limited rebel activity, largely because of the imperial presence. The rebels, while arrogant enough to think they could destroy the Empire, were not stupid. Hitting the Empire where it was strong was not a good way to win the war. Sectors like Ratchuk were weak links in the perimeter, but were not the keys to winning the Galactic Civil War. Industrialized warfare called for the destruction of a force's ability to wage war. Conquering primitive worlds that produced very little of what contributed to the war effort was not a way to do that. The ease of delivering forces to strike at Ratchuk from other Imperial garrisons meant it would be difficult to hold. Therefore, he assumed the rebels would not try to hold it. By leaving it in our hands, we have to devote forces to holding it, further diluting our strength. The ideal choice for a rebel strike would be in a sector of space where travel was limited because of black holes, clouds of ionized gases, and other gravitic anomalies that made hyperspace travel unpredictable and dangerous. It would also be outside the most solidly inhabited areas of the galaxy to minimize the amount of support the Empire could devote to it. But it wouldn't be so far outside that same area that the Alliance, which also drew a lot of support from the Empire's populous worlds, could not supply and support it. From his encyclopedic memory, Curtin dredged up the names of a dozen candidate sectors, and he knew there had to be four times that number that he did not know about. He purposely refrained from allowing himself to select a target. Assuming the veracity of a working hypothesis is the sort of mistake that caused Gil Bastra's death. I cannot afford another such mistake. The pilot flipped a switch on the shuttle's command console, and the wings retracted. The Lambda-class shuttle settled down on the dorsal hull of the cruiser. Retraction clamps clicked into place. A tremor shook the shuttle as the docking tunnel bumped the ship from below and formed an airtight seal around the shuttle's exit ramp. Curtin freed himself from his restraining straps. Lieutenant, download all the feeds and probe data onto separate data cards, then wipe this ship's memory. Yes, sir. Curtin left the cockpit and descended the ramp into the expeditious. Captain Rojan greeted him with a curious light in his eyes. Welcome back aboard, Agent Lure. Your timing was rather precise. We were not waiting long. I don't imagine the Ravager's crew has the same perspective on our timing you do. The shorter man shook his head, then adjusted his gray cap. Perhaps not. We might ask them about that if we are allowed to recover escape pods. Allowed to recover them? Most are going toward Vladet, but some are heading out into space. They probably assume the rebels will take the world. Rojan shrugged his shoulders. I would recover them, but I have strict orders to head out to the Pyria system the moment I have you aboard. The Pyria system was one of the candidate systems Curtin had pinpointed. Borlaeus was the name of the inhabited world in that system. The Empire maintained a small base there, overseen by General Ever Derricote. It was unremarkable, except that it was on his list of target systems for the rebels. Curtin raised an eyebrow. The orders came from Imperial Center, from Director Isard. Rojan nodded. There are sealed orders awaiting you in your cabin. Curtin thought for a second, then nodded. Pick us out of this system. If we pick up some escape pods before we jump, I have no problem with that. You will have to plot an evasive course to our destination. If the pods can concentrate themselves in our exit vector, they are all yours. The Navy captain smiled. Thank you, sir. 
No thanks are needed, Captain. We are all in this together. Curtin refrained from smiling, despite the feeling of power growing in his chest. I trade time for loyalty. Something I did not know to do on Corellia. With every lesson I learn, I become more deadly to the rebellion. Finally, he did smile. And the more deadly I am to the rebellion, the more useful I become within the Empire. That usefulness translates into power. And in the Empire, power is the very stuff of life. 23. Corin pushed himself back on his bunk, leaning against the bulkhead and drawing his knees up. What brings you guys here? Risati, sitting down at his feet, frowned. We just heard you were confined to quarters and could be facing a court-martial. How are you doing? The Corellian shrugged. I'm fine. Erisi Dlared brushed black bangs away from her face as she sat on Ural's bed. Aren't you angry? To be treated like this, after what you did? He hesitated before answering her. Upon their return to the reprieve, Wedge had pulled him aside and said General Psalm intended to bring him up on charges of insubordination, disobeying direct orders, and pirating a squadron of bombers. Wedge had said he thought he could get the charges quashed in light of how things went at Vladit, but until then, he wanted Corin to consider himself confined to quarters. In disciplining him in private, he gave Corin the chance to keep the matter private until it was adjudicated. I guess I'm not angry. Corin was surprised to hear himself saying that, but he didn't feel the throat-constricting rage that had characterized how he felt after his father's murderer was turned loose without so much as an arraignment. General Psalm has no choice but to prefer charges. What I did was pretty stupid and very risky, and I put one of his squadrons in jeopardy. The Twi'lek let one of his brain tails drape itself over Risati's shoulder and lightly stroke her throat. If the general didn't report Corin's actions, military discipline would break down. Any pilot with a crack-brained scheme, not to characterize what you did as crack-brained, mind you, could disobey orders and, most likely, get himself killed. Arissi leaned forward with her elbows on her knees. Corin noticed that her flight suit was unzipped far enough to give him a fair view of her cleavage. But Corin didn't get himself killed. Corin smiled. But it was a near thing. One of the pig drivers shot his torps late. They lost my signal, then picked it up again when I was heading away from the Ravager. When I noticed they were coming after me, I realized that Whistler hadn't killed the jiggle program he had running to randomize my flight as I headed into the Lancer's light. I wanted to break hard, but he had me locked in on a twenty-degree cone, so all I could do was fly straight. Then how did you... Even a puzzled frown couldn't detract too much from Erisi's beauty. I told Whistler to cut it out. I was thinking the jiggle code when I said it. Whistler, being a bit more direct in his problem-solving, just cut the homing beacon the torps were using to track me. They lost their target, couldn't reacquire it, and exploded. The second or so it took them to do all that took me outside their blast radius. Risati smiled and gently patted Nawara's brain tail. Well, we're happy your R2 unit takes such good care of you. And I, for one, want to thank you for doing what you did out there. That Lancer would have killed a lot of us if we had tried to take it out the normal way. The Twi'lek nodded. The traditional rogue squadron way, leaving bits and pieces of X-wings scattered around. The blue-eyed woman from Thyphera frowned at Nawara. We have a new tradition now. 
and Corin's action is a glorious part of it. We've had three missions, and we've lost none of our pilots. And this, when Commander Antilles told us our first five missions would kill a bunch of us off. Arissi, we have lost a pilot. Corin scratched at his chest where he'd been shot. We almost lost three more on Talisi. Don't start thinking we're invulnerable. The missions we've had so far have been relatively simple. I know that, Corin. I don't think of us as leading charmed lives. Her eyes tightened slightly, but Corin sensed no ire in the changed expression. In reading about the unit's history, it has always flown well on simple missions. Even so, our kill rates and repair rates are better than ever before. I don't doubt we'll have missions that will push us to the limit. But if statistics have any truth in them, we've not been burning up all our luck on our missions. Speak for yourself. Corin winked at her. At the bank of luck, I've hit my credit limit. Nawara jerked a thumb at the cabin's closed doorway. Well, there's a wing of bomber jocks willing to make payments on your account. Right now, they're settling for buying the rogues a couple of rounds down in the recreation center. They're toasting Broar for picking up two eyeballs over Grand Isle. Risati rolled her eyes. They'd rather be buying drinks for you. He's the hot pilot from the run. Two is more than I got. Arissi frowned at him. But you got the frigate. Corin shook his head. No, I didn't. What? The Twi'lek explained. If Corin had so much as shot one laser burst at the frigate, then he would have gotten a piece of the kill. But fractions below a half are not recognized as being worthy of being recorded. Warden Squadron got the frigate. Corin is able to verify it, but he gets nothing for it. That's not fair. Arissi looked from Nawara to Corin and back again. He should get credit for the kill. Arissi, Risati began, if you're shooting at some squint and he jukes and your shots illuminate an eyeball, would you want the squint to get credit for your kill? I see your point, but I do not think it is fair. I'll survive it. Corin shrugged. What's not fair is the three of you spending time here with me when you should be downstairs having fun and billing it to Defender Wing. Go on, have a good time. Risati stood and slipped an arm around Nawara's waist. We'll be going then. We'll let the others know you're doing fine. Thanks. Risati looked at Arissi. Coming? In a minute. All right. The two of them left, and the hatch slid shut. Then Arissi crossed the narrow room and took Risati's place at the foot of the bed. All of a sudden, it seemed to Corin that the cabin, which was none too big to begin with, had become much more close and tiny. He would have used the word intimate to describe it, but the way Arissi laid a hand on his knee gave him the impression she had that word in mind as well. And for some reason, that made him feel a bit uncomfortable. Corin, I just wanted to let you know that I felt... Feel. I owe you a debt. It will be very hard to repay. When the report of a Lancer being in our exit vector came through, I knew... Arissi hesitated and pressed her free hand lightly against her throat. I knew I wasn't going to make it. I'm not the best pilot in this unit, and I was certain I would die fighting against the frigate. And then you did what you did, and I felt as if a great crushing weight had been lifted from me. She shook her head, bringing dark bangs down to half hide her blue eyes. I know this is sudden and, well, I just feel very close to you now. Leaning forward, she rested both her hands on his kneecaps and laid her chin on top of them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, probably better than you think. 
She blinked her eyes, then smiled. You feel it too? I felt it. Corin sighed. A huge hunk of what you're feeling comes from the downside of the emotional spike you hit during the run. I know what that's like. In Corsac, I was partnered with a woman, Ayala with Siri. She was pretty. Not as pretty as you are, but no Gamorian either. We raided a glitter stim dealer's warehouse, and a rather nasty light fight erupted. One guy had me centered in his sights when she took him out. I'd thought I was dead, and she saved me. In the immediate aftermath of that, I thought I was in love with her. Or in lust, at least. Before then, we'd just been friends, like you and I are. Maybe there were some core sparks of something, but nothing we'd noticed or acted on. And that night, well, we both felt it. What happened? Corin scowled. The Imperial Liaison Officer took the two of us into custody for debriefing. Two days later, we saw each other again. The heat of the moment had passed, and we laughed about it, but never did anything. That fear, and having been so closely brushed by death, made us want something positive to counteract it. Is that bad? No, it's not bad, Arisi. Corin shifted around, so he sat beside her and held both of her hands in his. It's also not genuine. And, I must admit, I'm not sure about the wisdom of getting involved with someone inside the unit. Usadi and Nawara don't seem to have trouble with it. I know, and I think they're good for each other. Arisi raised his right hand to her mouth and kissed his palm. I think you may be right, Corin, but I need to ask you something. You said you and your partner had sparks at some basic level, and that led to your attraction to her. Do we have those sparks? Perhaps. I don't know. Feeling uncomfortably warm, Corin tugged at the collar of his flight suit. For the past several years, both before and since leaving Corsac, my emotional life has been a bit unstable. Is there someone else? Do you still care for your partner? No, there's no one else. Not Ayala, not anyone. Arisi pursed her lips for a moment, then nodded. I accept what you're saying. She stood and stretched languorously. Of course, you don't know what you're missing. Corin let out a deep breath, then rose from his bunk. I wish I didn't. Right now, though, I'm exhausted enough that I'd be no good to either one of us. She laughed and kissed him lightly on the mouth. Corin, I really do appreciate your concerns over my feelings. Arisi backed away from him toward the opening hatchway. Have sweet dreams. She turned in the open hatchway and came face to face with Mirax Tarek. The smuggler's daughter smiled politely. Excuse me, I didn't realize I was intruding. Not at all, Miss Tarek. All the warmth drained from Arisi's voice. I was just leaving so Lieutenant Horn could get some rest. He's confined to quarters, and I don't believe that order allows civilian visitors. Mirax tapped the data pad, riding in a sheath on her left forearm. I have permission to visit from his commanding officer. We can check with Emtray if you wish. Arisi looked back at Corin, and he would have preferred being under the Ravager's guns again to her stare. It's okay, Arisi. I'm sure Miss Tarek won't be staying long. Thanks for the talk. You're most welcome, Lieutenant. Arisi turned and nodded curtly to Mirax. Miss Tarek. Later, Mirax watched Arisi walk away, then added under her breath, Much later. Turning back around, she caught Corin staring after Arisi. Flyboys, all you think about is sex. What? 
She shoved the plastic case she was carrying into his stomach none too gently, then walked past him into the cabin. The smallest smuggling hold on a skate is bigger than this. The reprieve wasn't built for pleasure cruising or smuggling. I'm looking forward to grounding at a new base. Corn stepped back out of the hatchway and let it close. Hefting the box, he asked, What's this? Mirax flopped down on Ural's bed. Wedge said you might be down, but then he didn't realize the Bacta Queen would be here. I figured you might like some stuff from home, so I got this little package together, she shrugged. I intended it as something of a peace offering, I guess. Corin sat on the edge of his bed and undid the case's two latches. He opened the box and smiled. In it, he saw a half-dozen data card issues of magazines from Corellia, as well as two tins of spicy smoked Nerf and a bottle of Wyron's Reserve whiskey. Wow, this is more stuff from Corellia than I've seen in the past two years. Mirax rolled up on her right side and rested her head on her right hand. Below the whiskey is a Rishkate. I had to substitute some ingredients but I think it turned out pretty good. Corin pulled the whiskey bottle out of the case and set it down beside him. Beneath it, wrapped in clear plastic, sat the dark brown sweet cake that was traditionally reserved for birthdays, anniversaries, or other celebrations of momentous occasions. Last time I had Rishkate was after my father died, after the funeral. Where'd you find the Vuelune nuts to put into it? Around. Around? Yeah, around. There's a thriving black market in Corellian goods out there. A lot of us are out here, and with the diktat in place, the imps still control our space. This means we have a big demand with a restricted supply. So it pays to move the merchandise. She scowled at the hatch. That blasted protocol droid of yours has, er, had, to cases of Corellian whiskey and has been doling it out to me in one and two bottle lots. I could have gotten an old customs ship to replace the one that got left in that lake in the Hensara system for the whole case, but he's holding back on me. Getting two bottles out of him cost me a hyperdrive horizontal booster and a case of Lalash mixes that came from Alderaan before it died. Corn raised an eyebrow. M-Tray had the whiskey? I got two bottles from him. One's beside you, and one's in the Rishkate. She sat up, and their knees almost touched. You going to arrest the droid for smuggling? No, just let him off with a warning, I guess. The fighter pilot smiled. Do you want some of the Rishkate? You made it, so you should have some of it. She hesitated, then nodded her head. A small piece, but only if we can think of a reason to celebrate. How about being alive? Good enough for me. Corin punctured the plastic wrap with his thumb and broke a corner off the moist, flat cake. He split it in two and handed her the larger of the pieces. In keeping with the tradition, he said, We share this rich cake in the same way we share our celebration of life. To the celebration of life. They each bit into the cake, and Corn clumsily caught crumbs in his left hand. The cake itself was delicious. The sweetness softened the woody bite of the whiskey, and the Vuelu nuts just melted in his mouth. He swallowed and smiled. This is wonderful. Even if it was made from smuggled ingredients, even more reason to eat all the evidence, he shook his head. As a peace offering, I can't think of anything better. Good. Mirax stood and ruffled his brown hair with her hand. When this alliance finally gets around to going after Coruscant, I'll make another Rishkate, and you can carry it to whoever thinks they're in charge. Make the war shorter. This Rishkate might have been able to turn Darth Vader into a Jedi again, but I'm not sure it would work on old Iceheart. He set the case on the bed. Sure you don't want more? Thanks, but I need to go back to the skate. 
She looked at her data pad. I have about six hours until I pull a run coreward. Are we going to fly cover for you? Nope, I'm using my wits and guts to get me through. Corin frowned. No slight intended. But isn't that dangerous? Mirax shook her head. I've been ambushed once. And you rogues have been ambushed twice. Right now, I suspect traveling without you might be a bit safer than traveling with you. But this is a simple run anyway. She kissed him on the cheek as the hatch opened. Thanks for your concern. See you when I get back. The hatch eclipsed her as it closed. It struck him that while he had been relieved when Arissi left, he wished Mirax had stayed. He knew he didn't lust after her, though she didn't surrender much, if anything at all, to Arissi in the way of looks. With her, because of their common world of origin, he had a connection that he and Arissi would never share. Even the fact that their fathers had been enemies somehow strengthened the bond between them. He shook himself. Snap out of it, Horn. You're fixing on her the way Arissi fixed on you. Booster Tarek's daughter and Hal Horn's son might be able to be friendly enemies, maybe even friends, but nothing more than that. Remember, first, last, and always, she's a smuggler. There'll come a point when you're not cost-effective, and she'll cut her losses. He heard his words and knew there was a lot of truth in them. He also heard a lot of his father in them, and that gave him pause. He popped the other half of his piece of rishkate into his mouth. There are better things to do with my mouth than give voice to speculations that dishonor her gift. We can be friends, and will be friends. Out here, with the Empire cutting us off from our home, what we have in common is more important than any differences that might drive us apart. 24. Wedge's feelings about the briefing on Home One had started bad and quickly went to worse. It hadn't helped that he had no time to pull Admiral Akbar and General Salm aside to work out some sort of compromise on Corrin's case. Leaving him hanging is more of a disservice than disciplining him. Given the Admiral's apparent distraction with the briefing, Wedge assumed he would get no chance to make a case in support of Corrin. Though he was a commander, he was the most junior officer in attendance at the meeting. He recognized several people besides Admiral Akbar and General Salm, but by no means knew who all those in attendance were. He noticed a knot of four bothans, a general, two colonels, and one commander, up toward the front of the room, but could not name any of them. Clearly, though, they were in charge of the briefing, a point made abundantly clear when the junior officers moved through the room, downloading information from their data pads into those of the other officers. The Bothan general took the podium at the front of the room, and the lights above his audience dimmed. The Bothan's white fur became almost dazzling, and his golden eyes appeared to be made of liquid metal. Wearing an Alliance Army uniform and clutching a telescoping silver pointer in both hands at the small of his back, he began speaking in a soft voice that did not lack for intensity. I am General Laren Crefe, and I am now going to brief you on the mission that will open the way to Coruscant for our valiant forces. If you will look at your data pads, you will see the basics on the installation we are to hit. You do not need to know where it is right now, but suffice it to say possession of this base is the key to the Imperial Corps. Wedge did his best to follow the briefing. The world, code name Black Moon, was normal and habitable, not unlike Endor, save that it had no native life forms akin to the Ewoks. Initial survey teams, sent out under the Old Republic, had rated the world poor in mineral or otherwise exploitable wealth. 
A small base had been created there because the system proved useful as a plotting point for runs to the corporate sector and beyond. But being a crossroads in space was insufficient to spur much growth and commerce. Other than some experimental attempts at development, all of which failed when exotic research no longer earned generous investment tax credits under the empire, the world was left largely alone. The Empire did expand the base and provide force shield projectors, but only so the Rebellion would not find it an inviting target for transition into a sanctuary so close to the core. General Crefe gestured with an open hand. The base also supports four heavy ion cannons and has two squadrons of TIE fighters available to it. Wedge frowned. The defenses struck him as odd. Too much for an out-of-the-way world, but too little for a world that would put them perilously close to Coruscant. Vladit, a sector headquarters, had only had four ties on the ground, two ion cannons and a set of shields, but not enough power to bring both cannons and shields online at the same time. Wedge didn't get the feeling that Black Moon was some sort of imperial trap, but he did think it was tough enough that the imps on the ground might be able to summon help from other worlds nearby and hold on until it arrived. The Bothan general went on and described his proposed mode of attack. It consisted of using the Emancipator, one of two Imperial Star Destroyers that had been captured at Endor and repaired by the Alliance, to batter down the shields. General Salm's defender wing would then go in to pound the Imperial facilities and defenses, with Rogue Squadron keeping the ties away from the bombers. Once ground resistance had been weakened, troop transports would land Alliance troops and complete the conquest of the world. General Crefe concluded, I expect to be operational in two weeks, with conquest completed within 15 standard days from now. General Salm looked past Wedge to Admiral Akbar. This plan is already approved? Akbar, who had a silver Mon Calamari Admiral, Ragab of the Emancipator, on his other side, wore a pained expression on his face. Yes, General Salm, this plan... Crefe interrupted him. Forgive me, Admiral Akbar, but I believe I can answer that question myself. The Bothan brushed the white fur on his face with his left hand, bringing the fur down to a point at his chin. Yes, General. The Provisional Council has approved this plan. Would you be objecting to their exercise of wisdom in this matter? I would never do that, General Crefe, but two weeks to prepare for an assault is a very short time. If your pilots are not up to it, General, there are other Y-wing squadrons in the fleet. My people will be ready. No love lost between those two. Wedge raised his hand. If I might, I do have some questions about the operation. The Bothan opened his hands indulgently. Please proceed, Commander. The deflector shields. Your report shows them vulnerable to bombardment, when they are projected far enough to cover non-essential satellite facilities on the ground. What if the commander just shrinks the diameter of the coverage? It would not matter. The base has insufficient generating capacity to bring up shields that could withstand our bombardment. Even if the ion cannons are not online? That question brought a moment's hesitation before it was answered. It would make no difference. Wedge didn't like the faint confidence in Crefe's voice. The success of the operation was predicated on bringing the shields down. While Wedge didn't want to think General Crefe was being stupid, his reliance on bombardment from space seemed remarkably short-sighted. The Imps had chosen to use a ground assault on Hoth to bring the shields down. While bombardment had worked Elsewhere in the past, the Hoth solution seemed to work the best. And the presence of ion cannons on the ground meant the ships doing the bombarding could be disrupted, 
slowing their schedule, and raising the specter of help coming in from another system in time to beat back the assault. He raised his hand again. Yes, Commander Antilles. I don't see a breakdown of the ties on Black Moon. Are they eyeballs, squints, dupes, or brights? The Bothan's eyes hardened. I beg your pardon? General Salm translated. He wants to know if the fighters are TIE starfighters, interceptors, bombers, or advanced models. Uh, starfighters mostly, and some others. Crefe looked around the room for other questions, but no one had any. To maintain operational security, you will not be given the actual coordinates of your destination until you head out. The simulation packages you are given will fill your needs for detailed information. Isa Nysard has stepped up her counterintelligence efforts against us, and without surprise, this mission will suffer. Without surprise, our people will suffer. Wedge shook his head. I don't like this. The Bothan General's eyes narrowed to golden crescents. Your likes and dislikes are immaterial, Commander. The Provisional Council has approved this plan, and that is enough. The Corellian pilot bristled at the rebuke. They may approve of it, but they're not going to be flying this mission, General. But I will be their commander in the first transport, leading the way down to take Black Moon. Crefe's nostrils flared as if he were sniffing about for prey. I trust you do not doubt both in courage. How could I, when you Bothans take every opportunity to remind all of us that your people captured the location of and information about the second Death Star? No, sir, I do not. I trust you do not doubt the courage of my people. They'll do the mission, but I feel I have an obligation to them to make sure they're going to come home from it. Crefe's lip curled in a sneer. An obligation you have acquitted so well in the past, Commander Antilles. Wedge felt a fist tighten around his heart. The faces of all the friends and comrades he had lost throughout the rebellion flashed through his mind. It struck him that each one of them had become posthumous heroes specifically to allow idiots like Crefe the opportunity to make more rebels into posthumous heroes. The ranks of the dead seemed endless, and inside a heartbeat the fire wedge would have turned on Crefe was snuffed by the void that had claimed those he remembered. Akbar stood abruptly. I believe, General Crefe, that Commander Antilles's concerns are valid. I am surprised your normally painstaking precision in manners of intelligence gathering has been allowed to flag here. If you will, you have told us the hour the tide will be high, but some of us need to know the minute and the second. You have it within your ability to provide us this information, and you will. The Bothan glared at the Mon Calamari. Or? Or I will see fit to cancel the operation. But the Council approved it. Akbar's chin came up. The Council is a political body that makes political decisions. Unlike a battle where the outcome cannot be reconsidered, political decisions can be recalled and revised endlessly. The Council did decide that a move toward Coruscant needed to be made, and your assault met the parameters they set forth. This does not mean it is the only plan that might do that. We shall see whether or not this assault goes forward, Admiral. I will distribute simulator packages to all the commands so they may begin training. The Mon Calamari rested his fists on his hips. You'll get that data, or I shall destroy all your simulator packages myself. The Bothan nibbled his lower lip, then nodded to his staff. Fine. We will get you the information you want, if it is obtainable. He snapped an order in both into his aides, and they trailed from the room. The room emptied rather quickly, 
leaving Wedge, Psalm, and Akbar alone before the illuminated podium. The Mon Calamari lowered his head and peered down into Wedge's face. You have my sympathies. That was uncalled for. Wedge still felt like he'd been gut shot. Why is it that everyone gives the Bothans credit for locating the second Death Star and announcing the Emperor would be on it? Has everyone forgotten the Emperor lured us to Endor to exterminate us? The Bothans were had, yet they wear their deception like a badge of honor. The Mon Calamari nodded slowly. I have heard others voice your opinion, mostly those in the Council who have found themselves between a Bothan and some mote of power. Bothans would tell you that the Emperor only conceived of the ambush after the information was stolen and he became suspicious. We only have the Emperor's word that he fooled the Bothans, and while Luke would never knowingly lie to us, I cannot trust the Emperor in anything. Wedge sat forward and scrubbed his hands over his face. I'm sure you are correct, Admiral. I guess I just see that doubt as the shadow lurking behind the unbridled self-confidence the Bothans exhibit. They may have been right about the Death Star, and Crefe may be right about this Black Moon, but if he isn't, lots of people will die. I share your concern, Commander. You will get your information. The Corellian nodded. Can you tell me where this Black Moon is, anyway? Akbar hesitated. Need to know, Commander. And right now, you don't need to know. Before you go, however, you will have all the data you need. The Black Moon system is located in a dense sector, with limited ways in and out. Computing astronav solutions will be simple since there are so few. It makes ambushes easier, too, so the information will be provided when you need it, not when you want it. Wedge mulled that over, then nodded. I do understand the need for security. I don't like the limitations it imposes, but I understand them. The Mon Calamari's mouth opened in a low chuckle. We have progress. You'll be moving from the fleet to a world called Noquivzor, and you will stage from there. Several other units will join you there, including Defender Wing. He clapped his hands together. So, I imagine you would like to discuss the charges General Psalm will bring against Corin Horn? Wedge sat back up. If we're going to be living together, I think it would be for the best. Do you concur, General? Psalm nodded his head. I agree, but let's save the trouble. Forget the charges. Excuse me? The balding bomber pilot held his hands up. If I push for a court-martial of Horn for his actions, I'd be a fool, and he'd sit out this assault on Black Moon. Psalm's brown eyes contracted with disgust. I still think the whole of Rogue Squadron is out of line, but I think things are going to go badly at Black Moon. With Horn and the rest of your pilots there, maybe things won't end up becoming the nightmare that I'm afraid is going to haunt me for the next two weeks. 25. That General Derricote managed to refrain from sweating in the steamy atmosphere of Borlaeus did not surprise Curtin Lure too terribly much. The good general was toad-like enough in his demeanor that the intelligence officer imagined it saved him from melting in the heat and humidity. The bloated, lumpen commander of Imperial forces in the Piria system fitted his face with a smile. The abrupt curve of his mouth imitated by the sweep of the two chins jiggling beneath it. I am pleased to see, Agent Lure, that the past week and a half here on Borlaeus have not appeared to have taken their toll on you. The man pressed stubby-fingered hands against the dark wood of his desktop. You found everything you needed for your survey of our defenses? Curtin nodded once. 
then froze and stared down at the Imperial officer for a second without saying anything. He waited, silent and unmoving, until the corners of the man's smile began to quiver. My security review proved satisfactory. Everything is as it should be here at the installation. Your shield generators are in good repair. Your two squadrons of TIE fighters are being maintained at a high level of readiness. And your training schedule has your pilots logging enough time for twice their number. Preparation is the price for constant vigilance, Agent Lure. Derricote's voice remained blasé, but his bovine brown eyes began blinking a bit more rapidly than they should have normally. We are here to stop the rebellion, so we must be prepared. Curtin smiled easily, then leaned forward on the man's desk. And you are prepared. You have done very well to keep this base secure. And in fact, your computer security is tighter than anything I have seen outside Imperial Center itself. You also work harder than any other officer I have seen since the Emperor's death. I am all for the Empire. You are all for yourself. Curtin tapped the data pad built into the man's desk. I took the liberty of visiting your office when you were not here, and I pulled the secret files from your data pad. You truly are an artist. You duplicate requisitions, append intricate routing tags to them, and send them off to multiple commands, each of which believes you are under its care. You have successfully drawn enough fuel and ordnance to maintain four squadrons of TIE fighters. Since only two are here, I have to assume the others are at the Alderaan Biotics site. I don't know what you're talking about. I sincerely doubt that, General. I have read your file. You studied at the Imperial Naval Academy, but concentrated on biological and botanical subjects. While you are fully qualified to oversee a military installation such as this, you are uniquely suited to making the biotics site operational again. Curtin smiled. And profitable? Derricote's face became ashen but his smile did not fully erode. This has not been unanticipated, Agent Lure. I do have resources. Curtin raised himself to his full height, then looked back down at Derricote. This does not surprise me, General. The Alderaan Biotics Hydroponic Facility was barely more than a tax loss for the parent corporation before the tax laws changed. It was abandoned to the care of maintenance droids and forgotten. Then Alderaan was disciplined, and the market for goods from Alderaan blossomed. My conservative estimate, based on data about 12 months old, is that if you've been operational for two years, you should have cleared two million credits. We have been at our fullest production capacity for only 15 months, but our overhead is low, so we have actually made 2.75 million credits, though much of this is tied up in inventory maintained off-world. Your overhead is low because the Empire is subsidizing your operation. The General steepled his fingers. Think of it as our operation. I could think of it as my operation, General. Curtin folded his arms across his chest. I do not think I could hold it for long, however. In going back over your security system, I noticed evidence of what could have been Alliance tampering with Holonet messages. Derricote's eyes grew hard, and he sat up straighter at his desk. Bothans. They make runs at all Holonet communications. I feed them data, and it keeps them happy. The edge in the man's voice surprised Curtin, as did the physical transformation. Just by sitting up and raising his chin, 
Derricote had shifted from being a noodle-spined sycophantic failure to the sort of man who could engineer the deception that made his covert agricultural enterprise possible. He showed me what I wanted to see, so I would underestimate him. Derrico touched the screen on his data pad. Frequency of hits and length of contact is up. Should I correlate that to your visit, Agent Lur? Or shall I just assume the Alliance and Empire taking an interest in my little home is a coincidence? Curtin's eyes narrowed. The Perius system is one of a number that fits a profile for being a conduit into the core for the Alliance. It fits because they don't know about my defenses. Two more squadrons of TIE fighters will mean little to them. Ah, so there are some things you don't know about Borlaeus. Imagine that. Derricote smiled. I tell you what, son. You leave the defenses here to me. You're an intelligence officer, not a military genius. Curtin pointed to the general's private data pad. I saw nothing in there to indicate you're a military genius, sir. Derricote tapped the side of his head with a thick finger. That's because I'm smart enough to know that the only data that is safe is the data stored up here. I've anticipated a move against Borlaeus ever since I found the biotics station in working order, and I've planned accordingly. The intelligence officer heard the confidence in the man's voice and isolated another component in the tone he used. Eagerness. You're looking forward to this. I may have my business on the side here, Agent Lure, but I am a loyal son of the Empire. The large man shrugged. Besides, I was at Dara Four. I learned to enjoy killing rebels there and have formed my plans here to make Borlaeus just as deadly to the Alliance. A convoy died at Dara Four, General. A laudable event, but it was not a military force. Curtin shook his head. You'll get their best here, including Rogue Squadron, I do not doubt. Their best or their worst, it does not matter. General Derricote smiled easily. They're expecting to snuff a candle here at Borlaeus. But when they come, they'll get burned by a Nova. 26. Corin's X-Wing came out of hyperspace in the shadow of the Emancipator. The Imperial Star Destroyer's dagger-like profile stabbed deeply into the image of the world he knew only as Black Moon. Beyond the Emancipator, he saw the Eridane and two modified bulk cruisers. The Mon Vale was home to Psalm's Defender Wing, while the Coralag was the launching platform for the eight assault shuttles that would ferry down the rebel ground troops. The Emancipator remained in position to safeguard the fleet's exit vector from the system. While none of the briefings had supplied Korn the name of the system and world, he did know jumping out would be difficult. General Crefe, in giving them a final briefing, had emphasized the need for security concerning the operation and had promised that while they did not know the name of the world at which they were going to fight, future generations would and would laud them for having been there. At the time, Corin had thought Crefe had enough confidence to take the world by himself. But that failed to banish the bad feelings he had about the mission. The briefings had all been longer on morale building than they had on facts. While the simulator runs had let everyone get comfortable with their roles in the assault, something just felt wrong as far as Corin was concerned. Keep your eyes open and fly your best. That's all you can do right now. Whistler brought up Corrin's tactical screen. Rogue leader, I have no enemy ships on scan, but the base does have a shield up. Thanks, Nine. Rogues, form up to escort Defender Wing. 
Wedge's voice came cleanly through the speakers on Corrin's helmet. Fly high side on the Emancipator. Corrin pulled back on his stick and kicked the X-Wing over in a lazy roll that brought him up above the Star Destroyer. All at once, the capital ship started pulsing out salvo after salvo of turbolaser and ion cannon shots. Red bolts would merge into sheets of energy burning down through the atmosphere to slam into the Imperial base's shielding. The bloody red color would soak down into the shield, obscuring the installation beneath it. As it faded to pink, a cerulean blanket of ion cannon energy would drop over it. The blue fire fragmented and sizzled over the energy dome with hundreds of lightning-like tendrils. Some of them bled off the dome, and buildings outside its sanctuary exploded and melted. The surrounding jungle began to burn, ringing the base with fire. Makes for a perfect target, though the fire will make flying tough down there. Whistler, get me a general track on air currents ground side. Also, monitor the size of the shield. When it shrinks, it's coming down. Wave after wave of energy poured down through the rising column of smoke. The energy slammed into the shields with a thunder crack that sent vibrations deep enough to shake the command bunker where Curtin stood. The relentless pounding had made him flinch at first and fear for his life. But now the sounds merged into one unending rumble. The few working monitors in the command center showed satellite views of the attacking fleet and of the fiery circle on the planet's surface. Derricote turned toward Curtin. Hard to believe anyone could survive down there, isn't it? The intelligence officer nodded. It does tax credulity, General. And the rebels are so ready to be credulous. The military man looked over at one of the technicians at the shield controls. Status, Mr. Harm. Still at 100%, sir. Good. Begin a step back in random percentages of power. Randomize from 7. When you hit 75%, cut to 50. When their salvos slacken, go down to 20, then 5, then 0. Curtin felt fear trickle through his guts. You are confident they won't level this place? They took Vladit down to the foundations. Which is why we are below the foundations, Agent Lure. Curtin cringed as a particularly powerful blast shook the ground. I trust you know what you are doing. As you have no choice, I appreciate your confidence. Derricot rubbed his hands together. The rebels want this place to use for future operations. That's the only reason they're attacking. If they want it, they're going to pay my price to get it. Whistler's squawk made Corrin focus on the tactical screen. The shields over the base had begun to contract. As they began to come down, the Emancipator slackened off with turbo laser fire and concentrated on using the ion cannons. While they did slightly less damage than the lasers, if the shields came down unexpectedly quickly, an ion salvo wouldn't destroy what General Crefe intended to capture. Corrin brought his X-Wing in beside Warden Squadron and killed his thrust. Three flight on station. I copy, Nine. Stand by. Tycho's voice clipped off abruptly as the flight controller switched channels. Corrin flipped his comm unit over to the tactical frequency he shared with his flight. They still had not gotten a pilot to replace Lu Jane, so three flight remained one pilot light. That was just one element of the operation that Corrin didn't like. He knew pilots were not easy to come by, but he knew Tycho could have easily flown Lu Jane's X-Wing, and he thought the man would be a lot more valuable in a fighter than inside the Aerodane directing traffic. Ten. Twelve. We hold here. Corn glanced at his tactical screen. Their shields are failing fast. We'll be going in next. 
Whistler's triumphant fleet heralded the collapse of Black Moon's shields. Corrin started to smile, but something nagged at the back of his brain. He couldn't identify it, but it nibbled away at his smile and started bile burning in the back of his throat. He keyed his calm. Control. Nine still shows the enemy to be blind. Got it, Nine. Rogues, stand by. An uncharacteristic hesitancy echoed through Tycho's words. Rogues, this is direct from General Crefe. You will escort the assault shuttles down to the planet. Say again, Control? The disbelief in Wedge's voice resonated through Corin. Defender Wing is ready for its sweep. Rogue Leader, Crefe sees that as an unnecessary delay. The Y-Wings have been ordered home. You are to escort his shuttles in. Resistance on the planet is ended. Control, what about the ion cannons? If they could have shot, they would have done so by now. General Crefe's voice growled through the comm channels. Resistance is ended. It is time to claim our prize. Static punctuated the silence that followed Crefe's declaration. Then Wedge came back on the frequency. Rogue leader to rogue squadron. Form up to screen the escorts. Corn's stomach flip-flopped. I don't like this. Nine, this channel is for military use, not opinions. Let's save commentary for the debriefing. Wedge's voice lost some of its edge as he continued to speak. And let's fly well enough that there is a debriefing. That's my intention, rogue leader. Corin eased his throttle forward and hit a switch. S foils in attack position. The Emancipator rose away from the planet, taking up a position so it could screen the force from any interloping Imperials. Corin felt even more naked as it withdrew. While the Star Destroyer was not built to deal with starfighters, its overwhelming firepower could interdict ties and perhaps even destroy their launching facilities on the ground. Of course, Crefe would forbid them from doing that since he wants the real estate intact. Corin's sense of unease grew as he closed with the boxy assault shuttles dropping away from the Coralag. The eight shuttles each carried 40 commandos and would make three round trips between planet and the Coralag to bring the whole force down. Though they were slow, the shuttles were sufficiently armed to hold ties at bay long enough so the rogues could pick them off. His tactical screen still showed nothing in terms of fighter opposition. The base's shields were down. The operation seemed to be going better than expected, and that realization started a cold chill working up Corrin's spine. He knew it was silly for him to feel fear when everything seemed normal, but part of him couldn't accept the good fortune. His left hand pressed unconsciously to the medallion he wore. Things were going this perfectly when my father died. We anticipated trouble, found none, and I relaxed. He died because I relaxed. I watched it happen, and I did nothing. I didn't see it coming, but it did. Just like it will here. What is wrong here? The answer to the question came to him a nanosecond before the first Azure Ion Bolt lanced up from the ground and hit the first assault shuttle. The blue energy snared the motor an and enmeshed it in a web of electrical discharges. Flashes of silvery light marked explosions in the weapons system and engines. With smoke pouring from a dozen hatches, the shuttle began a slow rolling tumble through the atmosphere and the ground below. It never hit the planet. A full kilometer above the ground, it crashed into a renewed energy shield. The shuttle exploded. Bits of debris struck sparks from the shield as they skipped across its surface. Whistler wailed out a warning. 
The tactical screen showed multiple fighter contacts heading up out of launch tunnels around the shield dome perimeter. It also reported that while the shield had grown no larger in diameter, its power level was 200% higher than before. Easily half again more powerful than possible, given the power generation estimates in the briefings. All that and ion cannons too. Control, Wedge ordered. Pull the transports out, now! Rogue leader, you have multiple fighters. Two squadrons, eyeballs and squints. Got them, Control. Rogue squadron, keep the imps off the shuttles. Corrin shook his head. Seven shuttles, two dozen imps, and eleven X-wings. Piece of Rishkate. Whistler's mournful keen matched Corrin's feelings more than his words. He keyed his calm. Three flight, hang together. Squints are coming our way. Oral has them, Nine. And Dorney likewise reported in. Twelve has acquired targets. Corin punched up a graph and had it overlaid on the track of the incoming interceptors. Coming at us rather obliquely. Their funeral. Three flight, switch to proton torpedoes and lock a target in. If they want to play, a trio of ion blasts shot up from the planet's surface. One sliced in at three flight, cutting through the vector the squints should have been using to engage the X-wings. The second hit the Emancipator and played out over it like a thunderstorm on a prairie. The third lanced up at one of the shuttles, but never reached its target. Corin saw the blast diffuse ever so slightly, as if it had hit a shield, but its dissipating ball left no debris behind. Two report. Dead air answered Wedge's call. Rogue leader, we have no contact with Rogue Two. Damn. Peshk caught that one. He's gone. Full evasive rogues? Control, get the shuttles dancing. Stay alert, three flight. Corin's aiming reticle went red, and a target lock tone filled his ears. He tightened on the trigger and launched a torpedo at an approaching interceptor. Switching to lasers, he linked all four, then picked another target. As his torpedo hit the first, he flashed into range on the second and let it have a full burst of laser fire. The glare of lasers against his shields hid the results of his shooting, but Whistler reported one interceptor destroyed and another damaged. In seconds, he shot past the line of interceptors, then hauled back on his stick, rolled, and dove back in at them. The squints, reduced from eight to six, split up into flight elements and moved to engage single X-wings. As two started to circle around toward him, Corn inverted, dove, and came back up and around to go head-to-head -head with them. He boosted power to his forward shields, then pulled a snap roll that stood the X-wing on its port S-foil. That narrowed his profile and allowed the first volley of laser fire from the squints to pass on either side of himself. At the last second, he selected a proton torpedo and let it fly at point-blank range. Even though it never got a solid target lock, it nailed the lead tie dead on and tore it apart. Corin nudged the stick and shot through the center of the fiery explosion. Clear on the other side, he lost the interceptor's wingman, but a more immediate problem captured his attention. Twelve, break to port, now! And Dorney's X-wing juked left, but the squint riding her exhaust staved with her. Break harder, Twelve, climb. Not do. Lateral stabilizer gone. Weave, Twelve. The Rodian started her X-wing in the corkscrew maneuver, and the interceptor's first shots went wide of their mark. Then the aft end of the ship came back around and the squint's fire ripped up through the engines. Fire blossomed on the right side of the ship, shredding the S-foils. A second later, the whole fighter shook and its skin split from the inside out. Argent flames burst free, converting the ship into a miniature sun. 
Then the roiling ball of gas collapsed into its own black hole. Bloodlessly, Corn vaped and Dorney's killer. Part of him wanted to cheer at having exacted revenge for her, but he overrode those emotions. He could no more allow himself to luxuriate in the death of an imp than he could afford to mourn his comrade. There would be time for that later, if there is a later. Anything that distracted him from the job at hand would kill him, so he pushed it all away and concentrated on the battle around him. Three flight. Shuttle Devonian has four interceptors inbound. Oral copies control. Oral has them. I'm on your back door, Ten. The interceptors had reformed into two flights and had selected one of the assault shuttles as a target. Oral brought his X-wing in behind the lead pair and throttled back to match their speed. Oral using torpedoes. Shoot straight, Ten. The ties broke formation and split out in four directions. Ten, go to lasers. They must have lock threat warning systems. A fighter with that equipment would provide the pilot with an indicator light when another ship had a torpedo lock on him. By jinking sharply, it was possible to break the lock before the torpedo was launched. The interceptor pilots ahead of them clearly knew their business. Only very good pilots survive to become veterans in ties, making them far deadlier than the pilots the rogues had yet faced. Corin rolled the X-Wing up on the starboard stabilizers and started the long turn that would bring him in behind one of the squints. Whistler anxiously hooted a warning about another interceptor, moving to swing onto Corin's tail. But the pilot did nothing to lose the fighter. He pressed his attack, sharpening the arc of his turn to trim distance from his target. Whistler became more insistent, and Corn smiled. Kill thrust. As the droid complied with that order, Corn punched the right rudder pedal with his foot. That swung the aft end of his ship up, a maneuver that further corrected his course for the ship in front of him. It also provided a tantalizing broadside shot for the squint following him. Counterthrust, now! Whistler brought the engines back up to power as the X-Wing's aft completed its 180-degree arc. The engines thrust against the line of the ship's flight, effectively killing its momentum and, for a split second, freezing it in space. For the barest of moments, it lay dead in the sights of the interceptor. But the interceptor pilot had already begun his roll and turn to keep his guns trained on where the X-Wing should have been. Korn feathered his left rudder pedal and tracked the nose of his fighter along the squint's flight path. The quad lasers loosed two bursts of red darts that perforated the port wing and stabbed through the cockpit. That interceptor slowly spiraled out of control. More ion bursts from the planet coursed through the dogfight. The Emancipator took two more hits, and the Mon Vale took another. Corin didn't see any more fighters get hit, nor shuttles, but a string of green laser bolts slicing across his flight path distracted him. Oral hit! Corin punched the throttle and whipped the X-Wing up and over in time to see his wingman's ship break apart. Oral! The X-Wing disintegrated. The engine pods spun off in different directions, and the cockpit canopy exploded into a million glittering fragments. He saw Oral float free of the stricken ship, and saw the Gand wave his arms. Corn hoped it was more than random reflex. Then a piece of the fighter's S-foils sliced through the pilot's right arm, taking it off above the elbow. The body began to tumble through space, but it remained otherwise unmoving. Control, Tan is extra vehicle. Get someone down here to get him. Nine, Emancipator reports the zone is too hot for rescue operations. Convince them, Control. Wedge's voice came onto the frequency. Control, I have three and eight EV. 
We need help here. I'm on it, rogue leader. It'll be done. Three and eight. That's Nawara and Arisi. Two dead and three more out of the fight. A new voice came through Corin's headset. Control here, rogues. Good news. Your rescue's on the way. Bad news? We have two squadrons of squints coming in from Planetary North. ETA, two minutes. Shuttles are heading to hyperspace now. Corin watched as the assault shuttles started the runs to light speed. The Coralag had already vanished, as had the Y-Wings, leading the way out of disaster. Two ion blasts caught the Mon Vale, stopping it dead in space. The Eridane was beginning to move, and the Emancipator had begun to drift toward planetary north, but, in doing so, oriented itself for entry into hyperspace, as if Admiral Ragab could not decide whether he was going to run or fight. Run. No reason to stick here. A sharp whistle from his astromech made Corin invert his ship and dive. A pair of squints flashed past, then one exploded as Rogue Four shot by on its tail. Thanks, Four. Thanks for playing bait, Nine. The remaining ties broke away and headed toward the incoming fighters flying over the planet's polar cap. Do we pursue, Rogue Leader? Negative. Screen our people until pickup. Corin Keed is calm. Rogue Leader, two squadrons of squints against a half dozen of us is going to be ugly. Nine, if you can't handle your four, I'll take them. Corn ignored Broar's jibe. Trim it, rogues. We're here protecting our own. Wedge's voice carried a confidence with it that buoyed Corn's spirits. Focus on your mission and let the rest take care of itself. Control to rogues. Squint ETA is 30 seconds. EB3 is recovered. Corn smiled and looked up. In the distance, he could see the white triangular hull of the Forbidden motionless in space. The pilot had brought the ship in close to where Nawara Ven had been floating, then used a rescue tractor beam to pull the pilot inside the emergency hatch in the hull. The Corellian brought his X-Wing up and around, then flew toward where Ural hung in space. Ten is here, Forbidden. Thanks, Nine. I have the coordinates. On my way. Corin blinked. That's Tycho's voice. Cap, is that you? Guilty, Ten. You have four squints closing on your position. Deal with them before I get there, please. You got it. Corin shivered. The only thing he could think of that was more stupid than engaging four interceptors with a single X-Wing was flying an unarmed shuttle into a hot zone to pick up pilots. A smile slowly crept across his face. It's only stupid if we die doing it. Otherwise, it's heroism. And I can be a hero today. Corin jumped his throttle full forward and shunted laser energy into his engines. That pushed his speed up toward maximum. Adjusting the stick and tapping the pedals, he made his ship jump cut and dive. He flipped his weapons over to torpedoes and tried to get a lock on the lead squint, but it juked out of his sights. The others took shots at him, but his evasive maneuvers made them miss. His fighter flew past them, and two of the interceptors started loops to come after him. Their turns took them high and away as they throttled up to match his speed. Increasing their speed meant their loops became wider than they might have preferred. They outnumber us enough that being a bit sloppy can't hurt. Corin chopped his throttle back to half and pulled his X-Wing through a tight turn. Forbidden? Paint one with a missile lock. Punching the throttle full forward, Corin shot his ship back along the vector that had carried him through the squint formation. One of the interceptors broke off on its run at the shuttle so Korn concentrated on the other. He centered the ship in his aiming reticle and waited until he got a missile lock. 
When the reticle turned red, he hit the trigger and sent a proton torpedo speeding out toward the interceptor. The interceptor pilot juked up and starboard, which pulled him out of the shuttle's forward firing arc. While that maneuver would have carried him away from any torpedo the shuttle had launched, Corrin's missile had to make little more than a minor course correction before it hit. The torpedo cored through the interceptor's ball and exploded, spitting shrapnel out in all directions from an incandescent cloud. Knowing he was pushing his luck, Corrin rolled the X-Wing and dove after the first interceptor the Forbidden had scared off. Throttling back, he tightened a turn and came up inside the arc of the squint's loop. With a flick of his thumb, he snapped weapons control over to lasers. The squint began to juke and twist, but Corrin stayed with him. Whistler screeched a warning about the return of the other two interceptors, but Corrin ignored it. He triggered one burst of lasers and clipped one of the squint's wings, but it sailed on. Pushing more power to his engines, Corrin started to close with it, but the astromech whistled insistently to him. The pair of interceptors had closed to inside a kilometer and were firmly on his tail. Nine here. I could use some help. I'm on it, Nine. Ten on the way. Break to port on my mark. Ten? That's oral, but not his voice. What's going on? Mark. Left rudder then a snap roll onto the port stabilizers pulled him wide out of his previous flight path. He saw blue bolts shoot back toward the ships following him, and for a half second, Corin felt utterly disoriented. Blue beams meant ion cannon shots, but the planet had been behind him, not in front of him, and the ion cannons on the ground wouldn't be shooting at ties in any event. You're clear, Nine. Corn brought his ship around, and suddenly everything became clearer. Defender Wings, Y Wings, dove and climbed through the dogfight, blasting away at interceptors with wild abandon. What the slow ships lacked in grace, they made up for in sheer firepower. Their entry into the fight destroyed or disabled a half dozen interceptors. They're running. Psalm's voice came through the calm. No celebrations. With them clear, the ion cannons will open up again. Forbidden to control. I have all EV pilots. Forbidden, you are clear to hyperspace. Four ion blasts from the planet stabbed up and again struck the Mon Valle. The modified bulk cruiser began to break apart. Escape pods shot out from around the bridge and away into space, while the rest of the ship began to slowly drift back down toward Black Moon. I hope it hits the installation. Control to all fighters, you are clear to hyperspace. Control, does Eridane need cover for getting the escape pods? Negative, rogue leader. They're on our way out, and the interceptors are heading home. Thanks, Control. Wedge's voice seemed filled with weariness. Back to base for us, rogues. Got it, rogue leader. Corrin took one last look at Black Moon, then pointed his fighter toward the stars. Back to base for most of us, he means, Whistler. Two months of prep, and in ten minutes the squadron is cut in half. Someone made some very bad mistakes here, and our friends paid for them. Never again. 27. Corin stared out the window of the Noquivzor Base Recreation Center. Rolling hills and treeless plains stretched out for kilometers in all directions from the building. Gentle and warm breezes washed in waves over the golden grasses and tickled the back of his neck. If Arissi weren't over in the med center, floating in her family's finest stock. I'd take her on a long walk out there and just enjoy the countryside. As beautiful as it is, though, it's hard to think of enjoying anything right now. 
He forced himself to smile as a man in an infantry uniform set a mug of lum down on the table in front of him. Thanks, Lieutenant. The man nodded. Call me Page. Corin shoved the chair on the other side of the table out toward Page. What's the lum for? Drinking, usually. Page sat. Me and my people were on the Devonian. You and your wingman scattered the squints coming in our direction. We owe you. The pilot lifted the mug and drank a mouthful of the fiery ale and let it burn its way down his throat. I appreciate the drink, but you'll have to buy one for Ural when he comes out of his back to dip. Page nodded. Gladly. How badly was he hit? Lost half his right arm. The suit shut down around the wound so he didn't suffocate. But he got very cold. Corin put the frosted mug down and shivered. Bacta is for exposure. All the EV pilots are getting a dunking, though none of them are as bad off as Ural. The MDs don't know about prosthetics for him. They've never done GANs before and don't have appropriate limbs to use for replacements. Rogue Squadron got hit hard. Two pilots dead, three V, and one was flying wounded. I heard about him, the Shistavenin. Very tough individual. Corin nodded. Shia wasn't going to report for medical care, but Gavin forced him to go. Net result? We're at two-thirds strength. But only if we can find X-wings to replace the ones we lost. If not... We're below 50%. The infantry officer looked around the crowded above-ground pavilion, then leaned forward and lowered his voice. This mission was vape bait from before Crefe ordered the Y-Wings home. No kidding. The pilot glowered at the mug. About a second before the cannons took the motor and apart, I realized that just because the cannons hadn't shot didn't mean they couldn't shoot. That occurred to all of us, I think, except for General Crefe. He was blind to that possibility. Page shook his head. We all knew he wanted Black Moon so the Council would give him command of the Coruscant invasion. In three weeks, the planet's orbit takes it through an annual meteor shower. I wanted to use that as cover to bring my commandos in to do a ground recon of the base. We would have taken the ion cannons down. That makes sense. Why didn't he approve it? The world's only moon, the black moon that gave the system its code name, would be in our entry and exit vector. It would act as a natural interdictor cruiser, which could make things a lot more dangerous. Corin shrugged. The ion cannons made things dangerous enough, thanks. No kidding. Page smiled. We would have taken them down. And we would have found the base for those squint squadrons that came in late to the fight. The Bothans didn't even know they were there. The infantryman winced. And they should have. They're very good at worming their way into Imperial networks. So this time they failed. Korn hesitated as an idea occurred to him. Or records of those forces aren't part of the official garrison. Page frowned. What do you mean? Working with Corsac, I was involved in a sweep of the smuggler's headquarters. She was very sharp and had always distanced herself from glitter stim stores, so we couldn't pin anything on her. This one time, though, we found a couple of kilos of glitter stim in a warehouse she owned. She said she knew nothing about it and accused us of planting it. Turned out that she didn't know anything about it. The glitter stim had been skimmed from shipments by one of her aides and hidden there until he could find a way to move it himself. You're saying the Empire doesn't know those interceptors were there? A squadron is a rounding error for Imperial bookkeepers. Corin leaned forward, resting his elbows on the table. And the Bothans didn't know about whatever power source was used to boost the shields back up after we took them down. 
Whoever is in charge of wherever Black Moon is might be running some operation his Imperial Masters know nothing about. Page nodded slowly. The data on the covert operation is kept away from the Imperials, so the Bothans had no way of discovering it. Not without being on the ground. We had intel on the Viz light from the galaxy, but we got jumped by the IR and UV. Page wrapped his knuckles on the plasteel table. If we'd been given proper background on Black Moon, we might have been able to guess at the kind of information we really needed. I understand the need for operational security, but you can bet now the true location of Black Moon won't be declassified until we're all dead and gone. Page nodded. Still, the simulations of an assault are only as good as the databases from which they are constructed. Bad intel gets people killed. Korn ran a hand over his face. Well, now we have an inkling of what we don't know about Black Moon. At least two squint squadrons and a power generator are hidden there somewhere. Hidden from us and imp officials. The information in the official Imperial survey files is clearly useless. Right. And that means... The chirp of the comlink on the table cut off Korn's comment. He picked it up and opened the channel. Horn here. Emtray here, sir. Something wrong with Ural? No, sir. Is Irisi coming out of the Bacta? No, sir. Korn frowned. Then why did you call me? Sir, Whistler asked me to inform you he has completed the calculations of the wind currents you requested. Wind currents? On Black Moon, sir. He said he has found some very interesting things. We'll be there in a second. Horn out. Korn looked up at Page. It may be raising the shields after the base had been strafed, but I'm up for learning a little more about the world we just ran from. How about you? I had friends on the Motoran. I didn't like seeing them die. Good. Let's go. Corin shot him a smile. Maybe, just maybe, we can find a way to go back in and make the imps pay. Wedge wasn't certain he had heard General Psalm correctly. Did you just say it was just as well that we failed to take Black Moon? Psalm nodded slowly and pointed with a glass of pale blue Abrax cognac at the data pad on his desk. Intelligence reports that the Imperial Star Destroyer II Eviscerator left the Venjaga system on a course that would have put it in at Black Moon within six hours after we launched our operation. Its six squadrons of ties would have matched our fighters, and the Eviscerator would have pounded on the Emancipator. Chances are very good we would have lost our strike force and Black Moon. The Corellian's jaw dropped. The mission was a go with an imp star deuce within six hours of the target? How did that happen? I don't know. Iceheart has been shifting some resources around, and some admirals move them even further to avoid her control. It could be the eviscerator was moved at random. Wedge frowned. Or Iceheart anticipated where we were likely to strike. Or... Psalm looked at Wedge over the rim of his glass. Someone told Iceheart where we were going to be. Tycho was in the dark about our destination as the rest of us were, and he was out there without any lasers or torps pulling in EV pilots. Psalm held up his open hand. Easy, Commander. I wasn't accusing your XO. I don't trust him, but I know he was innocent this time. You checked the monitor logs on him? I checked the logs on everyone. There were more call-outs than I like, but nothing incriminating. Now, I didn't know where we were going before we pulled out, so I assume no one else did. But there are always leaks. The general set his cognac on the desk, then walked over to the small bar in the corner of his quarters. 
Would you like a drink, Commander Antilles? I'd prefer it if you'd call me Wedge. The smaller man seemed to consider that for a moment. Then he nodded. Very well, Wedge. A drink? How old is the Abrax? Psalm smiled. I don't know. My aide obtained it from the black market, so your guess is as good as mine. The bottle does have Old Republic tax holograms on it, though. Wedge shrugged. I'll chance it, then. Thanks. The general poured him a generous dollop of the aquamarine liquid. Please, be seated. The general's quarters were as sparsely furnished as his own, with munition cases and old ejection seats being about the best thing available to use as tables and chairs. Psalm's liquor cabinet had been built out of a plasteel helmet case with foam inserts to keep glasses and two bottles safe. Wedge appropriated one of the ejection seats and raised his glass of cognac. Thank you for coming to our rescue out there. Defender Wing pays its debts. Glasses clinked as they touched, and both men drank. The liquor's spicy vapors opened up all of Wedge's nasal passages. He let the liquid pool on his tongue for a moment more, then swallowed it. A warmth started in his belly and pulsed out to ease some of the fatigue in his limbs. The general hunched forward, cupping his glass in both hands. I want to ask you what you intend to put in your report about what I did out there. Wedge made no effort to cover his surprise. You saved my unit. I thought I might recommend review for the Corellian Cross. Since I'm not your commanding officer, I can't put you in for it, but... Psalm shook his head. That's not what I'm talking about. What, then? The man's brow furrowed. I disobeyed a direct order to lead the system. Wedge blinked in confusion. If you had returned to the Mon Vale, your entire wing would have been killed. We know that now, but we did not know that at the time the order was given. Psalm swirled the cognac around in his glass. General Crefe and I had often been at odds with each other. You may have gathered that from the briefing. I felt, when he ordered me out, that he wanted to rob me of any credit for the operation. I started us on an outbound vector, but came in close to the Emancipator so I could claim its mass prevented us from making the jump to light speed. I didn't want to leave, and closing with the Star Destroyer made for a convenient excuse. But data feeds from the onboard computers will reveal the truth. And so you were in position so the Emancipator could screen you from ground sensors and the incoming squints. Wedge shrugged. If I'd been given that order and thought of that trick to let me stick around, that's what I would have done. I know. Psalm stood and began to pace. That's the problem, Commander Antilles. What I did is exactly what you would have done. It worked. It doesn't matter that it worked. I'm not you. My people are not your people. Psalm's face became a mask of frustration. The only thing that keeps my people alive out there is rigid adherence to discipline, and this discipline is instilled through consciously constructed drills that build them into a unit. My people lack the native talent in your squadron, but we make up for it because we cover for one another and watch out for each other. As you watched out for my people. Yes, I did that, but only by disobeying an order from a superior officer. And you have to write it up that way. Wedge shook his head. I don't want to see you taking slugs for something that wasn't wrong. But that's not up to you, Wedge. You can excuse something one of your pilots does, but only Akbar and the High Command can forgive me for this mutiny. Psalm tossed off the last of his cognac. So, don't give the Admiral a single bite report. Tell him what happened. What? And pretend I understand it? Wedge sat back in the padded chair. 
Interceptors came out of nowhere, and the base suddenly developed more power than even the worst case allowed. If the Eviscerator had shown up and dumped two wings worth of fighters into the battle, we would have lost all our ships. With the Star Destroyer two in the area, of course, Black Moon won't fall. You're probably right, though the presence of an Imp Star Deuce is not insurmountable. Salm splashed some more cognac into his glass. Stripped of their fighters, they are vulnerable to TRD. Wedge waved away a refill and smiled. TRD was Alliance slang for trench run disease, or the tactics that had destroyed the first Death Star. The Empire had developed Lancer class frigates to prevent TRD from claiming any capital ships. While attacks by snub fighters had proved relatively insignificant in hurting star destroyers, TRD was something Imperial officers feared and took great pains to avoid. Fine, I'll head out with my half dozen pilots and we'll vape the eviscerator's ties so you can waltz in and give it a dose of TRD. It would be my pleasure, Commander, but High Command is going to want a lot of questions asked and answered about Black Moon before more operations are conducted in that sector of space. A tone sounded at the door, but before Psalm could say anything, the door retracted and Corrin Horn rushed in, followed closely by an infantry lieutenant. Commander, you wouldn't believe. The enthused smile on Corrin's face died as he saw Psalm. Both men snapped to attention, begging the general's pardon. At ease, Lieutenant Page, Lieutenant Horn. Psalm clasped his own hands behind his back. What's the meaning of this? Corrin's gaze darted back and forth from Wedge to Psalm. Emtray just said Commander Antilles was here, sir. He didn't mention these were your quarters, sir. Psalm looked at Wedge. Your officers barge into your quarters uninvited? Not so far. Perhaps, General Psalm, I need to institute some of the discipline you were speaking about earlier. Wedge stood and gave Corrin a hard stare. News of our compatriots in the medical unit? No, sir. Wedge could see Corrin was fit to burst. This had better be good, Mr. Horn. Yes, sir. Corrin looked at Psalm. With the general's permission. Psalm nodded. Proceed. Corrin's smile blossomed again. If we want Black Moon, we've got it. What? The junior officer nodded. Whistler, my astromech, collected a lot of data while we were out there and has been running it through the programs he used to analyze smugglers' bases so Corsac knew where to hit them. Psalm's face hardened. This is an Imperial base, not some bandit's hideout. Page shook his head. Begging your pardon, sir, but the droid found a lot of parallels to smugglers' bases, and that gives us some new options. Whistler also pinpointed Black Moon from a star chart and is pulling up more data than we were given in our briefings. It can fall. Wedge shook his head. Good work, gentlemen. But there's an Imperial Star Destroyer Mark II we have to figure into the scenario. That changes everything. Psalm held a hand up. Perhaps not, Commander. No? Not entirely. Psalm folded his arms. Who knows about this information you have? Horn thought for a second, then answered, As nearly as I know, just Page, my R2, the units 3PO, and me. I want you to confirm that. You two are hereby sworn to secrecy. If any word about this gets out, I'll have you flying solo missions against Sea Rook strongholds. Got it? Yes, sir. Wedge smiled. Being a bit lenient there, aren't you, sir? Perhaps I am, but I think they know I'm serious. Psalm smiled confidently. Now, let's see what you have, gentlemen. Black Moon was picked as our best, closest step to Coruscant yet. No reason we should abandon our quest if we don't have to. 28. 
Curtin Lure raised a hand to ward off the dust storm raised by the shuttle's landing jets. The Safarium settled down easily, its landing lights strobing brightly in the Borlaisian evening. The hum of the engines filled the air, drowning out the sound of the gangway being lowered from the belly of the ship. The intelligence agent smiled at General Derricote as the base's commander crested the stairs to the landing platform. Come to see me off? I'm honored. Derricote returned the smile. Your visit was not as onerous as you might imagine, Agent Lure. The older man held a bottle out to him. A memento of your visit. Curtin took it. Corellian whiskey. Wyron's reserve, no less. He looked closely at the cap and the holographic tax seal. It looks genuine. Is it? Or have you prepared this so I can poison myself and eliminate a problem for you? Derricote opened his hands. If you want to open it and lum guzzle, I'll join you. It is genuine and quite costly, but I have connections that make it possible for me to obtain it. It's not poisoned because it is given by way of thanking you. Had you not come here, the rebels might have taken me by surprise. I think the result would have been much the same as it actually turned out to be, but one can never know. Your use of influence to transfer a squadron of Thai starfighters from the Eviscerator until my fighters can be replaced was also appreciated. The General's openness surprised Curtin. You do not feel my being ordered back to Imperial Center is a threat to your operation here? Derricote shrugged. I am too much a realist to imagine I could keep this operation secret forever. I trust you will use your knowledge of it to your own gain, which means I will not be sacrificed casually. This operation, of course, has uses. I would think that Isan Isard would think it more valuable than any object lesson she could provide others by destroying it and me. The man's eyes hardened. Besides, if I saw you as a threat, you would have died during the rebel attack. Truly spoken. Curtin nodded slowly. I accept your gift in the spirit in which it is given. But I will have it tested before I drink. I hope also you will view this invitation in the spirit in which it is given. Derricote spread his arms wide to encompass the planet. The Empire is dead. What will rise to replace it, I don't know. But the core will be heating up and Imperial Center is going to be roasted alive. Rebels, warlords, either could do the job. Old Borlaeus here. It's been through its time of fire. I'll be here when Imperial Center isn't. If you need a haven when things break apart, remember that I'm here. Curtin brought his head up. Thank you, General. I shall remember you. I hope I won't have to avail myself of your invitation, but if I do, I know where to find you. Have a good trip to Imperial Center, Agent Lure. Curtin raised the bottle in a salute. Until we meet again. Wedge felt a giddy anticipation in his belly, the like of which he'd not known since Endor. He glanced over at General Psalm. The man sat on the other side of the briefing table with his eyes closed, nodding to himself as he rehearsed what he would say to Admiral Akbar. The plan they'd concocted over the last week could work, but it was risky and highly time-dependent. The door to the briefing room opened and Akbar entered the room. He nodded to both men, then settled down in the chair at the head of the oval table. What have you woven together? Psalm smiled and punched keys on his data pad. The small device fed information to the holographic projection disk in the center of the table, and a star field began to sparkle and slowly spin above it. We have found a way to take Black Moon. The Mon Calamari sat back. I do not recall your having been told which world Black Moon was. Wedge shook his head. We weren't. As per orders, coordinates were downloaded to and erased from all our astromechs and navigational computers before and after the operation. Unfortunately for operational security, 
One of my units, Astromex, has a special criminal investigation and forensics circuitry package. It gathers evidence and, in this case, included a star chart of the area in it. Akbar's barbels quivered. Something will have to be done to correct that situation. Agreed, Admiral. But this droid in Commander Antilles's squadron has provided us with invaluable information that points out why we lost the fight and how we can take Borlaeus. And more, sir. Wedge pointed at the starfield. Computer, isolate the triad. The starfield grew and stars bled out of the edges of the image. In the center, three stars intensified in radiance and faint green lines stretched out to link them. A small arrow pointed down and away from the lowest point of the triangle, indicating the direction of the core and coruscant. These three systems are, in descending order, Mirit, Venjaga, and Piria. The center one, Venjaga, is home to the Eviscerator. It is using Jaga II as a base, and is there to protect the concussion missile production facilities. While the output is considered small by Imperial standards, the fact that the world is actually producing missiles makes it worth protecting. Psalm indicated the uppermost system, the one on a virtual straight line with Borlaeus. The Mirit system is home to Ord Mirit. The Empire abandoned that base shortly after Endor and shifted the garrison all the way over to Corellia to help hold the shipyards there. Ord Mirit is really too far from anything substantial for us to use it as a base, as we have done with Ord Pardron. Still, it is part of the sector the Eviscerator is tasked to defend. Finally, we have Borlaeus. Psalm hit a button on his data pad, and the starfield dissolved into the image of the planet. When we were there before, we discovered the estimates of power generation for the planet were low by at least half, and two squadrons of fighters, interceptors no less, showed up without warning. All of the data we had about the planet had been stolen from Imperial files by both slicers. Unfortunately for us, that information was incomplete. Wedge nodded. We went back and pulled old data files on Borlaeus, and they provided the answers to questions that were never asked before the first operation. Back before the Empire existed, Alderaan Biotics set up a research facility on the far side of the planet. It included a geothermal generation station and a local spaceport. Because everything was located in the northern part of the planet, the facilities were built underground to avoid complications from the harsh winters. A series of scan surveys of the planet would be required to locate the sites from space. What Commander Antilles says is true, sir, and the effort to locate these bases from space would have revealed our interest in the planet to the Empire. The Mon Calamari acknowledged Psalm's comment with a nod. Why was there no information about this place in the Imperial Files, General? The facility was shut down years ago. We suspect that the current base commander, Evir Derakote, refurbished it and has it operating to produce goods, foodstuffs mostly, that are sold to the refugee Alderaan population via the black market. At the very least, his Imperial superiors would see this as giving aid and comfort to the enemy, so hiding knowledge of it from them makes sense. So you suspect this facility and its generator was the source of the power used to reinforce the base's shields? Yes, sir. Wedge pointed to a faint red line linking the military base and the biotics facility. A tunnel that runs about one and a quarter kilometers beneath the surface of the planet links the two facilities. There is a rift valley where a Farrah Creek conduit links the tunnel one side to the other. This is the weak link. The generator is too deep to blow with proton torpedoes, and destroying it makes no sense if we intend to take the planet. Akbar nodded, then tapped his lower lip with a flipper-like hand. 
If you sever the connection with the military base, you bring us back to the original both and estimates of the defenses. If we bring our ships back in, we should be able to bring the shields down as we did before. We could take the base, but then the eviscerator would come and destroy it. Salm shook his head. Not if the eviscerator arrives too late. Our plan is this. We stage a feint at Jaga too. The Emancipator and the Liberator arrive in system, just at the outer edge of the gravity well created by the seventh planet, a gas giant. They deploy my defender wing and another wing of fighters, matching the Eviscerator's complement of ties. The Eviscerator will deploy its fighters and move out behind their screen to engage our ships. Even at full speed, it will require two hours for our ships to engage each other. Our snubs won't be traveling at full speed, and our star destroyers will be pulling back. It will appear to the Eviscerator that we're running from it, or, at the very least, are reluctant to engage it. When the Eviscerator moves into position within the system to engage us, our ships will go to light speed. The Star Destroyers will head for the Ord Mirit, while the fighters will head for Borlaeus. The Eviscerator will be unable to follow our destroyers immediately because of its position in the system and the presence of planets that act as natural interdictor cruisers. Akbar's eyes half shut. Then the Eviscerator goes to Borlaeus. Without her fighters? Salm shook his head. The Ties cannot enter hyperspace by themselves the way our fighters can. They will have to be recovered, and that will take time. Borlaeus can take care of itself, and the feint at the Vanjaga system will be obviously intended to keep the Eviscerator away from Ord Mirit. The Admiral gave Psalm a wall-eyed stare. Why would the captain of the Eviscerator believe there was anything of value at Ord Mirit? Wedge smiled. We were thinking that there are some Bothan slicers who seriously want to redeem themselves. We want them to plant information in the Imperial networks that suggest a newly discovered, previously secret facility on Ord Mirit may possess the key to finding the Katana fleet. He felt a shiver run down his spine as he saw the effect of his words on Akbar. The Katana fleet had once been real enough, but back before even the Clone Wars it had passed into legend. Over a hundred ships that were slave-circuited together. The fleet had jumped into hyperspace and had never been seen again. With the Empire crumbling, possession of that fleet would make its owner the power in the galaxy. If the Alliance found it, the New Republic would become invincible. If an Imperial officer found it, a new Emperor would be born. No sane officer could truly believe the Katana fleet could be found. Akbar's mouth gaped open in a grin. But no sane officer could refuse to take the chance that it could be found. The Eviscerator would have to go to Ord Mirit, and Ord Mirit is, what, twelve hours at flank speed to Borlaeus? Add the four from Ben Jaga to Ord Mirit, and we have sixteen hours at the very least to take Borlaeus. Wedge nodded solemnly. The beginning of the raid on Borlaeus will be very simple. Rogue Squadron goes in and blows the conduit. Going in and coming out, we expect to attract a lot of attention, because while we're fighting, Lieutenant Page and his commandos, as well as a number of similar units, are going to use the conduit to get into the Borlaeus base and disable it. They'll also hit the Biotic Station's spaceport. If we do it right, the TIE pilots sent up to engage us won't know there's been a change in ownership until they come home. Once the commandos are down and in, my people head out home. The arrival of my defender wing and the other fighters from Ben Jaga will provide the Borlaeus base with enough of a distraction that Page's people can take things down in short order, without having to damage anything we'll need to use to defend the base. Akbar's barbels twitched. Security will need to be very tight for this return to Black Moon. Yes, sir. 
but we have some advantages here. Derricote won't think we'll be coming back because the moon is in position to block our escape route. We are preparing a simulator package that hides the identity of our target. The run across the lunar surface will be disguised as a run through an asteroid belt, leading our people to believe we're moving against a ringed planet. Wedge smiled. This time our pilots will not know where they're going, but they won't be in the dark about what they will face when they get there. The Mon Calamari nodded. You will have to hide your location from your XO. I know. So does he. He's not part of the operation, so he accepts not knowing. The Mon Calamari stood slowly. I think this plan is a good one, and can be made better. I do have one concern, however. It concerns your rogue squadron, Commander Antilles, and the commandos. Sir? If the operations are launched simultaneously, and I must assume they will be so, an alarm raised by the eviscerator will not put Borlaeus in a heightened state of alert in time to disrupt your effort. There will be at least four hours before we have more forces arriving at Borlaeus. Flight suit life support lasts for three hours. Anyone left behind will die. I know that, sir. Do your people know that? Wedge shook his head. They will before they go. I've got six operational ships. This will be a volunteer mission. And a very bold one. Admiral Akbar nodded solemnly. Let us go over it again and guarantee the gain will be worth the likely cost. Right now, I believe I could sell it to the Provisional Council, but some modifications will make this a certainty. And if things go well, the way to Coruscant will finally lie open to us. 29. Corin half hid his face behind his left hand, daring only to stare at the floating hologram of the mythical world of Fenaru Prime with his left eye. Aside from the addition of an asteroid ring, an ocean where the southern continent was, and some adjustments to the coastlines, it looked exactly like Borlaeus. The computer-projected world slowly spun above the cylinder in the well of the pilot's briefing room. It looked calm and almost peaceful, especially without the air current overlays Whistler used to project onto it. As peaceful as it looks, it's not where I want to die. Wedge continued his briefing. Our objective is a ferrocrete pipe, roughly four meters in diameter and 40 meters long. It's reinforced and has suspension cables helping to support the weight. A single proton torpedo should be able to destroy it, but we're not sure how well it's going to show up on the targeting computers. If we get a lock, it's likely to be at point-blank range. Nawara Venn stroked the tip of one of his brain tails. Run up this rift valley and hit something the third of the size of an X-Wing without the benefit of a targeting computer? That's impossible. Gavin shook his head. That's nothing. Back home in Beggar's Canyon. The youth's voice trailed off as Wedge raised an eyebrow in his direction. I don't think any pilot from Tatooine ever found a mission tough especially when it involves racing through a canyon. Well, the target's not really that small, sir. Corn laughed. It is the size of a reclining hut, give or take a couple of meters. The conduit can probably move faster, too. Even Wedge laughed at the comment. But Corn knew it wasn't because of the weak humor in his statement. Everyone in the room... The nine surviving pilots from Rogue Squadron and Tycho Selchu knew the mission being presented to them was difficult. Their laughter came from the nervous tension of staring death in the face and knowing death was likely to win this one. The real sticking point on this mission, people, is time over target. We'll be coming in and using a meteor shower as cover for our insertion to the atmosphere. This means we'll have to maneuver through the asteroids to get into Fenaru and get out again. 
We also have a long run up to light speed so we can make the jump out of the gravity well. All this means we've got a half hour over the target. If we burn too much time and fuel fighting, we don't get out. Broar J scratched up the pale stubble on his chin. That's cutting it rather fine, isn't it? The valley run should take a third of that. If only six of us are going in, that's one pass per flight element. He's right, Commander, Risati frowned. Can't we get auxiliary fuel pods for our T-65s? Wedge glanced over to where M-Tray stood. Last check of our inventory didn't show we had any, and a check of the Alliance requisition system shows a backlog of requests. That's what you said, wasn't it, M-Tray? Yes, sir. The droid raised a hand and tilted his head to the side. However, sir, we now have some. What? Wedge frowned. I thought you characterized requisitioning them as an exercise in futility. I did, sir. The droid shrugged in a most unmechanical manner by bobbing his head up and down on his neck. I saw we needed them, so I scrounged them. Scrounge? They cost a couple suits of the stormtrooper armor we had left over from Talisi. The cold weather gear we are not using here on Noquivzor, and some spare parts for which we have little use. The squadron's commander stared at the droid for a moment. How many did you get? A half dozen. Wedge shook his head. All that only got you six auxiliary fuel pods? Sir, when scrounging merchandise, you can get it fast, in good condition, or cheap. Pick two. The droid's clamshell head righted itself again. They're here, and Zrai is ready to fit them on ships. He's fitting them with a quick release, so you can jettison them when they're empty. It'll kill the drag when you're fighting the squints. These pods give you half again the time over target. Forty-five minutes sounded like forever. And in some ways, it was. In atmosphere, the engines gobbled a lot more fuel than they did in space because of the friction and drag. X-Wings were a better fighter in atmosphere than Ties, but the two squadrons on the ground outnumbered the rogues four to one. Long odds and we ran through the last of our luck on the previous visit to Black Moon. Risati raised a hand. Any defenses in the Rift Valley? Wedge shook his head. None that we know of, but it's possible there are some. Whoever goes in first has got to be careful. First run probably won't nail the prize. I can believe that. Korn scratched at the back of his neck. Are Page's folks coming down while we make our runs? If they were a lieutenant, the answer to that question would be classified. Wedge hesitated for a moment, then nodded. It's a logical assumption to make, though. Regardless, any of us who gets left behind will be in severe straits. Out of fuel and out of luck, long before the assault for which we're doing the prep work will hit. Broad Jace slowly nodded. This is a suicide mission. No. I want it to be anything but a suicide mission. The facts do point to this being very dangerous. Wedge folded his hands together. We've got six ships and eight pilots. I'm sorry, Ural, but without a proper prosthetic fit, I can't consider you healthy enough for this mission. Korn's wingmate sagged a bit in his seat. The MD droids had fitted him with an odd device that capped his stub with what looked and smelled like a boiling pot of Bacta. Below it, a rudimentary prosthetic arm ended in a pair of pincers that snapped open and closed. Craig offers apologies for Craig's failure. Your feelings are understood, Ural. Wedge folded his arms across his chest. Three of you are fit to fly but you don't have a ship. We do have Lou Jane's X-Wing ready to go. If all of you volunteer for this mission, I'll choose one of you at random to fly that ship. If anyone else opts out, you're up. Do you all want to go? All three of the pilots nodded. M-Tray, 
Randomize a choice here. The droid hummed for a moment. Nawara Ben. Sheil growled and Arisi shrugged in Risati's direction. Wedge smiled. Welcome aboard, Mr. Ven. You'll fly with Mr. Jace, assuming he volunteers. The Thyferan shot a quick glance at Arisi, then nodded. It shall be my pleasure to bring glory to the Thyferan people as their representative on this mission. Mr. Darklighter, this isn't Beggar's Canyon. I know, sir. It's bigger, and this won't be for fun. Gavin smiled slowly. I'm in. Wedge looked over at Risati. And you, Ms. Enir? Someone has to break up the boys' club. Wedge turned to Corin. Need I ask? You want to know if I'm willing to fly to an enemy-held planet where I'm to race through some eroded ditch and pop a sewer pipe with a proton torpedo while interceptors are swarming around and do all this with no hope of rescue if I slip up? Wedge's reply came cold and calm. That's what I want to know. Corn's mouth soured and his stomach tightened. Despite Gavin's protest, Nawara Ven had been correct. The mission was impossible. Performing any one of the feats mentioned might have been possible, but doing them all would push every pilot to his or her limit. Failure by some was inevitable. Only who and how many were in question. They all knew that. They knew it as well as he did, yet each one of them had volunteered without a second thought. The mission needed doing, and they were going to do it. It wasn't a question of survival, but a question of how best to make certain the mission succeeded. Each of them decided they were up to the task, and now it was up to him to come to the same conclusion. Overwhelming odds. Tough target, scant chance of survival. Business as usual for Rogue Squadron. Corin nodded. I'll go on one condition. Go or stay, Mr. Horn. No special deals. Then think of this as a tactical consideration. Corn sat forward and rested his elbows on his knees. I'm first into the valley. Wedge shook his head. That position's already filled. You need a wingman, Commander. Corin jerked a thumb at the other pilots. They've had practice using someone else's telemetry to make a run. I haven't. We'll make the first run together. Wedge looked away for a moment, then back at Corin. Glad to have you with us, Mr. Horn. Sheil, Ms. Delaret, you'll work with Captain Selchu and provide opposition for us while we do the simulator runs on the operation. You'll have to do your best to kill us before we go. If you can't, maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to come back and thank you for your hard work. 30. Corn leaned against the body of the simulator and gave Wedge a weak smile. We got it that time, boss, but only just barely. That last cut is very sharp. Banking is the only way to make it, but leveling out for the torpedo shot is tough. The junior officer nodded. The one time he had tried to make the last turn to the target by applying rudder and skidding around the turn, his X-wing slammed into a canyon wall. Making that turn and escaping a crash required very fine manipulation of the throttle. He could do that. But by the time he had negotiated the turn and recovered, he was past his target. I like the idea of popping up over the last turn and gliding on down in, but that might attract some of the ties the Bacta boy is lighting up. I agree that going up and out of the valley to avoid that last turn is probably the most simple way of handling the problem, but we go in first to provide the data for others to make their runs. Mr. Jace and Mr. Venn will decide if they want to hop past the last turn or go through the valley. Broar Jace came out from around the corner of Corn's simulator with his wingman. Valley, I think, unless our fuel estimates are lower than expected because of dogfighting. 
Corin winked at him. Don't worry. We'll keep them off you while you squirm your way into the tunnel. I'll do the job. The Twi'lek laid a hand on Broar's shoulder. We'll do the job. Wedge smiled. Only because our near misses will weaken the structure for you. Of course, Commander. Broar looked at Corin. Even clean misses must ionize the air and do some harm. The Corellian lieutenant levered himself away from the simulator. Last I looked, I've hit more targets than you. Gavin and Risati joined the group. If not for me not holding my end up, Corin would be winning your contest, Broar. The Thyferon waved that comment away. Corin has one more kill than I do. If this simulation is at all accurate, I will eclipse his mark by three kills. So it's just you and me, head to head? Broar looked down at Corin. Just you and me, head to head. As it has always been. Wedge stepped between them. At ease, gentlemen. Let me remind you of two things. First, Gavin's got the best record for hitting the tunnel, which means the second flight didn't do so well. Second, that tunnel is our target, not all the eyeballs and squints flying around. He rested a hand on each man's shoulder. I've not discouraged this contest because there's no way to stop you from keeping score. It's given you a competitive edge, which is good. Neither of you has allowed the other to become complacent or bored. A bored pilot gets overconfident, careless, and, rather quickly, dead. And in spite of planning and promoting this difficult mission, I don't want to see any of us die. Wedge took a step back and folded his arms. For the barest of moments, he looked far older than his twenty-seven years. Corin saw the weariness as death's fingerprints. Death's never gotten Wedge, but it's been close enough to leave marks on him. There's undoubtedly a nightmare for every pilot Rogue Squadron has lost, and I bet he runs through them far more regularly than he'd like. The squadron commander forced a smile onto his face. Back when I first welcomed you to this squadron, I told you that most pilots die during their first five missions. We were very lucky in our first three, but it all caught up with us on the run at Black Moon. Looking at the numbers, there is no reason to assume it will go any better for us this time. Corin nodded and fought the shiver coursing up his spine. In the first run, they had eleven ships to take against Black Moon's fighters. They engaged two squadrons then, and would likely face that much opposition this time. While the best pilots in Rogue Squadron were going in on the mission, fuel considerations limited their ability to perform. I want you people to know I've flown with the best the Alliance has to offer. Luke, Biggs, Porkins, Jansen, Tycho, all of them. I don't feel their lack here. This isn't a Death Star we're going after and this mission doesn't have that sense of urgency. That's because back then, we were fighting for the very survival of the Rebellion. The fact is, though, this mission is just as important as either of the Death Star runs. Wedge glanced down at his hands, then back up. This time, we're fighting for the future of the Rebellion, and all the people who want freedom from the Empire. That's a lot less immediate than what we fought for in the old days, but in many ways, it's far more noble a goal. Corin smiled in spite of himself. The nagging sense of doubt and doom that had been grinding away at his consciousness didn't go away, but it became muted. Wedge's words muffled it. Fear and insecurity were issues about himself, but their mission was about others. He was going off to make the future a bit brighter for people like Ayala Wasiri and her husband, and Gus Bastra and his family, and even folks like Booster Tarek. The realization that this blow struck at the Empire 
would make life easier for the sorts of criminals he and his father and grandfather used to hunt didn't tarnish the mission. He'd never believed the virtuous bandit myth most criminals like to wrap around themselves. Raiding the affluent to give to the destitute was a pattern often claimed, but he'd seen no evidence of it. Still, he couldn't deny the contribution of folks like Han Solo or Mirax Tarek to the rebellion. And how could one compare the minor evil of a hut with the grand evil of a government that would conceive of, build, and utilize weapons that could destroy planets? If we cap the wellspring of evil, cleaning up all the little puddles it leaves behind will be that much easier. Wedge looked at all of the pilots. This mission isn't going to be easy, but I know we can do it. Corin nodded to him. If it was easy, it wouldn't be a rogue squadron mission. And if it wasn't given to rogue squadron, Broar added, it would have no chance of being accomplished. If Ego could power shields, you'd be invincible. Wedge shook his head. You've got twelve hours to kill before you hit the line. No drinking, and definitely get some sleep. You can't use the holonet for obvious security reasons, but if you want to record some messages for friends and family and leave them with M. Trey, he'll see to their disposition in the worst case. Get going. I'll see you at 0800 on the line. We'll be there, Commander. Corin tossed him a quick salute. Nervous as Sith spawn in the glow of a Jedi's lightsaber, but ready for whatever the Empire throws at us. Wedge watched his pilots walk away and saw both Sheel and Erisi catch up with them. He turned and smiled at Tycho. Nice flying in the sim. You wouldn't have bagged me if that belly pod hadn't slowed my climb. The Alderanian pilot shrugged. Fifth time's the charm. Wedge pointed toward the retreating knot of pilots. Do they ever seem like kids to you? Kids who shouldn't be in this at all? Gavin, yes. And Oral, because of the insular life he's led. The rest of them only surrender a year or two to us. I know that. But it seems like the Emperor's death was the end of an era. They've all joined after the New Republic was established. Before that, we were outlaws, fighting the legitimate government. Now we're a movement that is bringing freedom to countless worlds. Wedge shook his head. Sometimes I think they've joined us because of the romance of the rebellions having struck a blow against the Empire. We brought down Darth Vader, killed the Emperor, and destroyed the Death Stars. Tycho brushed a lock of brown hair from his forehead. I hope you're not heading toward the idea that they don't really know what they're getting into. I seem to recall hearing that same speculation about the new pilots in the squadron before Endor. Back then, you saw the destruction of the first Death Star as what marked the end of an epic. Wedge had memories flood back. Yeah, I guess I did think about that then, didn't I? The situation was different, though. No, it wasn't. Look, Wedge, none of us have been through all you have. I joined up after Yavin. So I've been here for a long time. But for me, Biggs and Porkins and the others are just legends. For you, they're memories. Friends you've lost. Tycho threw an arm across Wedge's shoulders. These guys have lost friends, too. There's not a one of them that doesn't know the odds of surviving this run are about. Wedge held up a hand. Don't give me odds. You know Corellians have no tolerance for odds. Which is why you so willingly play Sabak. And why so many of us are part of the rebellion. The two of them laughed aloud, and Wedge felt a lot of his tension bleeding away. As he wiped tears from his eyes, he saw an Alliance security lieutenant come walking over. Yes, lieutenant? Forgive the intrusion, sir, but I just wanted to remind Captain Selchu 
This area is restricted when he's not actually involved in an exercise. That's all right, Lieutenant. He's with me. Yes, sir. She glanced anxiously back toward the doorway. I'll wait out there. I'll be along presently, Lieutenant, Wedge frowned. I'll take responsibility for Captain Selchu, Lieutenant. You're dismissed. Sir, my orders come from General Salm. I know. Log your protest with him. Yes, sir. Wedge looked over and saw a frown on Tycho's face. What's the matter? He glanced at the security officer's retreating form, then back at his friend. Have you become involved with her? Did I break something up here? Tycho shook his head. No, nothing like that. She's very nice, and lived on Alderaan for several years, so we can talk about places we'll never see again. And she works with two enlisted men, one of whom watches me all the time. I do find her intriguing, but I'm not of a mind to begin a new relationship without knowing if the old one is over or not. I can understand that. Wedge recalled the woman Tycho had fallen for a couple of years earlier. She worked in Alliance Procurement and Supply, and spent most of her time on covert missions directing operations on enemy worlds designed to liberate materiels from the Empire. Because of the importance and sensitivity of her work, learning anything about her from intelligence was impossible, and Tycho's status raised that difficulty level by an order of magnitude. Tycho poked a finger against Wedge's breastbone. I think you're changing the subject on me to avoid the real issue that prompted your earlier question. Wedge raised an eyebrow. Oh, and that is? You're afraid you're getting too old for what we've always told ourselves is a young man's game. If you think that, you're as confused as a Gamorian placed between two full mugs of lum. The Corellian frowned. First off, you're a year older than I am. Nine months, which is rather close to a year, my friend. True enough, but years aren't the only measure of time. Tycho tapped the rank insignia at the collar of Wedge's flight suit. You're a commander. Luke was a general before he abandoned his rank. Han Solo and Lando Calrissian are generals. Most of the officers who have been with the Alliance for as long as you have are at least colonels. You're only a captain, Tycho. And there I will stay, if Psalm has anything to say about it. Well, I've had my say about my rank, and I'm happy where I am. I like leading a squadron. I know that. The Alderanian shrugged and folded his arms. You can't help but wonder, though, if refusing those promotions was the right decision to make or not. True. Wedge looked up at his friend. So, am I too old to be doing this? Wedge, over the last four months I've flown against and shot down every one of the kids you have going on this mission. So have you. Tycho let a low chuckle rumble from his throat. If you're too old for this, the New Republic might as well give up now. Barring a squadron of Jedi Knights winging their way in here, you're the best we've got. That may not impress you, but there are plenty of imp pilots out there who don't sleep the whole night through because of dreams about you being on their tails. 31. Corin smiled as Erisi caught up with the group. You did well in the sim, Erisi. It felt strange trying to shoot you down. Emphasis on trying. Broar flashed a predatory grin at her. You had no more success than they will tomorrow. Noir Aven glowered at his wingman. If you have found a way to shunt ego into your shields, I wish you would share it with me. Risadi shook her head. Just have him expand his shields to cover us all. There's ego enough there. Broar turned to Corin. The mewing of our inferiors grows tiresome, don't you think? The Corellian's mouth hung open for a second. 
He wasn't certain if he was more surprised with Broer's put-down of the others or his own elevation into Broer's peer group. I wouldn't call it mewing, and I don't see them as our inferiors. Everyone here has worked hard and come through a lot. Gavin and I have both been wounded, as has Sheil, and only you and Risadi have avoided personal or ship damage. We might have a few more kills than they do, but things will average out over time. The Thyferon looked thoughtful for a moment, then nodded. That is something to consider, certainly. And I did not mean my comment as a slight against any of you, though clearly it was taken as such. I respect you all and believe you all capable of more. I will be honored to fly with you tomorrow. On that note... Nawara then bowed his head to his companions, allowing his brain tails to hang down over his shoulders. I shall see you all in the morning. Wait a moment. Risadi held her hand out to him. I'll head off too. Get some sleep. We'll need it. Gavin smiled, then stretched and yawned. I want to record my message for my parents. Biggs never got the chance, and that kind of ate it, Uncle Huff. Corin winked at the kid. You'll make them proud, Gavin. Broar bowed slightly. I, too, shall record a message for my parents. They all departed, leaving Corn alone with Erisi. Well, well indeed, Corn. She reached out and took his left hand in hers. I wish I were going with you tomorrow. We'd be thankful for the help. Corn allowed her to gently pull him along toward the accommodations she shared with Risati. Given how things are working out, you may be lucky that you're not going. Don't say that. Her voice dropped to near a whisper, and a tear formed in the corner of her right eye. Worse than dying on this mission will be surviving it here. If the mission fails, if you don't come back, I'll be left wondering if I could have made a difference. Dying out there might be less emotionally trying but I don't think it's the lesser of two evils here. She brushed the tear away. You're correct, of course, and I'm being selfish. Arissi stopped and turned to face him. Doesn't it bother you that you don't even know the name of the world where you could die? Actually, I do know the name of the world. Wedge and I are the only ones. Though I don't think that makes this mission any easier. To be honest, Erisi, I hadn't given it that much thought. The imps there want me dead, and I don't feel too friendly toward them either. Where we end up fighting isn't all that important to me. It's important to me. She began walking again. Her hand moved up to the inside of his elbow and guided him forward. If things go badly, I thought I would visit or make sure a memorial was raised. I... Arissi's voice broke, and Corin felt a shudder run through her. Hey, Arissi, it's all going to be fine. Remember when the commander warned us that we'd never be able to be greater heroes than the folks who have already died in service to Rogue Squadron? Yes, she sniffed. Well, he was wrong. We can be bigger, but only by living longer and doing better than they ever did. As he was saying just now, in those days they fought for survival. We're fighting for the future. If we do this right, Biggs and the rest won't be remembered as Rogue Squadron's greatest heroes, but the predecessors to Rogue Squadron's greatest heroes. Corin gave her a strong smile. I'm planning on sticking around to make that prediction come true. Arissi smiled but the corners of her mouth trembled. You probably will do that, Corn. I hope it is so. I just wish I knew where the rest of you were going. You aren't the least bit curious? Maybe for my memoirs, sure. Corn reached up and wiped tears from her cheeks. They'll declassify the operation in fifty years or so, just in time for me to include the location in my autobiography. Even if I had to wait fifty years... I'd have a memorial built for you. Arissi paused before the open door to her quarters. Corin, 
You know Risati isn't going to be coming back here this evening. You can stay here if you wish. I shouldn't, Erisi. Are you certain? The disappointment in her voice twisted into forced levity. Think of it as a chapter for your memoirs. I have no doubt it would take two chapters. Corn sighed heavily. I'm afraid I'd get no sleep. That would kill me. I'd die happy, but I'm afraid our compatriots would not. Arissi nodded slowly and looked down. I understand. I've got to be insane. I've said no to one of the most desirable women I've ever met. Corin smiled. Of course I'm crazy. I volunteered to go back to Borlaeus. Why the smile? Corin stroked her cheek. I was thinking your ample incentive for me to do everything I can to return. Arissi leaned down and kissed him on the mouth. Then, if you do not return, I shall feel horrible for the rest of my life. I can't have that, can I? Certainly not. She kissed him again, then slowly pulled away from him. Sleep well tonight, Corin Horn, and fly the best you ever have tomorrow. The door to her quarters closed, and Corin turned to backtrack to the hallway leading to the billet he shared with Ural. Though with Ural staying in the med station so they can monitor his arm, I'll be all alone. A jolt of fear ran through him, and he almost turned around and went back to Arissi. Since his father's death, he had spent a lot of time alone. It wasn't that they had been in each other's constant company, but just knowing he could speak with his father and that his father would understand his problems meant he didn't have to face them without help. Unlike most of the folks he knew, he got along well with his father. They had their occasional fights, but nothing that ripped apart the fabric of their relationship. That relationship, strengthened by mutual grief when Corin's mother died, weathered all adversity and just grew stronger. They'd always been like paired banthas yoked to the same grab sledge. Together, there had been nothing they could not accomplish. He realized that since his father's death, he'd been trying to go forward as much as possible, but without his father being there, he had a hard time figuring out exactly which way was forward. Gilbastra had tried to help him out, and had been very effective, but since leaving Corsac, Corin had been without a moral compass. Actually, I've had the moral compass, but I was so used to checking it against my father's feelings on things that I'm not certain it's still calibrated correctly. Deep down, he knew his father would have supported his decision to join the rebellion, but his approval would have been harder to earn. Corn felt fairly certain he could have earned it, too, but death prevented him from knowing his father was still proud of him. He knew his father would have thought the mission to Borlaeus was stupid and needlessly dangerous, but he would have also been one of the first to volunteer for it. I guess, old man, you really aren't gone. Corn fingered his medallion. I've got your sense of duty and your good luck charm. Definitely puts me ahead of the game. Corn opened the door to his quarters and hit the light switch. He'd already unzipped his flight suit from throat to navel before he noticed the blanket-shrouded lump on Ural's bunk stir. How did you get in here? Mirax sat up and scooped long locks of black hair out of her face. Your gand friend let me in. Where did you run into him? Med station. Cool and pump went in the skate and flooded the ventilation system. My droid is locking it down, but I got a lungful. He was there and recognized me. The MDs declared me healthy, but I couldn't go back to the skate. And with you staging for an operation, there's scant free space here. Since he's staying with the dock droids, he offered me his billet. She yawned. I agreed, since I assumed you'd be spending the night with the Bacta Queen. Corn blinked at her. You did? I saw the look she gave you when I showed up on the reprieve. She could teach the average hut a thing or two about possessiveness. 
He didn't like the smug tone in her voice. You must have gotten more coolant than you thought. How do you plot that? I'm here, aren't I? Hey, Corin. I'd be the first to say Hal Horn's boy was smarter than Arissi is pretty. But you thought I'd be with her. Everyone makes mistakes, and you'd have been making one if you'd stayed with her. Corin shot Mirax a wry grin. She's possessive and you're, what, being protective? There are only so many of us out here, Corin. Mirax plucked at the shoulder of her sleeveless tunic. She wouldn't be good for you. And who would? You? In your dreams, Corsac. The look of surprise on her face coincided with the remark's sting in his heart. He wouldn't have thought so automatic a response, tossed off with the speed of a reflex that had been well exercised, could have bothered him. In his previous career, he'd heard the same line delivered hundreds of times, with more and less vehemence, by every creature that ever tried to get its mouth around basic words. He'd shrugged it off without really hearing it more times than he could count. The surprised expression she wore told him that she hadn't meant to speak without thinking. She seemed to be second-guessing her comment as much as he was wondering about the effect it had on him. The automatic dismissal hurts because I expected to merit something more than that. And she shot back so sharply because I dared suggest she wouldn't be better for me than Arissi. And her own reaction surprised her. Corin crossed over and sat at the foot of Ural's bunk. Look, Mirax, it's been a long day, and tomorrow is going to be tough. I meant no offense. I know. I was picking on someone in your unit. I'm a little mad at the Thyferans right now. The price of Bacta is going up. They're blaming an Ashern attack on a processing plant. I used to turn a tidy little profit on shipments, but I can't raise the money to buy a lot. I'm left running foodstuff and parts, which is not the way to get rich. I wish I could help. Sure you do. She shook her head, all the while smiling. If I wanted to kill my father, I'd send him a holo and tell him how Horn's son said he wished he could help me make some runs. Somewhere in orbit between Corellia and Salonia, my father's ashes are trying to recoalesce to stop me. He smiled and patted her blanketed knee. I do mean it, though. I believe you. Wherever you're going tomorrow, if you run into anyone on the ground who can sign an exclusive import-export deal, think of me and get it on a data card. If I'm on the ground tomorrow, the only thing that will get exported is me, and I'll be exported to Kessel. I'll make you a deal on the spice you dig up. You're all heart. She drew her knees up and hugged them to her chest. It's going to be nasty, is it? About the only thing we have going for us is that they don't know we're coming. That's something, then. Mirax reached out and touched the medallion he wore. Is that what I think it is? I don't know. It was my father's good luck charm. Corin took it off and passed it to her, complete with the gold chain. It's a coin in a collar that lets me put it on a chain. My father used to keep it in his pocket, but I lose things too easily like that. So what is it that you think it is? Mirax turned it over and back in her palm and peered at it closely. It's a Jedcred. What? She frowned. Jedcred is what my father used to call him. It comes from Jedi credit. It looks like a coin but was really a commemorative medallion struck when a Corellian Jedi became a master. A dozen or so would get minted and distributed to family, close friends, the Jedi's master, and favored students. Corn raised an eyebrow. How do you know so much about it? She smiled sweetly. Have you forgotten, my dear, that I make my living by bringing that which is ordinarily rare to those who want it? Collectibles like these can fetch a fine price, especially since the Emperor cornered the market on Jedi Knights. 
How did your father get it? I don't really know. He thought for a moment. I know my grandfather liaised with the Jedi to coordinate their actions with Corsac and had a good friend among them, but that was back before the Clone Wars. I guess this guy was someone he knew. He did say the only Jedi he knew well died in the Clone Wars. She handed it back to him. I hope it's a better luck charm for you than it was for the Jedi whose face is on it. He refastened it around his neck and relished the sensation of its weight against his breastbone. You're not alone in that hope. He stood and smothered a yawn with his hand. Sorry, that's not from talking with you. I know. It's late and the day's been exhausting. I'll get up early to record some messages, but right now I need my sleep. So do I. I'm just going to go over there and lie down. So I imagined. Mirax lay back down and pulled the blanket up under her chin. Corin walked over to his bed, sat down and kicked off his boots. He started to pull off his flight suit, but stopped when he noticed she was watching him. I thought you were going to go to sleep. I am. But I was just wondering... Yes? Do you think you'll be warm enough tonight? Corin peeled his flight suit down to his waist, then snaked it down over the lower half of his body. Her question sounded innocent enough, but the inflection in her voice filled it with all sorts of innuendos and invitations. Visions of the two of them entwined together in his bed flashed through his mind. He was tempted. In her arms, he could find sanctuary from the loneliness and fear he felt. But what they would be doing, he would be doing for himself. That wouldn't be right. Yeah, Mirax, I think I will be warm enough. Oh, good. Mirak smiled at him as he pulled his sheets over himself. I just thought I'd ask. Thanks. He hit the light switch and the room went black. Corin? Yes? Are you sure you'll be warm enough? Quite sure, he said, regretting each syllable. Good. Mischief shot through her voice. Then you wouldn't mind tossing me your spare blanket, would you? Not at all. He laughed lightly and tossed the blanket from the foot of his bed off into the darkness. Good night, Ms. Tarek. Sleep tight, Mr. Horn. Tomorrow will be all clear skies and easy shots for you. 32. Wedge pressed his thumb against the data pad screen offered to him by the Verpine tech, Zrai. Thanks for getting the auxiliary fuel pods on so quickly. It's going to mean a lot on this mission. The insectoid technician buzzed something at him, prompting Wedge to smile and nod since he had no idea what the tech was saying. He assumed it had something to do with the ablative sheaths fitted over the nose of the X-Wings. It would burn off as they entered Borlaeus's atmosphere, giving the snub fighters the appearance of meteorites burning up on entry to observers on the ground. A very good job, Zrai. Over the top of the tech's head, he saw Mirax walk into the hangar with Corin. She gave him a kiss on the cheek. Then the pilot ran off toward his own green and white X-Wing. Mirax watched him go, pulling a rebel issue flight jacket more tightly over her shoulders. Mirax and Corin? Perhaps opposites do attract. It struck him that their attraction to each other seemed as improbable as that of Princess Leia to Han Solo. The thought caused a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. If they have as many ups and downs as those two... Mirax walked over to him and watched him through slitted eyes for a second. Are you borrowing trouble, Wedge? Are you reading my mind? Huh? Nice coat. Looks better on you than it does on Corin. Mirax smiled but didn't blush. We're friends. Ural offered me his bunk last night and I accepted. Corin and I talked. Nothing happened. 
She glanced to the side and noticed Arisi's approach. It's a good thing Corin doesn't snore. I was able to get some rest. Wedge shook his head. We're heading out, Mirax. I left a message behind for you and your father if I don't make it back. You will, Wedge. You've gobbled up the best the Emperor had to offer. No reasons to imagine the crumbs will choke you. Mirax gave him a hug and a kiss on the cheek. I'll see if I can find enough paint to be able to decorate your T-65 with the new kills. Thanks, Mirax. He turned to Arissi. You have something for me, Ms. Dlaret? Mission Control says Case Green is in effect. Good. We're clear to go. Wedge whistled loudly and circled his right hand over his head. The rogue squadron pilots looked at him for a second and pulled themselves into their cockpits. Sorry you're not going with us, Ms. Dlaret. Not as sorry as I am. May the Force be with you. Wedge smiled. Thanks. Stay out of danger, the both of you. He pulled on his helmet and climbed up into the X-Wing's cockpit. He strapped himself into the ejection seat and punched the ignition sequence into the computer. The engines came up with only a trace of a whine. He closed the cockpit canopy and glanced behind himself. Are you ready, Minoc? The R5 unit beeped at him, and Wedge projected a trace of fear into the reply's tremolo. Wouldn't be a mission if we didn't feel that way. Rogue Leader to Mission Control, requesting liftoff clearance. Control to Rogue Leader, you and your squadron are clear for takeoff. Be strong in the force, and shoot straight. As ordered, Tycho. See you in ten hours. I'll be waiting. Wedge gave Tycho's silhouette in the control center's window a thumbs up. Then he slowly cut in the repulsor lift drive. The X-Wing rose from the ground and, with a light foot on the rudder pedals, turned left toward the hangar door. Easing the throttle forward, he applied thrust and started out. He let his nose dip a bit to give himself a better view of the area through which he flew, retracted his landing gear, and cruised out into the open. All around him, the golden savannas of Noquivzor spread out, the long grasses teased by gentle breezes. His ship seemed immune to the wind, just as it was immune to the peace of the planet. Off in the distance, brown specks flowed together into a dark flood as a mossy-horned herd of wildernerfs invaded the valley. In one huge tree, the only one visible to Wedge, a pride of Taupari waited for the prey to drift closer before they would start their hunt. Tycho was right. I'm not too old for this game. I have, however, been playing it for far too long. When I get back, I'm going to get out and walk across these plains and drink in a little life, a little peace. He nodded slowly. It's no good to keep fighting if I allow myself to forget why I'm fighting. Corin's voice crackled through the helmet speakers. Rogue Squadron assembled, sir. Wedge brought the nose of his fighter up. Thank you, Rogue Nine. Full speed to the jump point, people. We've got an appointment to keep, and it won't do for us to be a minute late. Wedge punched his throttle full forward, leaving wind-whipped grasses and roiling clouds as the only sign he had been on the planet. And Noquivzor erased those traces effortlessly. Mirax shivered and hugged her arms around herself. As she turned away from the hangar opening, she saw Arissi staring ion bolts at her. Now I know why I felt cold. She put her arms through the sleeves of the jacket and pulled it taut at her waist so Corin's name tape could be read over the breast pocket. I think they'll do fine. I know it. The Thyferon glared at her. Of course, your antics with Corin could doom the mission. He needed rest. And he got it. Mirax met Arissi's stare openly. Corin and I are friends, nothing more. His father knew my father. His father hunted your father. And got him, so you can rest assured that nothing could develop between us. 
Good. See that it doesn't. The implied challenge got beneath Mirax's skin. And if I don't? Erisi's blue eyes sparked anger. You are a smuggler. I have it within my power to see to it that you never are able to handle back to shipments. I can guarantee that anyone who wants to handle back to shipments will never deal with you. In short, I can end your career here and now. The Thyferon's expression eased, but the energy in her eyes did not diminish. Conversely, you can be rewarded for leaving Corin alone. The very influence that I could bring to bear against you can be made to work for you. We can be friends, and you will find that a very good thing. Mirax killed the desire to haul off and smack the smug grin from Arissi's face. She was adrift in space and isn't on a mission with her squadron. She's bound to be muddy in her thinking. I'll take that under advisement. Even if I felt something more for Corrin, well, I make my living selling all sorts of things I might like for myself. In fact, I should be seeing to business right now, if you'll excuse me. Of course. Erissi smiled sweetly, but it failed to cut the venom in her eyes. We'll speak again. Mirax mirrored her smile, then stalked off toward the pulsar skate. She headed up the gang ramp and sniffed the air for traces of coolant. She smelled nothing, which should have made her happy, but the abbreviated conversation with Arissi left her uneasy. And, she realized, it's because of more than the imperious way she spoke to me. Mirax had learned to handle all manner of client attitudes toward her, but that had been easy since it was business, not personal. Arissi was giving her orders concerning her personal life. She even threatened business pressures to make Mirax change her personal life. While what Arissi offered was indeed very tempting, the practical result would be that Mirax would be selling a piece of herself, and that was something she had long ago vowed never to do. She wanted to convince herself that her upset came from the principle of the whole thing, but she couldn't dismiss the nascent feelings she had for Corin. It wasn't love. Of that she was pretty certain, but it could have moved toward it. At the very least, Corin represented something from her past that provided an illusion of constancy to life. She knew she could have hated him as easily as liked him, and she'd expected more negative feelings for him, but they just weren't there. In bringing him the Rishkate and the black market goods, she'd expected an angry reaction from him. That would have been reason enough to think poorly of him, but he'd been gracious in accepting the gifts. She'd started to soften toward him that night, which is why she fled. Mirax admitted to herself that she'd accepted Ural's offer to get another shot at kindling negative feelings. She'd been prepared to sleep with Corin and hate him in the morning if he'd seduced her with some and tomorrow I may die line. The fact that he hadn't tried to seduce her and had deftly sidestepped invitations to keep her warm in the night confirmed what she had known all along. He was a bit more complex than the stereotypical Corsac officer. She shivered. I don't need or want involvement with anyone, much less the son of the man who sent my father to Kessel. I also don't want some back to queen ordering me around. Her head came up as she realized her Sullistan pilot had spoken to her. What? Liet save. The mouse-eared pilot chittered at her again. No, I don't know where we're going because I don't know what we'll be hauling. The Sullistan canted his head to the side and muttered reprovingly. Well, for your information, I do didn't sleep with a pilot, and even if I had slept with him, he isn't the unit's quartermaster. Have you thought of pulling a unit want list from Mtray? 
No. She pointed at the communications console. Do it now. Leah punched up a comm frequency, then squeaked and squealed through a headset. Mirax hit another button, and a holographic list featuring icons and dual buy-sell prices grew up from the holoplate in the middle of the state's cockpit. She scanned the list quickly and saw most of it was military equipment, which was paid for with promises and brought a very low profit margin into the equation. Still, she was willing to bring it in, provided she had some high-value cargo to make a run worth her time. The consumer goods list began, and she found it much more promising than the military list. Then some odd products started showing up. Liet, ask for confirmation on the prices for 15 through 25 inclusive. The Sulistan complied with the order, then nodded and rubbed his hands together greedily. Damn, this is not good. Mirax smacked her hands together. Tell the droid we'll buy all he has of 15 through 25. Yes, all, Liet chirred angrily. I know we can't fit it all in here. Negotiate an exclusivity contract with him. Give him whatever he wants. A partnership even. Just do it. She snatched a comm link from the recharging port in the cockpit wall. When you have it locked, call me. I'll be out looking for Wedges XO. We have a problem. A big problem. And if I can't head it off, I've got friends who are on their way to die. 33. Wedge keyed his comm as the squadron came out of hyperspace and prepared for the second and final leg of their run into the Peria system. He adjusted the power output for the comm so the signal would become weak and garbled outside the kilometer sphere in which the ships moved. Even though the comm would scramble the transmission and make it all but impossible for the Empire to decrypt, he wanted to take the further precaution of making the signal all but impossible to pull in. This is Rogue Leader. There is one final refinement to our plans that you should know about. There is no system codenamed Fenaru. We're going back to Black Moon. Wedge waited for comments and protests, but only silence came in over his headset. He took that as a vote of confidence in him by his people, and that brought a smile to his face. The mission as simulated was exact with the following exception. The simulated run through the asteroid belt to get into the planet was based on a run through the canyons on Borlaeus's sole moon. We come in to the system behind it, swing around on its surface, and take a direct shot at the night side of the world. The moon is what will make leaving tough, but coming in, it will shield us from unfriendlies on the world. Cometary fragments are causing meteor showers, so planet-based detection stations should have a hard time picking us up. Any questions? Broar's voice growled through the speakers. You're saying, Commander, we're getting another shot at the squins who escaped us last time? I was under the impression we were the ones who escaped last time. That's about the size of it. And there will be friendlies in the area, but not infighters, and they'll be mute. Our mission is to hit the conduit and get back out. The fuel limitations are exactly what they were in the simulator. Wedge hit a button on his console. Speed and coordinates for the jump to hyperspace sent now. We'll be three hours to Borlaeus, so use the time to review the run. The squadron went to light speed, and Wedge checked his fuel level. Given mission parameters, distance from the moon to target, and expected fuel consumption rates, he was in fine shape. On the run from the moon to Borlaeus, he would begin burning fuel directly from the belly pod and begin to use it to refill what little fuel the escape from Noquivzor and the hyperspace jumps had burned from his main tank. The double duty would allow him to drain the pod more quickly and jettison it shortly after the end of the run to the target. The others would be following the same procedure, though the second and third flights would ditch their pods before they began valley runs. 
Wedge felt confident his people would succeed in destroying the tunnel. That would allow the commandos, who were arriving in the system from a different direction and at a different time, to get in and do their jobs before Defender Wing arrived. The exact timing of the commando operation had been kept from him. Though Akbar had said that if his people could help, it would be appreciated. He took that to mean the commandos and their arrival would overlap with Rogue Squadron's operation, but the only help the rogues could realistically offer would be to scatter the local fighters, and that was something he knew he could not possibly prevent his people from doing anyway. We're good, we're trained, and we know we have to succeed. Wedge smiled and brought up a visual simulation of the valley run. With a little luck and a lot of heart, there's nothing that can stop us from succeeding. But, Captain Selchu, you must tell me where they are. Mirax waved a data pad at him. I think the mission has been compromised. Tycho shook his head. It's impossible. She jerked a thumb at the door to his quarters. Sure, and the security officers standing guard over you told me it was impossible for me to speak with you, but I'm here, aren't I? There are degrees of impossible, I guess. Tycho raked fingers back through brown hair. The thing of it is that I can't tell you where they're off to. I don't know. How's that? Mirax watched him carefully. You're the unit's executive officer. You must know. Sorry. Who does know? Here? Emtray. Get him here. Ms. Tarek, I know you're a friend of Commander Antilles, and I know he sets great store by you, but Mirax held a hand up. Look, I wouldn't be here, except that I think their mission has been compromised, and they may be walking into a trap. Get the droid here, because I think he's part of it. I'll explain by the time he gets here, and if you don't like the explanation, kick me out and send him on his way. Please. I don't want your friends and mine to die. All right. Please, sit down. Tycho fished a comlink from his pocket. Captain Selchu to Emtray, please report to my quarters. This is urgent. On my way, Captain. Mirax sat in a simple canvas campaign chair and cleared a stack of data cards from the proton torpedo crate Tycho used as a low table. She set her data pad down. Do you have a holoplate to project data? He shook his head and scooped another pile of data cards from the table to the foot of his bed, then sat down beside them. I've got a good imagination. What have you got? She glanced at the data pad and organized her thoughts. Right after they jumped out of this system, I had my pilot pull a trade list from Mtray. It has a lot of military items and some black market stuff. There were new additions to the normal list and all of those products were native to Alderaan. They'd become quite rare over the last five years, but all had ridiculously low sell prices. Tycho's blue eyes narrowed. It's not like they're being made anymore. Right. She leaned forward for emphasis. Get this. None of them had buy prices. I've seen enough people price their goods over the years that this pattern tells me Mtray has uncovered a source for these materials. That means he's getting them for little or nothing. Now, since no one in Rogue Squadron has mentioned finding or recovering some lost trove of Alderanian goods, and this list is current, I'm thinking the droid is projecting the availability of products following this mission. Tycho sat back and scowled. I can see how you made that assumption, but couple it with this. There's been a rumor floating around about a new source for Alderanian goods, but the prices have been prohibitively high. I assumed the Empire was releasing stockpiles to soak up credits being held by Alderanian expatriates, denying the rebellion a source of needed money. If there is a source, be it an Imperial storehouse or something else, I think Rogue Squadron is headed toward it. And it doesn't take much brains to see such a place would be a prime target for the Alliance, 
given how many Alderanian nomads would love another piece of their world. Count me among their number. Such a storehouse would be an inviting target for a raid, and a logical site for an imperial trap. Tycho rubbed his hands over his face and sighed heavily. This doesn't look good, does it? I've arranged to take all of these items that Mtre can provide, so the list is clear right now. No one else can get access to it. No one else knows of it, as nearly as I know, so the leak should have stopped there. Still, there is a chance that the information could have gotten out. Exactly! Mirax popped up out of her chair as the door opened and m came in. Good morning, Captain Selchu, Ms. Tarek. How may I be of service? Mirax grabbed the droid's left arm. You have to tell me where Rogue Squadron is going. I'm afraid, Ms. Tarek, that information is classified. Neither you nor Captain Selchu are authorized to know that information. To provide it to you would be to compromise m -tray. That list you gave me this morning already compromises the location. I'm afraid that's impossible. Tycho boosted himself up off the bunk. Where are you getting the Alderanian goods you're offering for sale? The droid twitched, and the tone of his voice shifted slightly. If I reveal my sources, you'll cut in on my action. No way. Mirax stared incredulously at the droid, then turned back toward Tycho. Can you believe this? No, in fact, I can't. I'm just protecting my profit margin here. Emtre, this is a matter of life and death. Sure it is, Ms. Tarek. The death of my business. Tycho stood abruptly. Emtre, shut up. The droid looked at him strangely, tilting his head. I wasn't saying anything, sir. His voice has changed. I notice. Tycho's eyes narrowed. Shut up. I beg your pardon, sir. Shut up. The droid's arms snapped to its sides so quickly that Mirax lost her grip on him. The clamshell head canted forward, making the droid bow its head until its chin touched its chest. At the top of its neck, previously hidden by the head, Mirax saw a glowing red button. What's going on, Captain? Tycho half shrugged. I'm not certain, really, but the droid is in a wait state, it seems. I discovered this little trick when I was ferrying him to the Talisi system and we came across your ship. We were in combat and he wouldn't stop nattering. I ended up yelling at him to shut up and after the third time, this happened. He remains like this until roused. What's important right now is that until we hit the red button and reset him, he's little more than a remote with access to all m -Tray's memories. That's dangerous for a droid doing military work. It's not a standard modification for obvious reasons. There are a number of things odd about this droid, not the least of which is the voice shift when you start to press him on requisitions. I can check that later, though. Right now, this override should get us what you want. m -tray, I require the name of the system in which Rogue Squadron will be operating. Peria System, Borlaeus, Fourth Planet, One Moon, home to an imperial fortress, and various failed and abandoned industrial and agricultural ventures. The voice changed slightly. Location of agro-manufacturing facility for Alderanian agricultural products with high covert trade value. Mirax's blood ran cold. m -tray, the list of products available from that facility. How many people have had access to it? Yours was the only access, Ms. Tarek. Could a copy have been made by a slicer without your knowledge? The droid did not reply for a second or two. Impossible to determine an answer to that question. Mirax looked over at Tycho. The Empire could have been warned. We have to do something. What? If we send a message out... It could warn the Empire they're coming as easily as it warns our people of an ambush. So we go there. I can get us there fast. Maybe even before they arrive. And have our presence tip the Empire about the raid? Tycho shook his head. Any comm message could be intercepted, even if we are in system and try to type beam it to them. That's no good. 
Mirax balled her fists and hammered them against her thighs. We have to do something. We can't just sit around and do nothing. Yes, but what we do has to be the right thing. Tycho slowly smiled and reached for the button on the back of Mtray's neck. And I think I know what it is. 34. When the squadron reverted to real space, the dark craggy ball hanging in space before them reduced Borlaeus to a slender blue-green crescent streaked with white. The moon's thin atmosphere blurred Borlaeus's image, making it beautiful, which was definitely not how Korn had remembered it. Korn inverted his X-wing, then reached up with his right hand to hit the switch that brought his S-foils into attack position. Ahead of him, Wedge's X-Wing similarly spread its wings, twisting around and bearing down on the moon. The X-Wings maintained calm silence as they leveled out and skimmed the black lunar surface. Corin brought his snub fighter in behind and to the left of Wedge's fighter. With their scanners in passive mode to avoid detection, they'd only register threats that had scanners up and seeking targets. As a result, Visual scanning by pilots and astromech droids became the primary defense against ambush. Not that much should be here. While the simulations had represented this run as threading their way through an asteroid ring around a planet to remain hidden, all the parameters used were taken from Borlaeus. As nearly as they knew, the Imperials had not stationed fighters or remote detection units on the moon. Still, that possibility did exist, so the squadron did all it could to keep their presence a secret. Volcanic glass teeth lined gaps in crater walls. They reflected scant little starlight, but strange shapes did appear in silhouette against the starfield. Whipping along at near maximum speed in the pitch darkness of the moon's nightside did seem reckless and foolish, but no more so than the rest of the mission. They raced through the blackness, heading toward a point on the ever-changing horizon. When the horizon appeared as a white crown, Wedge's X-Wing pulled up and shot away from the moon. Down on Borlaeus, the moon only appeared to be half full, and the rogues made their approach against the background of the moon's dark side. They plunged down into Borlaeus's gravity well. They let the planet draw them in, but before they hit the outer edges of the planet's atmosphere, Corin brought his ship around in a looping turn to starboard and inverted to have Borlaeus's dark face above him. Pulling back on the stick, he eased the fighter's nose into the atmosphere. The ablative shell Zry had applied to his fighter began to glow red, then came apart in a shower of sparks that momentarily blanketed his cockpit canopy. Once the fiery cloud passed, he pulled back even more on the stick and started a sharper descent into Borlaeus's night. The ablative shell had given his ship the appearance of yet one more of the Versiad meteors streaking through the night sky. Corin checked his scanners and had no indication of hostile sensors directed at him. Entry is clean. Glancing at his instruments, he came around to a heading and chopped his speed back so he would reach the rendezvous point exactly on time. Flipping a switch, he engaged the fuel pod pump so it would start to refill his onboard fuel tank. A red-lined error message scrolled up on his main screen. Whistler, the T-65 AFP pump isn't working. Is there anything you can do? A negative hoot replied to his question. Corin shrugged. I have to run with the pod a little longer. No big deal. Suddenly, Noara's voice crackled over the helmet speakers. Leader, 12. Repeat, 1, 2. Eyeballs coming in from the west. Angels, 10. On intercept for run. Patrol formation. Corn felt his stomach clench. Lucky bastards. He smiled. Or, very unlucky. Two flight. Three flight. Pounce on them. Nine. We're to the deck and in. Are you ready? Telemetry feed started. You are lead. 
Corin tightened his grip on the stick and shoved the fighter over into a steep dive. This is it, Whistler. Keep your domed head down and enjoy the ride. Wedge flipped his scanners into active mode and swooped his X-wing into the narrow end of the rift valley. The computer used muted greens to impose holographic highlights on the canopy that corresponded to the terrain outside. Nudging the stick to port and starboard, he sliced his craft through the sleeping canyon. He rolled up on his port wing to slip through a narrow passage, then noted that behind him Corn had remained level to make the same run. No need to be fancy, Nine. Yes, sir. Corin's voice drifted off for a second. Lead, I have two hostiles coming in behind us. Wedge hit a switch on his console. Power to rear deflector shields. Done. Minoc, bring up data on the trailers. The monitor flashed images of two Thai starfighters. We should be faster than they are maneuvering through the atmosphere here, but I'd rather they weren't there. Wedge keyed his comm. Four, we have two down here. Can you help? Broar answered immediately. Negative lead. Our plates are full, and long-range scans indicate squints coming in. Copy, four. Wedge frowned. The intervention by interceptors was not good. If both of the squadrons that showed up at the end of the last battle were to scramble against Rogue Squadron, no one would make it home. But that's not the objective of this mission. Blowing the conduit is. Nine, push your speed. As ordered. The X-Wings came out of the canyon leading into the Rift Valley. To the right, grassy plains stretched out through the darkness. On the left, a striated escarpment rose up nearly a thousand meters. Its craggy surface reflected enough moonlight to let Wedge see Corrin's X-Wing in silhouette as the fighter drew almost parallel to his port stabilizer. Twenty-five kilometers farther on, the valley narrowed again, and five kilometers beyond that point lay their target. Verdant laser bolts sizzled past, splitting the space between the rebel fighters. Wedge juked up and to the starboard, while Corin's ship sank out of sight on the left. Rolling his ship and letting it move back toward the center of the valley, he saw one tide dive, its lasers gouging up great chunks of the valley floor in front of Corin's jinking X-wing. Wedge hauled his throttle back to half power and pulled a hard turn to port. Punching the throttle forward again, he rolled the ship onto its right S-foil and yanked it back in another hard turn. Leveling out to the left, he slipped into the aft wash of the tie that had been on his tail. His finger tightened down on the trigger, and scarlet laser fire exploded the Imperial fighter. Nine, report. Go, lead. Punch it. I'm coming behind. Status. I'll be good to go in a second. Kicking the X-Wing up on the starboard stabilizers, Wedge stabbed his fighter into the narrow northern end of the valley. A brilliant flash of light painted shadows against white rock with skeletal clarity. The X-Wing bucked a bit as the explosion's shockwave caught up with it, but Wedge's steady hand kept the fighter clear of the canyon walls. Nine, what was that? Fuel pod exploding. One more time. Misses on the deck kicked up debris that hit my belly pod, and I had a slow leak. I jettisoned it. The tank exploded, and the guy behind me got an eyeful. Wedge looked at his fuel indicators. His fuel pod was still a quarter full. Fuel status. I'm okay. How much? Three quarters. Anger in Corin's voice transmuted into resolution. Enough to do the job. Copy. One run, then you're out of here, Corin. You're into your reserve. Wedge clicked his weapons control over to proton torpedoes. One click, arming two. Got it, armed two. Is that light up there? Wedge slowly nodded. Be alert. Power to forward shields. 
Banking hard starboard, he brought the fighter around the final turn before the run to the conduit. Yanking the stick to the left, he snap-rolled the X-wing level, then hit the right rudder pedal and started the fighter skidding to the left. Laser bolts exploded against his forward shields. He pulled the trigger, sending two proton torpedoes sizzling out, but even as he did so, he knew they would miss high. As they exploded against the canyon walls beyond the Ferrocrete tunnel, Wedge snapped his repulsor lift drives on and bounced his fighter up and out of the canyon. Jamming his throttle full forward, he hauled back on the stick and shot skyward. He saw the flashes of two more explosions below him as he rocketed away from Borlaeus. Nine, report. Mine went low. That was a juggernaut assault vehicle down there providing that fire. And it looked like they were reinforcing the conduit. I saw that. I nailed a ferrocrete mixer. Wedge checked his scanners. We have a squadron of interceptors headed in our direction. What do you want me to do? I'm good for another run. Another run would be suicide, Nine, and you don't have the fuel to play. Sir, I'm good for another run. Wedge shook his head. You're heading home while you can still get there. No. That's an order, Nine, not an invitation to debate. Wedge could feel Corin's disappointment. It's exactly what I felt when Luke ordered me out of the trench on the first Death Star run. Get clear, Corin. You can't do any more good back there. Dejection filled Corin's voice. As ordered, sir. What are you going to do? Blowing the conduit is our mission, and the others can't break off to do it. Wedge Antilles slowly smiled. What the imps have set up there will stop almost any pilot. I'm going to remind them that in Rogue Squadron, we don't take just any pilot. 35. Curtin Lure fussed with the hem of his tunic and adjusted his cap with a tug on the bill. He wanted to feel confident about his recall to Corsant, but he did not dare allow himself that indulgence. His mission had been the destruction of Rogue Squadron. While half of it had died at Borlaeus, the other half lived, with Wedge Antilles and Corn Horn still flying. In fact, the unit had amassed a considerable list of kills while it was his to destroy, so he could not imagine Isan Isard would be in a pleasant mood. He cracked a smile. I cannot imagine her ever being in a good mood. The door to her office slid open and Curtin's smile died. Isard again wore her scarlet admiral's uniform, complete with the black armband on her left arm. Her hair had been drawn back and fastened at the nape of her neck with a black clasp. She gestured invitingly, but the mannerly nature of her greeting only played through her hand. Her mismatched eyes prophesied doom, but he thought it might be deferred instead of immediate. Please, Agent Lure, do come in. I trust the journey from Borlaeus was not too tiring. He shook his head, doing his best to hide any trace of fatigue. I apologize for not being here sooner. My original agenda was disrupted, hence the week's delay in my arrival. I know about it. Another operation demanded some resources that I had planned to use for your return. She casually waved away concern over the delay, something Curtin found mildly annoying since she had caused it and his week on Toprawa. I trust you spent your time on Toprawa well? Well? Toprawa had been a rebel transfer point for the stolen data about the first Death Star. As punishment for their complicity in the rebellion, the population saw its world reduced to a pre-industrial state, where banthas were the swiftest form of travel, and fire was the highest level of energy production available to the native people. Imperial forces lived in gleaming citadels that remained lit like beacons throughout the night, becoming visible monuments to what the people of Toprawa had lost through their perfidy. 
You studied their suffering, yes? Her dark brows arrowed together. You saw what they have become. Curtin swallowed hard. I have seen, yes. They are wretched and pathetic. And you witnessed one of their festivals? He nodded slowly. The festival involved a company of stormtroopers driving a cart laden with sacks of grain into the center of a village. To receive the grain, the villagers were required to squirm on their bellies, worming their way forward, all the time weeping and wailing lamentations over the emperor's death. Food was doled out based on some trooper's belief in the sincerity of the mourning. Curtin had no doubt that many of the people had come to believe they truly did regret the emperor's death. Those people, Agent Lure, conspired with the emperor's murderers. They have learned that their actions have consequences, and they regret their past disloyalty. Her eyes tightened at the corners. In their previous arrogance, they dared believe the Empire was superfluous and could be replaced. Now they know this is not true. All that is good in their lives comes from the Empire. They have been shown the truth and now live for a chance to be allowed back into our brotherhood. I saw. I remember. Isard's harsh expression slackened slightly. I recall your visual retention rate. Toprawa must have been meant as a lesson in contrition. Curtin raised his chin slightly, exposing his throat. Madam Director, I regret deeply not having completed my mission. You do? Isard opened her hands and, surprise, widened her eyes. How is it you believe you have failed? You sent me out to destroy Rogue Squadron. Curtin's head twisted slightly to the side. I have failed to do this. It is true that Rogue Squadron still exists, though for how much longer is in serious debate. The attack on Borlaeus hurt them badly. Your report made this quite apparent. She smiled and Curtin had to suppress a shudder. More important than that was the information you provided about General Derricote's private enterprise on Borlaeus. You could not have hidden it from me, of course, since it was key to the defense that sent the rebels away without a victory. Curtin Lure bowed his head to her. I'm glad you were pleased. As he looked back up, her expression changed again, and it did not speak to anything even approximating pleasure on her part. It also missed mild discomfort by a wide margin, turning his mouth into a desert and his stomach into a home for a sarlacc. What did I do? When he swallowed, his larynx scraped in his throat as if both were made of stone. What did I fail to do? I had expected something more of you, Agent Lure. Can you imagine what that is? He shook his head. I cannot. No, indeed, you cannot. And do you know why you cannot? No. Her hissed words echoed through the nearly empty chamber. It is because your imagination has atrophied to the point of lifelessness. Recall, if you will, what Gil Bastra thought of you. Curtin's face burned. He felt I relied on my retention of knowledge too much and used it to compensate for a lack of analysis. I remember this, and I have tried to change my ways. I had done an analysis of probable rebel strategies, and I isolated a number of worlds where I felt they would strike after they hit the Hensara system. And I was right, because Borlaeus was on that list. And how did you come to be at Borlaeus? You sent me there. I sent you there. She held her right hand out to her side, then brought the left hand into the same position with a similar gesture. Therefore, you concluded that your analysis of rebel strategy paralleled mine. Hence, you sent me to Borlaeus. 
she brought her hands together, interlacing her fingers. You began analysis, found what you thought was corroboration for it, and then, instead of further testing your analysis and this corroborating evidence, you stopped thinking. Consider the utter absurdity of your conclusion. What? Curtain lore. Are you so simple-minded to assume that if I could predict where the rebels were going to strike, I would send you, and you alone, to be there and observe their attack? I assure you, I do not think so highly of your martial skills. The sarlacc in his stomach grew restless and began gnawing its way free of his belly. Borlaeus should have fallen, and did not only because... Derricote had hidden resources available to defend it. If she were able to predict where the rebels would show up, she would have opposed them with significantly greater force and have struck a solid blow against them. From the beginning, Agent Lure, the difficulty with the rebellion has been in locating them. Since the Emperor's death, they have been able to spread out and diversify their bases, making them more difficult to destroy. Your effort against the base at Talisee was commendable. Had Admiral Devlia not been stupid, Rogue Squadron might have been eliminated. The importance of that example, however, is to show you the vast problem we have had in finding the rebels we want to kill. Isan Isard clasped her hands at the small of her back. Borlaeus is but one of two dozen worlds that provides the rebels access to the core worlds and even Imperial Center herself. Defending against those attacks is nearly impossible and utterly ridiculous if one bears in mind that the destruction of the rebellion is the only way the preservation and restoration of the empire can take place. This I do have utmost in my mind, and it is this consideration that sent you to Borlaeus. Curtin concentrated for a moment. The only thing I did at Borlaeus was discover Derricote's covert operation. But if she had known about that previously, she would have dealt with him herself. You sent me to spy on General Derricote? Isard nodded almost mechanically. He has skills that are useful to me. The fact that he had managed to repair and make operational the old Alderanian biotics facility indicated that his skills had not atrophied. After I received your report, I sent for him and left my own people in charge of Borlaeus. In fact, he is here now. My passage was delayed because you used ships meant for me to fetch him away. Very good, Agent Lure. Your report indicated he had the resources needed to resist a casual invitation. The arrival of a superstar destroyer proved enough to convince him to join me here. I have my people safeguarding his operation for him, tightening defenses and the like. His facility is held hostage against his cooperation. Curtin closed his eyes for a moment, hoping all the confusion and conflicting thoughts in his mind would sort themselves out. They did not. He opened his eyes and saw her studying him as a scavenger would study carrion. Forgive me, Madam Director, but I've lost track of your mission for me. Your mission, Agent Lure, is the same as it has always been. Destroy Rogue Squadron. The fact that I choose other missions for you from time to time should not deflect you from your primary duty. Then you will be sending me back out into the galaxy to pursue them? No, you will remain here and work with General Derricote. Curtin opened his mouth and started to ask a question, then closed it. He watched her for a moment, then bowed his head. As you wish, Madam Director. No, as it must be. She turned away from him and faced the windows that looked out over Imperial City. There is no need to send you in their pursuit. 
You see, soon enough, they will be here. And when they are, it will be quite the welcome you have prepared for them. 36. Get going, Nine. Defend yourself if you can't run, but get out of here. Wedge rolled his fighter to give himself a final look at Corrin's X-Wing. You've done good. The other pilot gave him a thumbs up. I'll be waiting for the rest of you to get outbound. See you then. Wedge pulled the X-Wing back over past vertical and saw the planet descend to fill his canopy. While the four proton torpedoes he and Corrin had loosed at the conduit had not destroyed it, the burning ferrocrete mixer did mark the target rather nicely. Knowing surprise had been irrevocably lost, Wedge brought his fighter down in a spiral that put him five kilometers out from the target at just under four clicks altitude. As Han once told me, stealth and subtlety work well, but for making lasting impressions, a blaster does just fine. He brought his X-Wing around on a heading that paralleled the valley, dropped the nose so it pointed at the fire burning in the distance, and started his dive. I definitely want this to be a lasting impression. Green laser bolts from the juggernaut vehicle lanced up through the night at him. Minoc whined, but Wedge just dropped the fighter below the line of fire, or bounced up above it, constantly forcing the gunners to adjust their sights up and down or side to side. Shooting at a fighter means you have a lot more movement to account for. Very few land vehicles can dance around this much. And none of them can do what I have in mind. The range-to-target indicator on his console scrolled meters off by the hundreds as he dove in on the conduit. A peace washed over him, despite the imperial fire being directed toward him. He knew he wasn't slipping into some Jedi trance. As much as he admired Luke, he knew he'd never master his friend's mystical skills. The sense of serenity seemed born of a conviction that he had to succeed in destroying the conduit and, more importantly, a lifetime of experience that told him the forces on the ground couldn't stop him. One kilometer out from the target, Wedge pulled his throttle back and reversed the engine's thrust. As the juggernaut's laser batteries brought their beams together to burn him from the sky, the X-Wing dropped like a rock. In virtual freefall, it hurled down toward the canyon floor. The juggernaut's gunners, perhaps believing they had in fact hit the fighter, or perhaps horrified at its uncontrolled descent, stopped shooting. Not that it would have mattered. A hundred meters from the ground, Wedge clicked in the repulsor lift engines, and their whine drowned out Minoc's terrified scream. The fighter's fall ended abruptly in a bouncing, bobbing hover barely five meters from the canyon's sandy floor. Dust billowed up around the X-Wing, and the lasers in the boxy juggernaut's forward turret began to track down. Behind the vehicle, visible in the red and gold light of the burning mixer, stormtroopers and masons began to scatter. Running his engines to zero thrust, Wedge ruddered the X-Wing's nose in line with the juggernaut and pulled the trigger on his flight stick. A single proton torpedo jetted out at the assault vehicle. The coruscating blue energy projectile pierced the juggernaut's wind screen. It immolated the cockpit crew and melted its way into the vehicle's main body. There it detonated, swelling the juggernaut with energy and rounding out its sharp corners before blasting it apart. Armor shrapnel sprayed throughout the area. It made the X-Wing's shields spark for a moment, but through them Wedge could see the aft end of the vehicle tumble back up and over the conduit to fall on the other side. Its burning hulk silhouetted the conduit. Wedge thumbed his weapon's control over to lasers and pulled the trigger. 
Using the rudder pedals, he rocked the fighter back and forth, peppering construction vehicles and plasteel forms with scarlet energy bolts. Scaffolding collapsed and semi-fluid ferrocrete oozed from burning forms. Stormtroopers darted back and forth, seeking any cover they could find. He made no attempt to target them specifically. Using a starfighter's weapons to kill an individual was akin to using a lightsaber to trim loose threads from a garment. It would do the job, but there were easier ways that were far more economical. He switched back to proton torpedoes and armed two. Focusing his aiming reticle on the ferrocrete pipe, he hit the trigger, then punched power to the repulsor lift drives to vault his ship into the air. The paired torpedoes blasted into and through the conduit in a shower of sparks. Ten meters beyond the pipe itself, they exploded, igniting a rogue star right there in the canyon. The shockwave rocked the fighter. It disintegrated the pipe, shearing it off at both ends, then rolled on with such force that it snuffed the fires burning in the vehicles. The canyon walls shook, starting rocks and dust tumbling down. The explosion's harsh glare gave Wedge one last glance at the complete destruction of the target zone. Then the fireball imploded, plunging the canyon into complete darkness. He allowed himself the hint of a smile. Conduit's gone. Now we start working on my objective. Wedge punched his throttle full forward and jettisoned his empty fuel pod. Rogue leader here. Mission accomplished. Four here, lead. All eyeballs blinded. All rogues are safe. Squints and rogues inbound your position. Broar's voice stopped for a moment. We'll be there before they are. Time to head home, rogues. Let's outrun them. Wedge brought his fighter around on a course that would link up with the other four fighters in the squadron. Nine is leading the way out and will report trouble. Negative lead. The anxiety in Nawara's voice sank like ice through Wedge. I've checked. Nine is nowhere on my forward scan. Angry with himself, Corrin considered violating Commander Antilles' order and shadowing him anyway. That thought survived about as long as Peshk had in the first fight for Black Moon. He's right. Your fuel reserves are down. He's given you a mission and you're to complete it. Head out and make sure the run is clear. Whistler, boost my sensors. I want as complete a picture of the theater here as you can give me. Full threat assessments. The astromech droid chirped happily. His first list of fighters showed only three eyeballs left in the dogfight with Rogue Squadron. A full squadron of squints was inbound, but their threat assessments were in decimal points. They were no threat to him, and scant little threat to his squadron mates. While he could not ignore them, there was no reason they would interfere with his run out of the system. The numbers on two of them climbed slightly higher. What's with those two? Whistler splashed a tactical display on Korn's monitor. Two of the squints had broken off to run a flyby and possible intercept on a body moving through the atmosphere. The numbers Whistler used to describe that falling object showed its fall to be controlled, and Korn was fairly certain that little fact would not have been lost upon the TIE pilots. Whistler... Do you think they're closing on one of our assault shuttles? A crisp note answered him as Whistler tagged the shuttle as the Devonian. Yeah, I thought so. Yanking his stick back to breastbone, Korn brought the snub fighter over in a big loop. Page, you're going to owe me big time for this one. The droid tootled at him with low tones. Yes, I do know what I'm doing. If I let my dive drive me instead of burning up fuel, we'll be fine. Korn eased his throttle back. And no, I don't want you to calculate the odds on this. I've never asked for the odds before, and I don't want them now. Odds only matter when you're engaged in games of chance, and if Paige's people are going to have any chance, 
This can't be a game. Corrin's dive was bringing him high, hot, and on an angle at the rear arc for the interceptors. He focused his attention on the second squint. He couldn't switch over to proton torpedoes because a target lock would warn them of the threat they faced. If he was going to succeed, he needed things to be fast, and that meant the first interceptor had to die on his first pass. Just over a kilometer out, Corin pushed his throttle forward and leveled out to come straight in at the interceptors. A bit more angle and maybe I can get both of them at the same time. He switched his weapon over to lasers and linked them so they would fire in tandem. He dropped his targeting crosshairs on the rear ship, and when they flashed green, he pulled the trigger and kept it down. Four pairs of red energy darts perforated the slant-winged interceptor. The first hits on the right wing started the ship rolling. Then it jinked up into Corrin's line of fire. Four laser bolts converged, puncturing the cockpit and filling the interior of the ship with fire. A roiling explosion blasted the squint apart and forced Corn to roll and dive to avoid the worst of the debris cloud. Snapping back to his previous orientation, he looked up at where the other interceptor should have been. He didn't see it, but before he could even begin to wonder if it had somehow died too, laser fire carved into the strength of his aft shield. Great. All I need is some Sith spawn hotshot pilot in that squint. He reinforced the aft shield, rolled, then hit the left rudder and slewed his ship around to try to give him an angle on the interceptor. He couldn't see it on his forward or rear scope, so he hauled back on the stick and started a climbing loop. The interceptor appeared dead center in his aft scan, and again, laced his aft shield with green fire. Who is this clown? Corin came over, rolled up onto the port S-foil, then chopped his throttle back and let the X-wing drop toward the planet. Whistler, calm to one click radius. Tell the transport to go to ground as soon as possible because this guy is good. I want room to operate. A harsh whistle stung him. A question appeared on his display. Yes, of course I'm better. I'm toying with him. Now reinforce those shields and hang on. The interceptor began to close on Korn's tail. Pulling back on the stick, Korn leveled his ship out, and the interceptor swooped in behind him. The Corellian waited until the interceptor closed to 500 meters, then side-slipped his ship to starboard. Hitting hard left rudder and bringing his throttle back up, his X-wing's nose swung back toward the squint. Though more maneuverable than their vertically winged predecessors, the interceptor's broad wings still gave them yaw problems. The squint's side slip came slow and presented Corin with a wonderful target. His first shot hit solidly on the starboard wing, lazing two angry holes in it, the squint began to roll and Corrin shot again, but the scarlet bolts shot fore and aft of the ball cockpit. The Imperial pilot finished the roll and dove. Corrin kicked the X-wing up on the port S-foil and dove after the interceptor. The pilot in front of him let his ship jerk and juke back and forth, but the drag from the damaged wing's solar panels made all moves to the right quicker and harder to recover from. Corin dropped his targeting reticle just to starboard of the stricken fighter. The interceptor drifted to the right, and he fired. The lasers took the right wing clean off. The squint immediately whirled off into a flat spin to port, uncontrolled and unrecoverable. Corin pulled up before he saw the interceptor crash, and part of him hoped the pilot had the intelligence to eject before he died. He glanced at his monitor and angled his ship onto an intercept for the rest of the squadron's outbound course. Nine to Rogue Leader, I'm still here. He heard plenty of anger pulsing through Wedge's reply. You're supposed to be leading, not following Nine. 
Copy lead. I was getting clear, but two squints made a run. So you made a run. Avenging General Crefe. Corin figured Wedge would catch the reference and realize the interceptors were closing on a transport when he picked them off. He looked at his fuel indicator. Lead, I have a problem. I know, Nine. Your astromech just answered an inquiry I sent. The Twi'lek's voice broke into the frequency. Lead, another dozen squints have launched and are following the wave behind us. Lead, this is four. Let's stay. It's only twenty-two of them. Lead, five here. I'm game. Corn smiled. Thanks, guys. Quiet. This isn't a democracy, and what we want to do doesn't matter. We have orders, and others are depending on those orders being obeyed. Static filled the speakers for a moment. Then Wedge spoke again. We do have some leeway in obeying them, though. Change in plans. We'll go sunside and draw the imps with us. Nine, you will go in on the dark side and go to ground. The atmosphere is thin, but your life support equipment can concentrate it enough for you. If you can avoid them, we'll be back for you. I'll do my best, lead. Corin brought his X-Wing into position with the rest of the squadron. Four, how many did you vape? I got six. You? Three, if we count the one in the canyon. It counts, Nine. Unconventional, but it counts. Thanks, Commander. Risati broke into the conversation. What did you do, Nine? It's complicated. I'll explain it later. Even as he pronounced the word later, it turned to dust in his mouth. I'm only at seventeen. You're plus two on me, Four. I'm going to count the ones I get on the dark side in our contest. I would not have it any other way, Nine. Nawara Venn spoke. Nine. Gavin's an ace now. Never doubted it for a minute. Good going, kid. Borlaeus's moon loomed large overhead. Welcome to the club. Ten seconds to break, rogues. Nine. Don't feel you have to be a hero. Have to be? I'm a rogue. I thought hero came with a territory. It certainly does, Nine. Break now. Corin banked off to the left as the rest of the squadron went right and filled his aft sensor scope. Later, my friends. If there was any reply, it didn't make it over the horizon to him. Corin throttled back and took the X-Wing down close to the lunar surface. He cut off his comm unit and flipped his sensors over to passive mode. Okay, Whistler. It's just you and me. Let's find us a hole to crawl into. No, not one to hide in, but one to ambush out of. The commander knew as well as we did that this split wouldn't fool all the Imperial pilots. They'll come for us eventually. I've never had a desire to die alone, and taking a bunch of them along will suit me just fine. 37. As certain as taxes and as slow as paperwork they come. With his X-Wing nestled in a frozen lava tube on the side of a volcano, Corin watched as paired interceptors flew search patterns over the lunar surface. They'd pushed enough power to their sensors that even with having them focused directly downward, enough energy bled off to register on his passive receptors. Whistler had detected differences in the energy signatures of each sensor unit and had isolated a dozen different interceptors. That means ten squints didn't make it back from their pursuit. Given that the rogues had only fifteen minutes to play, that's very good work. He reached up and tapped the transparasteel at the rear of his cockpit. Whistler, they've been at the search stuff for nearly half an hour. Have you got the solution worked up yet? The droid piped a jeer at him. Hey, just asking. Corn started his engines and shunted power to the weapons control. He armed two proton torpedoes. Ready when you are. A countdown clock appeared on his console and slowly started running down. The squints continued their back-and-forth grid search pattern, moving ever closer to his position. 
From the second he saw what they were doing, he asked Whistler to time the runs. They remained constant for speed and duration, which told Corin the pilots had done exactly what he would have. They programmed the search pattern into their navigational computers and let it run on autopilot. Which means we know where they'll be in 35.3 seconds. He nodded grimly. I'm dead, but you'll be dead sooner. And that's a bit of a victory, to be sure. It occurred to Corin that he was angry about dying. That emotion seemed, on the surface, to be rather logical, but emotions rarely were. Had someone described his current situation to him and asked him how he'd feel, he would have told them he'd have been scared out of his wits. The fact was, however, that the anger overshadowed the fear. He took a deep breath and forced himself to relax. Fear and anger aren't right here. He knew that going out to bring the interceptors down just so he'd take more of them with him when he died was wrong. He didn't know if the pilots were clones or volunteers or conscripts or mercenaries, and who they were didn't really matter. The only reason he had for fighting against them was the same one he'd had for going after the squints down on Borlaeus. I want to stop the Empire from taking lives. I'm not an Avenger. I'm here to protect others. He smiled. Somehow it seemed right that he, son and grandson of men who protected others in Corsac, had followed them into Corsac and had ended up here with the rebellion. His life, his father's life, his grandfather's life, had all been devoted to safeguarding others. And now the guys on the ground and Psalm's bomber jocks will get protected. The timer went to zero. Corin hit the trigger. Two proton torpedoes streaked out from the launch tubes on either side of the X-Wing. Because they were programmed to reach a certain point at a certain time, Corin did not need a target lock on the pair of squints flying past. A kilometer separated them from the X-Wing, and the torpedoes went from launch to target in under half a second. The first torpedo stabbed through the closest interceptor and detonated. The explosion vaporized the squint, reducing it to its component molecules. The second torpedo actually overshot its target, but went off when it reached its programmed range. The blast crumpled the starboard wing. The interceptor began to roll through a tight downward spiral, then slammed into a basalt monolith and exploded. Shoving the throttle forward, Corin held the stick steady as his snub fighter shot from the lava tube. Once clear, he hauled back on the stick and climbed. He saw other interceptors break their search patterns, but none of them immediately moved after him. Their sensors are still oriented toward the ground. He flipped his weapons controls over to lasers and set them on quad fire. It would slow his overall rate of fire, but a solid hit was a kill, and he needed all the help he could get. Inverting the X-Wing, he took a quick look at the interceptors as he flew past the volcano's crater. Spotting a pair of targets moving toward where the first squints had gone down, he rolled the fighter up on the starboard S-foil and came around in a wide curve. He dove and leveled out in a small valley between the volcano and a meteor crater. Climbing at the last second, he rose up over the broad lunar plain and sent two bursts of laser fire into the belly of a squint. The starfighter obliged him by melting into a metallic fog that instantly condensed and rained down on the moon. Whistler hooted proudly. Darned right. Horn pulls ahead of the Bacta boy. Corkscrewing his ship into a weave, Corin avoided the retribution of the squint's wingman. He leveled out for a second, then cut the fighter hard right. Ninety degrees from his original tack, he leveled out again, then climbed and did a wing over to port 
that pointed him straight back at the interceptor that had tried to stay on his tail. Corrin rolled, shot, melted some armor from the squint, and broke hard right again. He shook his head in response to Whistler's question. No, I didn't think I killed it. Burned him a bit, though. Corrin rolled his X-Wing through inversion and hit the left rudder to again carry himself back across his own trail. Green spears of laser light crisscrossed through the moon's thin air as the interceptors converged on his ship. Whistler toted nine up on the monitor and made the closest ones flash red on the screen. Static hissed through Corrin's helmet as occasional hits weakened his shields, but energy shunted from lasers reinforced it quickly enough. He glanced at his fuel indicator. As much as we could teach them something about flying, it's time we change some of the rules here. He broke left and climbed, then came over, inverted and pointed his fighter at the volcano's cone. We'll see if these guys are such hot stuff in the place where hot stuff used to spew. The astromech droid splashed a message on console. Yes, inviting them into the caldera will be fine. The enclosed area will hurt them more than it does me, just like it hurt the ties that Wedge nailed on Ratchuk. Corin brought the fighter down into the crater and throttled back to zero thrust. He cut in the repulsor lift engines and powered them up so he hung suspended in the middle of the obsidian arena. As he pointed the fighter's nose toward the sky, he glanced at Whistler's reply to his earlier statement. Yeah, nine to one odds are hardly fair. The X-Wing shook violently, as if a titanic child had grabbed it in an invisible fist. Whistler hooted anxiously and Corrin felt his stomach turn inside out. Tractor beam. It's all over. The astromech droid wailed piteously. Corn read the message on his console and shook his head. Hey, it's not your fault. You're telling me the odds isn't why they evened them. He brought his torpedo control up again as the first interceptors streaked over the lip of the volcano's crater. Sensors forward, Whistler. Time to remind them that trapping a rogue doesn't make him dead. Just deadlier. 38. Locked in the silence of hyperspace, Wedge glanced back over his shoulder and frowned. Are you absolutely certain about the timing on this search pattern thing? Minox spun his head around and bleated imploringly. Fine. The droid's numbers indicated that a standard Imperial square-click search pattern would take two and a half standard hours to scour the dark side of the moon. If Korn managed to stay ahead of them and slip over to the light side, then they'd have to search it, too. That means he could still be hiding from them. If not, Wedge glanced at his fighter's chronometer. If not, they found him a minimum of an hour and a half ago. Frustration balled Wedge's hands into fists. He knew they'd done everything they could within mission parameters to help Corrin. The first set of ten interceptors had caught up with them because they had throttled back and waited. The five rogues had easily dispatched their foes, but the dogfight took them to critical fuel levels. They went to light speed, leaving a dozen squints to hunt for Corrin. At the first transit jump, He'd ordered everyone to spend the trip into Noquivzor, working up plans to go back and get Corin out. For the past three hours, he'd put together a rescue operation and had figured out all sorts of contingencies depending upon what intelligence they could get from Borlaeus. Defender Wing would not yet have arrived at Borlaeus by the time the rogues landed at Noquivzor, but there was an outside chance that Page's people could have some news and have tapped into the Imperial Holonet to deliver it. That was a long shot, but getting information from the Holonet was not. Borlaeus would certainly have reported being under attack, and that report might contain details that would indicate Korn's status. 
The second he reverted to real space, he'd have Mtray search out the latest information from Borlaeus. I need to know what to expect when we go back. His core plan was risky, and he knew Akbar would never approve it. The mission risks had been pointed out in advance. Corin had volunteered to go. He would be missed, but jeopardizing other people to effect a rescue that probably would not work would be foolish. As much as he knew Akbar would be right in pointing all those things out, he also knew he couldn't abandon one of his people. I've lost too many friends to the Empire not to do everything I can to save others. He knew his insistence on Tycho Selchu's inclusion in Rogue Squadron was just such a rescue. He smiled wryly, and saving him from Psalm was tougher than pulling corn out of Borlaeus ever will be. At Noquivzor, the rogues could be refueled and head back out inside a half hour. He assumed their return trip would actually go off in an hour, because he recalled that being the minimum amount of time Tex needed to put the lasers back in the Forbidden. With Tycho flying the shuttle and the X-Wings as escort, they'd be more than a match for the dozen interceptors in the Borlaeus system. Dozen? I'll bet Corrin will leave us half that number. Wedge sat back for a moment. He realized he thought of Corrin as Corrin, not Lieutenant Horn. The distance he had placed between himself and Corrin had collapsed in on itself. He'd purposely chosen to distance himself from all the new recruits to maintain authority over them. As loose as Rogue Squadron was, that detachment was necessary if they were to follow him. Even so, he suddenly realized, he had insulated himself from them for his own protection. Having lost so many friends, having felt the pain of their deaths, he had been reluctant to let anyone else get close. Not befriending them meant he could blunt the pain of seeing them die. He regretted Lu Jane Forge and Dorney Wee and Peshk Vrissik dying, but he had not been as deeply hurt by their deaths as he had when Biggs or Porkins or Dak had died. Emotional distance is armor for the heart. That armor was necessary because without it, the overwhelming nature of the fight against the Empire would crush him. After seeing how many had been slain, it would have been easy to assume all was for naught. But if we did assume that, the Death Stars would be ravaging planets and the Emperor would still rule the galaxy. Corin had earned the friendship Wedge felt for him, and not just through his skill in an X-Wing. He had taken to heart the things Wedge had told him about becoming part of the unit. Corin had clearly known that to go after the Interceptors closing on an assault shuttle was to be left behind. He had made that choice because it was really no choice at all. The rest of the unit would have made the same choice too and they'll want to go back to get Corin. By jumping straight from Noquivzor to Borlaeus without making a side jump first, they could reach the world in under three hours. Doing that would expose Noquivzor to discovery by Imperial forces, but Wedge expected Page's people to be giving them other things to think about. Even so, a jump to the outer edge of the Borlaeus system and then another jump in closer would bring them out of hyperspace from a direction that would hide their point of origin. I hope. A green button started blinking on the command console. Wedge punched it, and hyperspace melted into the Noquivzor system. He immediately keyed his comm. Rogue leader to Mtray. Mtray here, sir. I have an urgent message for Broar Jace. It's not as urgent as my orders, Mtray. Get Zrai set up to refuel us and get Tex mounting lasers on the Forbidden. An hour from now, at the most, we're heading back out. Yes, sir. And contact intelligence. 
I want any Holonet data coming out of Borlaeus. Yes, sir. The droid sounded agitated. Sir, we do have some information from Borlaeus. You do? Wedge's heart started to pound inside his chest. What is it? Is it about corn? Yes, sir. Give it to me. It's a hologram. Wedge frowned. Have the computer mash it to two dimensions and send it. You may want to wait, sir. Mtray. Transmitting now, sir, at your request. The monitor resolved itself into an image of Corrin Horn. Wedge shook his head. What? If you're seeing this, Commander Antilles, Corrin said solemnly, I know I was left behind. 39. Corrin popped one proton torpedo off and watched the lead interceptor evaporate. Thumbing his weapon's control over to lasers, he started to track the next tie. The tractor beam limited his ship's range of motion, but a heavy foot on a rudder pedal started turning him in the right direction. Just a bit more. The interceptor exploded as red laser bolts ripped through the cockpit. Korn looked down at his hand and couldn't recall having hit the trigger. More laser fire transformed another tie into a fireball. What in the cloak of the Sith? Whistler started hooting frantically. Corin hesitated, not comprehending, then flipped his comm unit back on as his fighter began to rise through the volcano, picking up speed. Repeat, is your hyperdrive still operational? He recognized the voice. Mirax? Yeah. You ready to get smuggled out of here? Hyperdrive is a go. Key it to my signal. Whistler, do it. Corrin didn't afford himself the luxury of looking back at the ship that had tractored his fighter. The forward view had more than enough to entertain him. Borlaeus's moon was receding quickly into the star field, as were the squints. Green lancets of laser fire reached out toward him, but they splashed harmlessly against his shields. His return fire scattered the ties, and one more fell prey to Skate's gunner. Whistler piped a warning at him. Then the starfield stretched into columns, and they entered hyperspace. A second or two later, they came back out again at a point well below the Peria system's elliptic plane. Corin, bring your fighter around and come up into the hold. Gladly, Skate. He complied with the order and found his twelve-and-a-half-meter-long fighter fit snugly in the hold. He waited for Mirax to repressurize the hold after closing the loading bay doors. Then he popped his cockpit canopy open and bolted from the X-wing. He landed on the deck with a thump, then smiled as the hold hatch opened. Permission to come aboard, Captain Tarek. Promise you won't tell my father? Mirax smiled and strolled boldly across the deck to him. He'd die if he could see an X-Wing with Corsac markings in the belly of his ship. And if my father hadn't been killed years ago, having my ship here would have gotten him, too. Corn enfolded Mirax in a hug. Your secret is safe with me. Likewise, Corn. He didn't let his arms slacken, until he felt her hug loosen first. And I commend you on your shooting. You popped three interceptors in no time. Mirax pulled away from him and pointed toward the hatchway. He did it, not me. The silhouette in the hatchway shrugged. The skate is a fairly stable gunnery platform, and the squint pilots weren't the Empire's best. Pulling off the helmet, Corin crossed the hold and offered the man his hand. Still in all, Captain Selchu, it was superior shooting. With skills like that, I can't imagine why you're not flying with us. Commander Antilles said not to ask, and now is not the time, but I want to know the answer. Mirax patted Corin on the back and let her hand linger there for a moment, a sensation he relished. Come on up to the bridge. We'll go to hyperspace and get back to no quivs or before the others do. We will? Mirax slapped the nearest bulkhead. 
The skate can push point six past light speed. Not as fast as the Falcon, but definitely better looking. With our speed, we can trim time off the trip back to Noquivzor and fly a course that's shorter. We'll beat them by an hour, just as we did getting here. Korn frowned. But how could you get here, since no one was supposed to know where here was? Commander Antilles didn't tell the others until our second jump. The smuggler smiled sweetly at him. Not my fault, you talk in your sleep. Tycho laughed. Mirax discovered a possible security breach. We arrived and went to ground on the dark side of the moon. We monitored Borlea's control traffic and didn't notice unusual activity down there, so we maintained calm silence when the squadron arrived. Corrin sat down across from him. If you told us you were there, you might have alerted the Imperials. Exactly. Tycho followed Mirax into the skate's cockpit and dropped into one of the jump seats. Since the squadron was running with weak comm system transmissions, we couldn't hear what Wedge had planned when he went sunside, but we figured things out from Imperial intercepts. The Verpine droid here has slicing skills that broke the imp scrambling quite quickly. We stayed hidden when the squints started to search, assuming we'd break and run when they reached the volcano. Mirax looked back at Corin. Then you arrived with them on your tail. We grabbed you and pulled you out. Corin chuckled as he strapped himself into the seat. I thought I was dead. I imagine that is what the rest of the squadron will be thinking when they reach no Quivzor. Tycho slapped Corin on the knee. Won't they be surprised? Yeah, I imagine they will. Corn's eyes narrowed. And I've got an idea, which means we can have some fun with them. Mirax tapped the console and smiled at her Solistan pilot. Get us going, Liet, and fast, too. The Pulsar Skate will be the first ship ever to smuggle a man back from the grave. And I mean for us to do it in record time at that. 40. On Borlaeus's moon, Korn's image continued. I know the decision to leave me behind wasn't easy. Wedge's eyes narrowed. On Borlaeus's moon? How could he have known? Wait a minute. I want you to know I harbor no ill will concerning my abandonment. To prove this to you, I pried some Wyron's reserve away from Emtray and a Rishkate should have finished baking by the time you land. Wahoo! Gavin's voice echoed through the comm. Wedge keyed his comm. Horn, if you aren't dead, you will be. Corn's image broke into laughter. I'm happy to see you too, Commander. Welcome home. Wedge sat back in his chair and held the half-full tumbler up so the light from the center of the recreation room made the amber liquid in it glow. Its chemical warmth, aided and abetted by seeing Corin alive and unhurt, had chased the chilly dread from his belly and melted the stress in his shoulders and neck. Putting his feet up on the table, he actually began to relax for the first time in conscious memory. In retrospect, Corin's message was rather funny. He watched his green-eyed lieutenant cut the warm rishkate and hand it out to the other pilots in the squadron. They were all giddy with their success and his survival. Wedge knew they all had been as horrified as he had when the message began to play in their cockpits, but no one was more relieved than he had been when the truth of it was revealed to them. As jokes go, Corin, it was good. You'll pay for it, of course, but it was good. Wedge glanced sidelong at Tycho. I can't believe you let him send that message. The old Iranian shrugged. The shocked expression on your face was even better than I imagined it would be. I won't forget that, Captain Selchu. Besides, I can't wait to see how you're going to get back at Corin. Tycho took a swallow of his lum. I trust you'll make it good. You can be assured of that. 
Wedge sipped a little more whiskey and let it sit on his tongue for a moment. Sucking air in through slightly parted lips, let the crisp, woody aroma fill his head. Then he swallowed and smiled. Corn comes back from the dead, and I understand you were resurrected too. Three squints? Tycho nodded solemnly. Two were at point-blank range. M. Trey could have shot them. The third was at range. Decent shot. Of course, the Alliance security team is a bit upset at having been detained in your quarters. No, they weren't very happy when we took them prisoner. His executive officer winced. The problem was we had a possible security leak, but explaining everything we would have had to explain would have made it impossible for us to get to Borlaeus in time to warn you, if that's what we needed to do. Easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Wedge chuckled. I was planning the same sort of thing for the return trip to Borlaeus. You've got the security problem under control? I think so. Locking this thing down will mean a lot of time being spent with Emtray. Put corn on it. Tycho shook his head. Ew, that's nastier than even I assumed you'd be. Well, leading a unit isn't a young man's game after all. Wedge swung his feet to the floor and set his tumbler on the table as Corn approached with two pieces of Rishkate. Smells good. Mirax made it. Corn handed the other piece to Tycho. Corellians use it for celebrations. Wedge hefted his piece of the sweet cake. Getting you back from Borlaeus is worthy of celebration, as is having the Alliance's hottest new pilot being a member of the squadron. Corn looked surprised. Me? No. Wedge smiled past him at the man arriving late to the celebration. Congratulations, Broar Jace. The trio of kills you got on the interceptors following us out of the Piria system puts you at 22 kills. You beat Lieutenant Horn by one. The Thyferon beamed, his blue eyes alive with pride. Thank you, Commander. He glanced down for a second, then accepted a piece of the cake from Mirax. This is good news and helps offset what I have just heard. Wedge set his cake down next to the glass of whiskey. And that is? The message waiting for me was from Thyfera. My great uncle, our patriarch, is dying. The MDs give him two weeks at best. Even Bacta cannot cure old age. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Jace. Roar. Wedge glanced at his XO. Tycho, can you? No problem, Wedge. Tycho stood up. Compassion leave won't work, but if we send our pilot home on a recruiting run, I think the diplomatic corps will back us up. You'll be on your way as soon as you can pack your X-wing, Mr. Jace. Thank you. Corrin offered Broar his hand. I'm sorry to know your uncle is ill. I'm also sorry to lose to you, but I'm not sorry about how well you did nor I about your performance. Broar pumped Corn's hand. I would give you another chance at such a contest, but I do not want even the slightest hint of division within this squadron. I concur. Corn nabbed a small piece of cake from the serving tray on the table and popped it into his mouth. Everyone followed Corn's lead, and as he chewed, just for a second, Wedge felt himself back on Yavin 4, catching a hasty last meal before he and his friends went off to attack the Death Star. He knew it wasn't the taste of the Rishkate that brought the memory back. On Yavin 4, there had been no time and no ingredients to create something so indulgent. No, it's the sense of unity that takes me back. The core spirit. It was there before Rogue Squadron was ever formed. It was the squadron's soul, and it's still here. This is Rogue Squadron, not reborn, just continuing as it should. I'd like to offer a toast, my friends, if I may. Wedge raised his glass, and the others joined him. To Rogue Squadron, to the friends we've lost, the battles we've fought, and the utter fear our return will bring to our enemies.
Epilogue. Curtain Lure dropped to one knee before Isan Isard's life-size hologram. Please forgive my disturbing you, Madam Director, but you said you wanted to be informed immediately on any developments. She frowned impatiently at him. I have seen General Derricote's requisition request for more Gamorians. Has there been a breakthrough? I am not certain. But you approved the request. Yes, Madam Director. Even though she was projecting her image from her tower office nearly three kilometers above and away from his cramped workspace, the distance did not insulate him from her ire. Somehow, her eyes seemed to project venom through the holonet. You will forgive me, Madam Director, but General Derricote is still upset about the loss of his facility on Borlaeus. He said you promised him it would be returned to him if he completed his work within your parameters. And so it shall. The Alliance stewardship of Borlaeus will be of little consequence in the grand scheme of things. Isard's image stared hard at him. So, there is no breakthrough with Derricote? None to my knowledge, Madam Director. Then what would have prompted your call to me, Agent Lure? Our agent in Rogue Squadron has provided us with some useful information. Rogue Squadron will be moving to Borlaeus, and the base will become a major staging operation for a move forward. Isard tapped her teeth with a fingernail. This was not unanticipated. It was also reported that the best of the new pilots, Broar Jace, will be returning to Thyfera to visit his family. Lore reached back and pulled a data pad from his desk and glanced at it. Given the precarious balance of loyalists and rebel sympathizers on Thyfera, it seems to me that having a hero of the rebellion visit will not be a good thing. Since his course of travel has been communicated to us, I have prepared orders for the interdictor cruiser Black Asp to intercept and destroy him. Very good thinking, Agent Lure. Isard nodded slowly, her eyes focusing distantly. Amend the orders to have him taken alive, if possible. I have a facility that is most successful in convincing ardent rebels they really should be on our side. I have room at Lusankia for this Jace. He will prove very useful in the future. I have the intercept set for a system where enough smuggling goes on that the Black Asp's presence makes sense. An increase in general interception activities will hide our foreknowledge of Jace's course. The ruler of Coruscant looked quizzically at him. Do you truly think so? I do not follow your meaning. Don't you think your corn horn will be suspicious? He thought for a moment, then bowed his head. He will be, but he is not so single-minded that he cannot be distracted. That concurs with my reading of his data file. She smiled slightly, but it would take information of sufficient import to distract him, yes? Yes, Madam Director. Good. She clasped her hands behind her back. I've let slip the information that you killed Gil Bastra. What? And it includes data that suggests you are, in fact, here on Imperial Center. Curtin's jaw dropped. He'd seen Horn angry more than once and knew the man to be relentless in pursuit of those who had slain other members of Corsac. Horn had even found a way to capture his father's killer, the Trandoshan bounty hunter Bosk. Curtin had taken great delight in releasing Bosk, citing the Trandoshan lack of manual dexterity to explain why Hal Horn had been killed in a spray of blaster fire meant to kill the smuggler to whom he was speaking. Since Bosk was working under a valid imperial warrant, Hal Horn's death was an unfortunate bit of collateral casualty. Madam Director, didn't you say the rogues would be coming here, to Imperial Center? Indeed, I believe I did. Her smile grew, and I believe my prediction will be proven true. Then Horn will come here. And will be looking for you. 
Isard licked her lips. More distraction from his main mission for Lieutenant Horn, and more motivation for you to succeed in Rogue Squadron's destruction. In this case, I'm not sure those ends justify the means at all. I see, Madam Director. I'm sure you do, Agent Lure. Spare me future reports about General Derricote's tantrums. I want results, and I want them to be successful results. As you will it, Madam Director. He found himself saying in the darkness, resulting from her termination of the communication. He rocked back and sat on the floor. For a half a second, he longed for a return to the days when he and Horn were adversaries at Corsac. They had hated each other, especially after the Bosque incident, but the tension had not yet become lethal. Then he realized he harbored no real fear of Corrin Horn's retribution. His success would mean release from her clutches. If he knew that, of course, Horn would find a way to clone me so he could have the pleasure of killing me and forcing me to work for Isan Isard forever. Yes, he could be that cruel, but he would hold himself back. Therein is his weakness. Curtin Lure grabbed the edge of his desk and pulled himself upright. Here on Imperial Center, in Isard's domain, I have neither the compunction nor need to restrain myself. Do come to Coruscant, Corin. Bring your friends and your hidden enemy with you. Imperial City is undoubtedly the last place you ever thought you'd visit. And I will do all I can to make certain it is the last place you visit. End of Star Wars X-Wing Books 1 through 3 by Michael A. Stackpole M-I-C-H-A-E-L A. S-T-A-C-K-P-O-L-E Read by Alec Voles in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, July 2019. Published by Del Rey, an imprint of Random House, a division of Penguin Random House, LLC, New York. RandomHouseBooks.com StarWars.com Facebook.com slash Star Wars Books Twitter at Delray Star Wars Instagram at Delray Star Wars Tumblr Delray Star Wars For the reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. If you found this book to be defective, Please contact your cooperating network library.